Hello everybody, welcome to the Beginner's Complete Guide to Power BI. What we will be doing today in our course is we will be going over Power BI top to bottom, how to start on a fresh file and end up with a report, totally digestible for report viewers who know nothing about data, how they can use their data and get the insights that they're looking for. Right, so we're going to go the top to bottom um, of how you can do it from the ground up with having no experience in Power BI. We're going to give you all of the different terms and terminologies that you need to know. We'll give you some sample files to work with so that you can follow along. Um, we're going to go through all the different um, concepts within Power BI and how Power BI can be helpful within kind of your professional careers. Some of the things that we're going to cover within the course is um, all of the main kind of Power BI topics. We're going to cover how to use Power Query, how to transform data and get it all ready to go and reportable. We're going to cover how to do relationships, what kind of data relationships mean, how to create them within Power BI, how we should start viewing our data, what we can kind of compare it to and how we should start thinking about data in terms of kind of Excel. I'll use Excel as kind of a groundwork since everybody has somewhat of Excel knowledge since it's so big and universal. Um, and then how to write calculations within Power BI. So Power BI uses a data analysis engine called DAX. Um, that data analysis engine uses a language very similar to Excel. So again, if you come from an Excel background, you'll find some of these functions and formulas very familiar. Um, we'll go through what those measures are, how to create measures, what DAX is, how to get it organized, um, and how to use it. And then we will go through how to visualize your DAX measures and your data within your model. Um, one of the best things Power BI specializes with is visualizing and getting your data to look really pretty for your report viewers. So we'll, we'll spend some time going through how to visualize and some of the best practices with getting reports on the page and viewable for everybody. And then lastly, we're going to go through once that report is done and you've got it in a nice finalized state, how do you get it out to people? How do people view it? What are the licensing requirements to view? Do people need some certain licensings to view some reports and not others? And then what are the different options for distributing? How might you work around some of those kind of steep costs if it might be too steep to get into Power BI, but you feel like in your data world, the company is ready to do it. How can you kind of sell it at your firm um, with some kind of nifty little workarounds or some tricks to kind of keep those costs lower as you get more people on board with how great Power BI can be and how nifty it can be. Um, and then also how to set up a gateway to get all of your data refreshing so that your report that you just got out to everybody and distributed is always live with the data that you need updated and refreshed. Um, so all right, so that is the introduction to what we're going to be covering in the course. Um, hope you guys enjoy. See you on the next one. So now that you know what we're looking to get out of the course, let's go through what the course comes with. Um, so what the course comes with is we will be going through um, exactly what our date, data is. Um, so we'll, we'll have all of the data files that we use in this example that we walk through. You guys will have all of those data files to work with as well. Um, and then also the date table. Um, so within the resources for the course, we will have all of these files. So these are the files that we're going to work through um, within, the, within the course. We'll go through all of these, how to clean them, how to prepare them, how to model them, how to write measures on them, how to report on them. So this is going to be essentially what the full course covers. Um, and look at this data as from a recruiting perspective firm. So imagine that we're at a recruiting firm. Um, this data is dummy data, so some of it might look a bit funky, but that's great. We can kind of talk about how to report on some error handling um, reporting issues as well, so we can talk about some of those things. Um, but that's where that's what the data is kind of based around. So if you're coming from um, like a sales product order kind of world, the way that you can think about recruiting data is very similar. We just have we'll just have a placements which are going to be our lookup table for kind of products and then revenue tied to those placements, which would be the fact table or the sales table, right? Or um, the revenue table. <clears throat> so that's kind of how we can start thinking about our data. Just think about it from recruiting world. So we have clients, clients have client contacts, client and client contacts have job orders or vacancies, vacancies have placements, placements have candidates, and candidates go to placements and a placement has dollars tied to them. And candidates and 
job orders have various activities that make up a placement, right? So we'll go through how kind of how all that data can get put together. Um, again, just from a recruiting world perspective is how we can look at this data. So that's going to be included in the course. Um, let's go through kind of just look at what these files kind of look like. Let's start with kind of the placement just as high up as we can. Um, so again, just thinking about from the data worlds that you guys are in right now, right? You, you have some Excel file that you need to do reporting and analysis on. We've got a whole lot of different dates in here. We've got just IDs. We don't have all of the company names. We don't know who the vacancies for, right? So we've got some of this messy data that we just need to figure out how to clean up. Um, so we'll go through some of that and just how we can do that. You guys will be able to walk along and follow along with those steps because we'll be able to provide you with this file. Um, and again, just some other things. So for the revenue, right, for this revenue table, we'll go through how that we can break out specific placements based on their revenue and their date to allocate based on percentage splits for each employee that participated in the placement. So we'll go through um, specific transformations so that we can clean this data so that again it's reportable and then just another file that we'll kind of start with is just this placement commission so again just kind of very similar to revenue we'll just work through how it will be reportable how we can clean it up and get it ready to go into our model um, and again you guys will have all of these files to work with and follow along and the last table that we will include is some code for a date table um, so if you guys have been in power bi before uh, or if you're brand new this might look a bit daunting but what date tables are date tables are power bi's way of um, creating date tables and kind of working with dates so we'll walk through how you can use this it's very easy it's just going to be a copy and paste right so nothing too scary nothing nothing to be worried about you don't need to code or anything still very simple power bi world um, but so you, all of these files again, you will come with, you will get all of these files and that is what we will use for getting into our Power BI model. And now, now that we've got all of our stuff out of the way, let's kind of get into Power BI. I'll see you guys in the course. Good luck and I hope you guys enjoy it. Okay, so now that we've got Power BI downloaded, we've got our resource files and all of our source files downloaded let's get into um, the introduction of power bi let's get into kind of the meat and bones of the course um, so power bi let's just go through what power bi is right so power bi what power bi is is it's a software created by microsoft um, that specializes in uh, using connectors to connect to really any type of data source that exists out there um, clean that data create relationships to have that data talk to each other and then report on it with visually appealing visualizations based on that data. <clears throat> right, so that's kind of that's kind of Power BI in a nutshell. You've got connectors. Power BI has a bunch of connectors that you can connect to, a bunch of built-in ones. You can build custom ones. You can connect to anything within Power BI. And then it just is able to join all of your data together that you connect to and then report on it. Um, and then that, that last thing that Power BI really specializes in is refreshing of the data your data can always be updated and always be live especially based on whatever data sources you have um, that can totally change from going from like a excel data reporting world into power bi right now your data is always accurate always up to date we don't have to do any more manual work create one report boom always updated <clears throat> So the components of Power BI, Power BI kind of has three big different areas um, to it that's constantly changing. Um, Power BI has got a bunch of different updates coming down, especially with Fabric being released, but we'll get into those later videos. Um, but so currently, the only ones we need to care about um, are Power BI Desktop, which is what developers use. That's what we've just installed, right? So Power BI Desktop, that's this. Power BI service, that's going to be app.com or app.powerbi.com. That's going to be where we distribute all of our reports and the report viewers go to. So that's going to be the end users kind of access to the reports that you publish. And then Power BI Mobile. Power BI Mobile, same as the service, just on your phone, right? It's so very similar, just on your phone. So all of the reports you do publish, totally accessible through mobile. So then going into, now that we kind of understand Power BI, that's just Power BI, right? Connect to stuff report on data, visualize the data. So in kind of the, the purpose and importance of Power BI, how you can start selling Power BI to your organization or why you can start bringing it in and bringing it up in some conversations, how you can start selling it as a tool that might be helpful to you in your day-to-day -day jobs 
is really selling the report visualization side of it. Um, Power BI is amazing at report visualization, so making your data and calculations that you write on that data look very pretty and compelling to a report viewer who might know nothing about data, right? It's very good at kind of dumbing down the data to get you the insights that your report viewer wants that might have no experience in data. Um, so it's, it's very good at providing those insights to make those decisions that need the data to make decisions that are good and valuable to the business, um, but might never have been had before because you're working on Excel files, right? Which is always very hard. Um, and then again, going back to that connectors, Power BI can connect to anything and just integrate it all together. So it's very easy to take any data and then put them, put it into that visualization that's going to give you that very powerful decision-making ability from that data. Once we've got our data, what we need to do to it is we model it. So within Power BI, we have our data from all of the platforms we just integrated, right? We've got our data from, let's say, five different platforms within our data sources. What we need to do with that data is then you model the data. So what data modeling is, is you find the relationships between the data source, between your data sources. So going back to um, our, our data that we're going to work with, our recruiting world, you've got those placements, and those placements are split between, let's say, five people have commissions on each placement. Right, so how do we relate those two data sources together? Do we need to connect the employee table to an employee ID somewhere else on another table? Do we need to connect the placements and their IDs? How do we do that? How do we create that model? And so once, once we create those relationships and we're able to understand what a model does with our relationships that we use, we're able to then write those calculations which are called DAX calculations, data analysis expressions, which is the formula language that Power BI uses, to then improve the analysis within our data. So we data model, we create measures with DAX, and then we visualize. And all of that can be done very quickly um, with Power BI. Just, again, that visualization, to get to that visualization part, you just got to make sure your groundwork is very solid so that you understand what DAX you're putting onto your visuals so that you're making sure that you're reporting your data correctly. And then the next kind of benefit to Power BI, and one of the great things with Power BI, is its ability to get your reports in front of people. Right, so once you've got your report developed, you spent weeks developing the report, connecting all of the data, and now you have this report that can always be updated for your report viewers. The way that you can distribute that is through a single link. So there's no more emailing a report that's manually done every day or every week to somebody. You can just publish it once, set your data to refresh. You can set an email to send to that report user every morning to remind them to make sure to click on the report and the report link will never change, right? So it's always going to be there. And then on top of that, you're also able to manage the security through that same distribution link. So you can have that one distribution link go to 15 different people, and they can all see completely different reports that you've allocated permissions to. And then taking it a step further, you're able to also do row-level security. So then th depending on a viewer that's looking at it, they might only see their data to the report they have access to. Right? So you can just keep stacking on and stacking on. And again, that's just with one link that the developer can just set up all of that groundwork. And boom, you have one link always refreshing. Your entire company can see only their data for their specific report. Right, So it can, it can quickly, quickly, quickly gain value once you start knowing kind of what Power BI can do and what, what you want to start playing with and how, how you need to move in the direction for your specific company. Because every company is different with their data environment, their data world. One thing to consider, speaking of that companies being different, is the price of these tools, right? Some of these BI tools can be pretty expensive because they do some pretty crazy stuff. Power BI can get pretty expensive, but also on the front end, it can also be relatively cheaper compared to some of those BI tools. Power BI, we'll get into licensing deeper on, um, but essentially Power BI has got three kind of main licensings, kind of, kind of four, um, not really. So they've got the free version, which doesn't do very much, right? It 
you can't really publish to people in a nice business way, you need at least Power BI Pro to start developing, right? To start, which is 10 bucks a month per user. And then Pass Pro is Power BI Premium, which is 20 bucks a user. We'll go into some of those differences. And then after Pro, kind of that maximum tier is uh, Power BI Premium capacity, which is starts around five grand a month, right? So that's when you start getting into a whole server for yourself and for your entire report development has a server and Power BI sets it up for you. It's a whole thing. So not much, won't need to go into that, uh, but to start out kind of we'll, we'll get into it in depth more. But again, Pro is 10 bucks a month, premium per user, 20 a month, free license you can distribute pretty easily if you want to, but you'll need Pro typically. So all right, so we've set the groundwork for what Power BI is, how we can use it, what we're going to do. Um, let's kind of get into how we should start thinking about Power BI. So our next course is going to go over how do we start thinking about data? And I'm going to think about it coming if people are coming from an Excel background. Everybody has some familiarity with Excel, right? We've got columns and rows. So I'm just going to kind of compare that to Power BI and how Power BI starts to differ in how you think about data compared to Excel. So I'll see you guys in the next one, and hopefully this one was fun. Bye. So how do we want to start thinking about data in Power BI? <clears throat> So like I said, I'll use Excel as kind of our groundwork for how people typically understand data and how that tends to differ from how Power BI is able to kind of work with data and how we should start kind of adjusting how we think about some things in the data world. So within Power BI, or let's stick to Excel first. So within Excel, looking at this Excel file, we're able to click on an individual cell, right? So this vacancy ID had this specific start date with this specific employment type Right, so you're able to click on a specific cell. And then whenever you're writing calculations, you reference a specific cell or a range. Right, So within Excel, you're thinking about it like cells. Right, You're in a, you're in a cell, you're referencing cell E6 to provide a value compared to cell F6. Right, So that's how Excel works, is you're referencing those cells. Where the way we want to start thinking about things with Power BI is I briefly mentioned it with context, um, but the way context can be thought about is in rows and columns. So we want to start thinking about our data as really just a table within itself. So no more cells. There's no more. There's no longer going to be a cell C15. And it's very funky and tricky to kind of wrap your head around that when you, if you, especially if you've been working in Excel for a really long time and you've gotten really familiar with it. But I promise you, it will pay off in the end. I promise. So the way the way that we transition ourselves to kind of that column and row thought is it's very similar. Once once you kind of get through it and start working with the data, you'll see how similar it is. But it's a very different concept. Um, so again, we want to think about it in columns and rows. So when you think about it that way, you can still get to a cell, right? So even at column, if column C, row 15, right, that cell that we were on, we can still essentially get to that cell. But instead of getting to a cell, we're getting context from the column and the row to get that value that our measure is calculating. Right, so that's kind of that's the difference with Power BI um, and why you need to start thinking within columns and rows, because that context that I'm referring to is going to be determined by those columns and rows and other filters you have applied that again can be thought of as columns and rows to then change that kind of intersection value for what you're calculating. Right, so that, that DAX measure, just going back to context again, I'm going to keep parking on context as the most crucial kind of concept around Power BI to understand what you're doing on your report page. That context within Power BI is that column calculation by its row to produce the value that your measure is working with. So as a very base example for a measure, let's just say sticking to Excel too, right? Let's say we're taking the sum. So we can take the sum of all of these values and then all of these cells and then we get a value output, right? So that's essentially what, again, essentially Power BI is doing the same thing. What we're just doing is we're specifying calculate column C and give me the sum of column C. And then if we want to filter it down 
to, let's say, only these specific cells that have permanent employment type, we can then add that filter onto that calculation, summing up the column. Right, so again, it's we can still get to those cells, right? We'll, we'll sum those cells up by getting to the context that meets those cells' parameters, so permanent, and summing up the column, right? So we can get to the cell, but again, we're summing the row, we're summing the column, and then filtering the rows that we want to see based on our DAX statement. Right, so that's that's kind of how Power BI needs to be thought of within the data world and how we should start pivoting how to think about data. It's in a full table, so we have a placement table, and then we work with that table with the columns or fields within that table. So this placement table has how many columns is that? How many fields? However many fields that is, 10, 15, 12. This placement table has these many fields and that's pretty much it, right? That's that's how we start thinking about it. We don't care how much data, are, we don't care how many rows our data has anymore. It doesn't matter. Power BI can work with any amount of rows. Doesn't matter. We just care about the columns. Are there columns that can help us calculate the values that we want to see within those rows that we think about data in right now, right? So that's again, start thinking about it as tables and columns and rows of data as opposed to a specific cell. Um, so that's the that's the best kind of advice I can give, especially coming from that Excel background that I'm sure almost everybody has um, or some experience. Again, I'm, I'm going to keep harking on it. It's getting out of that cell by cell calculations, and we're now looking at full columns and doing calculations across those entire columns of data and then adding filters to them. We'll definitely get into it more. Don't worry. Um, but just wanted to give you a groundwork as to how we want to start thinking with data with Power BI. Um, so all right, I'll see you guys in the next one. Sticking with kind of the background to Power BI and the why we're now using Power BI. Let's stick with this Excel example still. Um, and how how are we now at Power BI, right? Why, why are you guys here trying to learn Power BI? Where are your current tools falling short? Where Power BI is now going to be that analytical tool to lift you up there, right? So going back to, again, what I've said kind of previously before, just kicking everything off, is Power BI really benefits and is excels at visualizing this data where excel and some of those spreadsheet tools just fall short you can do it there there are plenty of videos out there right telling you that you can do those crazy excel or google sheet visualizations with super interactive visuals and data formulas and but why when you can just figure out Power BI and learn a very clean, neat way to do it and then visualize so powerfully and have your interactions be super confident in them that they're always up to date. You don't have to worry about some Excel file or somebody sending a file and your data getting out of date and something breaking, right? It's just why, why worry about those tools when Power BI exists? Um, and there are other tools like Power BI that you can do those things, right? But again, just Power BI is able to do those things very quickly and easily without having any knowledge other than Excel. You can come from just that Excel background, that analytical mindset of wanting to analyze your data in Excel. How do I make this look pretty? I want to produce that value that they need out of this Excel file and then working towards it. Of course, you can get there in Excel again. You can do it. It's possible to visualize and do those things in Excel. But just Power BI's ability to take that Excel data just as a data source instead as a business intelligence tool because it's not a business intelligence tool. Taking it as just a data source and then using Power BI to develop those analyses that you would rather do in Excel or you're used to doing in Excel will just take you to the next level of data analysis in your in your day-to-day -day world of just business intelligence and data analysis and what you're able to do for your company and deliver for the firms that you work at uh, it's just going to make you put you in a completely different world when you start doing new jobs or new firms you can completely transform their entire data ecosystem with just knowing one tool by being able to get people off of doing manual excel problems and automating a single report so Nobody needs to ask somebody to do it anymore, right? So that's that's why we're here to Power BI, um, and 
we'll go through how to do all of those things um, with within the next couple of courses, right? So hopefully that was helpful to kind of understand why we're in Power BI now, why we landed here, um, and I'll see you guys on the next one. We'll just go over some of the uh, main topics, kind of the course breakdown of um, the next kind of couple major courses that will, or next major topics that we'll cover, and uh, see you guys on that one. In this last prep video, before we get into doing the actual work here, um, I'm going to go over the four main aspects of Power BI that we need to make sure we understand before we can get a report developed. So the four main things that Power BI needs to be understood um, before we can be able to produce those valuable things that I've been harking on that Power BI can do, right? So those, those, what do you need to follow? Where do you start? Where do you end? What's, what do you need to master before you can get to those reports that are going to kind of change how you can operate within your company? So we'll start from the ground up um, and move to kind of the end. So the first thing that we're going to go through and that you need to make sure that you understand is how to connect with all of those connectors the Power BI has. How do you connect, load, and transform data? So within the data world, that's often called ETL, extract, transform, and load. Um, and that's one of the biggest things that Power BI um, has that you need to definitely make sure you understand. Um, and be able to utilize pretty much to the fullest so that you can be able to clean and connect to any data source your firm asks you to. No matter what they give you, you can clean it and report on it. Um, and the way that we do that in Power BI is through the Power Query button, um, and that's called Transform Data. So in Transform Data, we will use the Power Query Editor to connect, prepare, and transform data. So that is step one of Power BI. We transform the data. We connect to it, transform it, clean it, get it ready to data model. So after we transform or do the ETL steps, the second biggest component to Power BI development is modeling our data. So again, going back to that recruitment firm kind of data that we're going to be looking at in this course, modeling the data of what's related to what. What tables have IDs that are the IDs from another table or emails or something that can be related related to each other how do we relate our data to each other so that we can start creating DAX measures to write on that data based on that data model to provide us with values that we can start to analyze right so it goes transform connect ETL once we load our data then it's the data modeling once we understand the data modeling, it's on to DAX. So when we're on DAX, the data analysis expression language, we're creating measures. We're creating calculations on top of our data model that we have just transformed and connected to through the ETL process to then show the insights of our data that we've connected to. Right. So DAX is where we start getting into what we can do or how we start how we start doing what we want to do to the data so how do we find the number of sales that happened in xyz period how do we find the top rated clients over that same time frame how were they compared to last year were they at a totally different rank maybe it was maybe they sucked last year and they're killing it this year why is that how do we go into that and that's where dax and ca those calculations will start coming into play and once we figure out how to write those DAX calculations, we then use those DAX calculations to then get our reports visualized and on the page. So again, top to bottom, we're just kind of spiraling down to the fourth kind of big component of Power BI, right? We've got that ETL process, load and connect to the data. Step one, we've got the data modeling. We now model all the data we just transformed and cleaned. Step two, we then write DAX measures on top of that data. Step three, then once we've got those measures, we report and visualize on all of those previous steps that we did. And that's step four, right? That report and visualization aspect. And one of the biggest things that I kind of see people falter with this, especially with kind of BI tools in general, not even just Power BI, is they, they develop reports and visualizations as though everybody viewing it knows data, right? So they, they try to do these nice and fancy things almost as if it's for themselves to feel 
good. They did this complicated thing and put it on a report to show nothing, right? Just that they did the complicated thing. So with the reports and visualizations, the biggest thing you want to focus on is making sure you're building your report for your audience. DAX and data modeling and ETL, all of that is just developer work, right? That's all you. Nobody else is going to see that. You're the only one that needs to know how to operate it. If you get into a bigger firm and you're distributing your model and you're connecting live, that's another conversation, but that'll be another course. Um, again, you, you're the only one that's responsible for steps one through three. Once it gets to step four, that's when people start seeing the data and start using your step one, two, three, and four to get those insights and decision-making value out of it. So it's step four that's really where you get the brownie points from everybody seeing your work on one through three. And step four just needs to be focused on those viewers. So if your report viewer are data people, great, build the data, build the report super in-depth and super insightful around very in-depth quartile analysis or statistical analysis based on XYZ, ABC, right? You can do those things, but most of those people aren't going to be viewing the report. Most of your report viewers are going to be salespeople, managers, or people with low performance, right? So they're the ones that need to understand what you're putting on the page. And so you might need to just make it simple. Just throw some bar graphs on there, some tables. Those are going to be the things that we make sure to cover, right? Make sure to build the report for your audience. But all right, those are the four main foundations, main pillars um, with Power BI and how that we can make sure that we can understand how to develop reports from the ground up, right? If you understand how to do ETL with Power Query, great start. If you understand how to then model that data that you just cleaned, perfect, we're on the right path. Then we can write calculations on top of that data that we've cleaned and modeled. We're almost there. And then once we can learn how to develop those reports in a succinct way for the report viewer, boom, now you're a Power BI expert and you can transform data ecosystems wherever you go. All right, and so now, now we've covered all of that, let's get into starting with our data. So in the next video, we are going to get into how to start on step one and go all the way to step four. Um, so, all right, I will see you guys in the next one. Hope you enjoy. So I know I said we would be getting into Power Query in our next video, but we have to start somewhere else first. So let's start in uh, adjusting some options and going through some options within Power BI Desktop um, to change some options before we get into Power Query. So go ahead and open up Power BI Desktop. Once you've got it opened, we will go to File, and we're going to go to Options and Settings. So we're just going to go over um, a couple of the main options. I don't really do much in here for the options. Um, I'll just go through kind of the ones that I do change. Everything else is kind of set at default. So this type detection up here, um, what I will typically set this to, I'm not sure if this is default or not, but I'll have this one set to that middle one, detect column types and headers for unstructured sources according to each file settings. So what I'm doing there is I don't want Microsoft to change any data types based on a file source, right? So if the source file has a text as a data type, but Power BI for some reason recognizes as a date, I don't want Power BI to change it to a date type, right? I want it to stay as the source files data type. Background data, I'll always have this uh, middle one on, so it's always um, data previews are downloading in the background um, by each data current file setting. So it's usually always downloading data because the default is to download data. Again, just resource kind of consumption setting if you want to do less resources, you can just turn off download backgrounds. It'll just slow up some of your Power Query work if you do do that and your files are kind of big or data sources connections are slower or something like that. Parallel loading of tables. This is, again, resource consumption setting. I set this to the max typically just to speed things up. Um, if you're worried about resources, you can keep it at default. No worries on those ones. And then getting to time intelligence, I will turn this one off. This one does stay on by default. So when you first download Power BI Desktop, this one does come with a default turned on. And what this does is, let's go back to our Excel file real quick. So if we load this placement file in to our Power BI model with having this turned on, what's going to happen is these four date columns, so just any date column that is loaded in, there will have an internal date table generated for those date columns. Um, we don't need that because the way that we'll do our modeling and our date table is through a custom date table. 
no worries we'll go through that individually totally separate video um, but we'll go through that and that's going to be our date relationships and time intelligence stuff that we will need and we don't need an auto date time right that will come from our date table that we'll use so we want to turn this one off once we turn that off um, the other setting that we will typically want to turn off is going to be in the current file setting so in the current file setting under data load the ones that i will typically turn off these two come in these two are default turned on I will typically turn these off, import relationships from data sources on first load, and auto detect new relationships after data is loaded. I'll typically turn those off because I don't want any of my relationships, one, to be created for me because I want to make sure that I can totally understand the model that I've created and I've worked on all of the relationships, and two, I don't want any of my relationships possibly changing, right? Update or delete relationships when refreshing data. I don't want that. We're creating our model solely through here. If we were doing a live connection, we might want to do those items, but we're creating a model ourselves within our imported data file. So we want to go ahead and turn these off, and then we'll do the data modeling and relationship building ourselves so that we understand everything that's happening within our file. And once we've kind of got those settings done, so turn off time intelligence and on data load current file, turn off the relationships, we can go ahead and push OK. So those are going to be, again, those are about the base settings that I use for every new file or new uh, model that I work with. I will typically turn off those auto time intelligence and um, uh, auto relationship generation. So, all right, now that we've got the file settings ready to go, we are ready to hop into Power Query. So I'll see you on Power Query on the next one. Now that we've got all of our groundwork set, we can get into Power Query. So. Getting into Power Query, the way we do that is this is going to be in on the home ribbon of Power BI Desktop. We're going to be in the Transform Data or Query section of this home button, home ribbon. It's going to be Transform Data, and we want to either click just right on Transform Data or the little drop down and click on Transform Data. And once we do that, this is going to be the Power Query editor window that is going to pop up. So this is where we will do all of our transforming and data cleaning and data preparation and ETL work and connection setup and source management, source data credential management. All of that's going to be done here. Um, we can create some, we'll create our custom date table. We'll do all, all of that stuff will be done in Power Query Editor. So just going through some of um, what these little buttons do up here. So on our home option, we're going to have our new sources. So this is where we can create a new query. So a query within Power Query Editor is essentially going back to like the way we want to think about data in Power BI is a query is essentially kind of a table. So we can have function queries, which are not tables, but they can perform a function, which is what our date table will be. It will be a function query. And then another query is our tables, right? So those those are going to be the sources that we use. That query is going to produce us a table. And the way the queries are written is M code. We'll get into M code later on in a minute um, in this little section, but that's kind of what Power Query runs on is M code. Um, within recent sources, we can just see the recent sources and then enter data. If we just want to enter some static data, we have the option to do that too. We can manage all of our source uh, credentials. We can enter parameters. What parameters do are these are to kind of manipulate the data with user input. So if you want to use user input for some of your DAX measures that we do, you can do that with parameters or parameters can be used to manage scheduled refreshes um, within Power BI service. That's a different video again, but kind of a bunch of different things that you can use parameters for. Super useful. Um, we've got some refresh data stuff um, within <clears throat> our query settings and then just some other transform stuff right so these are the, these are kind of the options that we'll go through in just a minute when we start connecting to our data and show you all of those connection options but again you can you can just kind of look at what they do right so we've got some we can go to a column we can remove columns remove specific rows and the way that you remove rows is it's just like a top or bottom we can remove the top 50 rows or the bottom 50 rows um, or we can only keep the top 50 rows right so we can that's how you can do it again it's not you can't specify a specific row to keep, right? You can't say row five. The, again, thinking about it as columns and tables, 
we don't have row numbers that we can just remove, right? We can remove the top 50 rows or the bottom 100 rows or something like that. Um, we can sort by different columns, we can split by limiters, we can group by different values and do custom grouping. Um, we have some options to just replace stuff or take the first couple rows as headers. We can merge queries on top of each other. So if you're coming from a SQL background, we can do left joins, right joins, outer joins, inner joins, right? We can full joins. We can do all of that stuff. They're just called merge queries. We can append queries, which is just stacking queries on top of each other. Or we can combine files, which is, let's say we have some process running every day that outputs us a file in some folder. We can connect to the folder and then combine all of those files together with that combined file button. Right, um, and then there's some AI insights as well over here. We won't go into those, but they can be helpful if you want to use them. <coughs> and then just some other transform steps. Again, on the transform tab, you can just kind of see all those other transform steps that you can do. Um, we'll go through a, a few of these steps in um, later courses or later uh, steps here in the videos, um, and just some some other options that you can do. Right. So now that we have opened up Power Query and we know what Power Query is, let's get into connecting to sources. So let's show you how to connect to that source. Um, we will use CS CSV files. I'll run through a couple of examples with um, some other items as well. Um, and that will be in the next video. See you on the next one. I briefly mentioned um, or mentioned a couple times how many different sources um, and how good Power BI is at connecting a different bunch of sources and bringing that data in and cleaning it and digesting it into one clean model, right? So let's go through some of those examples and kind of what we can connect to pretty easily. And then what we also have the option to connect to customly if we're not able to have a default. All right, so if you open up, let's go to in new query, let's go to new source and let's click on more. Within here, you can see all of the different source connections that you can use, right? So there are a whole lot of them. So you've got all the big ones, right? So you've got Snowflake, you've got Azure, you've got SQL, you've got all of the big ones. You've got um, Access, SAP, Dataflows, Azure, SharePoint, Salesforce, LinkedIn, right? So you can connect to a whole bunch of different um, custom connections, custom platforms that have already built their custom connector to Power BI that you can just start utilizing, right? So it might already be in here and you can just start click on it, your platform that you're trying to connect to. Or if you don't have a specific platform that is available, you can also just connect directly to the web, right? So you can also just connect directly to a, a web endpoint. If you have a specific endpoint that allows APIs connections and some specific call, you can just connect directly to the web API address. Or you can connect to just SharePoint list. If you want to connect stuff to a SharePoint list, you can just throw it onto a SharePoint list and connect it up to there. Right? Or if you want to, you can also create custom connectors. So you also have the ability to create custom connectors that you can just totally customize. Um, they're called, you can customize them off of an SDK file. Um, we can go, I'll have another video on that later on as well. Um, but again, you can connect to anything within Power BI. It's either a default connector or you can create one on your own or you can look, you can Google one and there might be a third party that's already created that custom connector for you and you might have to pay 20 bucks a month to use it, uh, but very quick to get it installed and start using it, um, right? But let's just start with what we have our files with. So we are using CSV files, right? So if we go to connect to a CSV file, so let's go to new source, and actually, before CSV files, let's just go to a SQL server. Right, so what, what we're going to do here is it's very, very simple, very familiar to if you've ever connected to a SQL server. Right, You'll enter in the server name, um, and then you can enter in the database if you want to. You don't have to. So once you enter in the server name, when you press next, you're just going to get another couple of options on the login screen. So you're going to enter in the credentials that are valid for that server name. If you're whitelisted on some firewall or some IP, you have to make sure you're connected to through all of those specific connections so that you can connect because it's a true connection to that server. You're actually pinging the SQL server for that connection, right? So make sure all of the specific settings are correct and that you have access to that server. Um, and then you can connect. And then when you connect to it, it'll just bring up a list of all of the table options that you have connected to, right? So it'll show you all of the databases that you have available to connect to, all of the specific views that you have available and access to, um, and you can just click through them. 
and then once you click through them, it will essentially just look the same as what we will go through with um, on our CSV file, right? So again, it's just it's very easy to just throw a new connection on. You just have to give it the credentials, right? You just throw some credentials on there, um, and you will be able to pull in any of the database files that are in that SQL Server, or Snowflake, whatever else uh, data source, data lake um, that you're connecting to. A specific file for a folder or anything like that. Um, so, all right, so we've gone through a bunch of the options. Let's go through with connecting to our data source. Let's pull in our placement file that we have downloaded um, and start getting that data prepared and thinking about what we need to do with this data to get it all ready to go. Now we're ready to go and grab our first data file. Let's go ahead and click on that new source button. We're going to click on the text CSV option. Navigate out to the data source. So navigate out to wherever you saved all of those source files that were in uh, the previous step to download. And we're going to start with the placement. So go ahead and just click on that placement.csv file and go ahead and push open. On the first step, what we're going to get here is a little preview window. Um, so on this preview window, most of the time you can just go ahead and push OK and get over right to the uh, main preview window. Um, but if you've got a different delimiter, you can set that delimiter. You can set it to custom, whatever else the delimiter might be, um, or maybe the file origin is different or something like that. But again, most of the time you just go ahead and push OK. So you can go ahead and push OK. Now for you to push OK, we can go ahead and see that our data has loaded in. So let's go ahead and just compare this to our placement file here. So if we compare this to our placement file, we can see that it's pretty much the same thing, right? So we've got our ID, we've got our candidate ID, a vacancy ID, date added, so on and so forth, right? So we've got all of the same exact fields, and it looks like it's in that exact same Excel format that we're used to, but we've just got it in Power BI now, right? So again, there's no cell, or not in cell whatever 11, we're just clicking on a value in the book date field. Right, so within this book date field is this value on row 11. So again, it's just instead of thinking as specific cells like we do here, we're now in field vacancy ID. Here's the vacancy ID field. Right, so it's the same exact data, just in Power BI and Power Query. And so within Power Query, if there is anything wrong with this file, this is how we would now handle it. And so the way that we handle that and the way that we do that data cleaning is through these applied steps over here on the right side. So over here on the right side of Power Query Editor are going to be the applied steps of what has happened to the query that we're on. So currently we've selected the placement query, and these are the applied steps that have happened to this query. So let's go back to the source to see what's happening within this source query. So up here within this little bar, this is going to be that M code that we mentioned, right? So up here is going to be the M code that is going to be coding what what exactly the query is. So this code up here is what we did through those clicks. So we clicked on the new source, the text file, navigated out to the file, chose the file, and then pressed OK on that preview window. And that's essentially what that what was happening in that source. <clears throat> we clicked through the source instead of entering in the code that was generated here. Same kind of thing, right? Just think about it in different steps. We did it with an interface as opposed to with the M code. And so if we go through to the next step, the way that the steps work is they're top to bottom. So it's always going to start at the source and then work through them top to bottom. So that next step, you can see that it promoted those headers. So this is where some of those file settings come into play. So on um, those file settings that we were doing, um, we had it set those date types and data types to the source settings. So we'll, we'll get to this step in a second, but this is where some of those other things are coming into place. What Microsoft does is after the source, if it recognizes that all of the header columns within its data are just column one, two, three, four, five, so on and so forth, it will automatically add an apply step for promoting the headers. So let's remove this step. And so right now you can see that this data source that we just brought in, it doesn't have our header fields, right? It's got columns one, two, three, four, five, and our header field is on row one. What we can do, what Power Query has is just this quick little button to just transform this table, this query, to just throw in this, move this row one up to the headers. So go ahead and just push that row one up to headers, and then boom, now we can see that we've got our actual headers in the header field 
in the headers of the fields and we have a new step saying we promoted headers. And then again, another step that we have set within that power um, or within the file options of Power BI is that each of the data types is going to match the source fields data type. So right now you can see on the left side of each field is going to be the data type of the field. So each of these are now set to ABC, which is going to be the text data type. That's what we want. We've got a bunch of dates. We've got some numbers in here, right? We don't want all of them to be text. And since we've set that file setting, to match whatever the source setting is of the data type for each field. Again, that third step of change type was automatically generated by Microsoft. So we can see that those dates changed, those IDs changed, those numbers changed, right? So we can see that all of those data types kept that same data type as its source file. So we don't need to do those steps ourselves again. But what we might want to do is we might want to change the name of stuff. Right? Well, let, let's first compare it to our data source. And then we can go through adding some changes to our applied steps. So when comparing it to our data source, we can see that, again, it just matches column for column, data value by data value. So cell E2, A2 does have that value, except it's just not in that cell anymore. Right? It just happens to be in field ID in the first row. It's no longer in cell A2. We now have a header row, and those cells are gone, right? But you can just think about it in a different little kind of way, the way that we need to think about kind of Power BI data, the full table with fields. But you can see we've got all of those same values all the way up to the status column, column L, and then all of just the same exact values all the way down the line. All right, so now we're done with that Excel file. We don't need the Excel file. We've got it in our Power BI Power Query model. So once we've got that done, let's go through and rename stuff. Because once we once we hit close and apply, other people can start building on this, right? So let's say people come in down the line, we've got other developers starting to build on our model. We want to make sure that it's readable for everybody. So we want to make sure that, that organization of that model starts at the groundwork. So make sure that it starts off organized and just use best practices throughout building your models as you go. So that way, whenever you do start getting into a model that's got 115 different tables, different queries, different sources, you'll be organized. You can work through them. You know where everything is, and somebody else can pick up the model down the road, and they can continue to work through it and keep building on top of it, right? So the way that we can keep everything organized is let's just keep everything uniform. So instead of these lowercase names, let's just go with something nice and neat. ID can probably stay ID, right? That's fine. Let's go with candidate. ID. And so again, in that applied steps, we can see that we added a new step in that code, again, which just automatically generated for us, right? So we went from, we were on step three with change type, and candidate ID was down there. And we added a new step for renaming the column, and candidate ID changed. So candidate ID here changed to candidate ID there with a space instead of an underscore and some capitals, right? And so let's just go through and do the same thing to some other columns, again, to make sure that they're just very identifiable. Everybody knows what they are. Nothing funky looking. Date added to date added. Book date to book date. Start date to start date. Scheduled end to scheduled end. And so the great thing about Power BI is after you do this once, you never have to do it again. Right? So because these names get changed and whenever they update, the names don't change and you have to go through it all again. They're already updated because all of these steps are done during every time the model is refreshed. So let's say this was published and we had this table that was refreshing. All of these steps are done every time the data is refreshed. So top to bottom, every single one of those steps are applied while the data is being loaded in. So when you push close and apply, you'll see the data get loaded in. And what that means is each of those steps are going through and happening on each of the fields that you've specified. So again, it's not happening to each cell. We're not looking at this entire data set as each cell. So it's, it couldn't possibly process all of that data cell by cell, right? So it's looking at a single field and saying, OK, was anything done on this field? Yes, the header was changed from candidate ID to candidate ID, right? Was anything done on that field? Yes, the type was changed from text to int, right? So there are those steps that are applied during the data load. And then after it's loaded, it's there. Those are the steps, and you've got that data that's 
already cleaned and already done with uh, any of those transformations that need to happen. Um, all right, so we have transformed the name. So once we've got it transformed and we've got it all ready to go, so let's just look through it one more time, make sure the table looks all good. So we're in the right format. All of these are in numbers. These are all digits. These are all dates. Correct, correct, correct. This is a string. That is text. Digit, 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 and text. So everything looks good on this table. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. So this table looks all good. Let's go ahead and move on to the next video. See you guys on the next one. Before continuing on with the next tables in the model that we're going to grab, I'm going to go through kind of um, an example of a very messy file that Power BI is still able to clean up and still able to get in kind of a reporting good usable method for Power BI um, and, and still have your valuable insights come from it. So let's look at um, what some data can look like that might be super ugly, but still being able to be transformed into a way that Power BI can use and what tools Power Query can um, give us that can transform this data into something clean, right? So let's say that we have a data set that just looks very ugly, right? We just have an ID with some dates, with some value and some other filler stuff in there, right? So the way that this data set is exported from its platform is it will export a new field for each month within a year that has a target set against it. If that target is the same as its previous month, it will give an asterisk. So this month for this ID was the same value as its previous month, right? So within reporting, that is so unhelpful, right? How are we supposed to report on that? We, we need to sum up values so that we can get a total. We can't just use an asterisk and have an assumption that this was the previous date. How are we supposed to know that that's the previous date? All right, so how do we get this data transformed into something that's usable within Power BI? So again, the, the best, I'm gonna keep parking on it, the best way to think about it is we need to get these values into a table that has fields that are uniform and can be reported. So the uniform fields within this data are our header rows, right? So we want our bunch of different header rows. Instead of having all of these header rows, we want this to be a single column, right? So we want these headers to be a single field, just one date with an ID for each of those dates with the value. So then instead of having all of these fields that we can't connect to and create relationships off of, we want one single date field with one single value. So then that we can date our values by an ID. And so again, Power Query can just be used to do all of that. So Power Query can be used to transform this file into that type of usable format. So you can transform, you can you can transpose, and you can pivot, you can unpivot, you can pivot only one column, and you can unpivot all of the others, and you can you can do so many different things with how Power Query works. Um, it, it doesn't really matter how ugly that input file, that source file is that you need to clean up. Power Query has the tools to clean it up. So in this next video, I'm going to go through how we clean up this file and how we can then work with it in a model. Um, we're not going to use this in a model. I'm just using this as a sample um, so we can look at what might happen with some ugly data and what are some of the best practices to clean this ugly data into that usable format that we needed into a single date field and a single value field with that employee, right? So, all right, see you on the next one and we'll get through this one. Let's go ahead and use the same method to grab our placement file to grab our target dummy file. Again, we'll go new source, CSV, text file, navigate out to its location, and choose the file. Target demos its name. Again, just that preview. Go ahead and push OK. And great. So same kind of thing, right? The exact same file that we just saw in Excel in Power BI now. So what we're going to do is just kind of walk through some of the some of the tools that Power BI has to transform this into that reportable data set to get that date and value field for the individual. All right, so let's go through kind of what what Power BI offers to transform this data. So if we go over to that transform step, 
kind of what what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to essentially look to unpivot columns. So if if we if we think about this data in again the Excel kind of version, currently it's essentially pivoted by the employee, right? So so we've got the employee pivoted by all of the dates. We need to unpivot the other columns so that they come out so so they are instead of each field is one employee, we unpivot it so that each line item is now a date for an employee. So if we right click or go to transform and then select our ID column and then go to unpivot other columns or just right click on the ID column go to unpivot other columns. We're then going to again do exactly what we wanted to do. right? So we're taking all of those fields that are off to the side, all of those huge fields going all the way out to 2030. Right? We've got all of those fields and we're now just moving them into a reportable date and value with that individual. So we've got each individual listed for all of the dates that are in the data set because again we've unpivoted those columns that were pivoted. So we've unpivoted them, and we've now got those two fields. But they're not clean yet, right? We've still got all of this mess to work through. So let's work through, work through it. So let's pull out the date first. So we, we have this text. We can see that it's a string. We want to be able to get this recognized as a date field. If we currently try to switch it to a date, you can see that it'll show an error. And if you click on that error, it will tell you exactly kind of what it's showing as the error. What Power BI is saying is it's unable to parse the this input value as a date value. So essentially it's saying you need to remove the equal sign in quotes so that we can recognize what this value is. So let's go ahead and remove those steps and go back a bit. So after right after that unpivot other column section or step, what we can do is we can use another transform step that Power BI offers that is built off of an AI engine. So it's, it's a pretty cool one um, on the add columns function. What we're going to want to do is add a column from examples. So if you go ahead and just push this, we can see that all the way at the end of our, all the way at the right side of our Power Query window, we've got a new column over here. It's called column one. This is the column that we're going to be adding from examples. By default, if you just push column from examples, just push the button, all of the columns will be selected as possible examples. So what that means is an example. If I type one in here, it will give me the ID column, right? So it's going to try to assume and use its AI engine to try to guess and try to autofill what I'm typing so it can understand what I'm trying to do. So if I type one and I have everything selected as an example, it will give me all of the things that it's thinking I might be able to do with the fields I have selected as an example. Right, so it, it lists all of the options that I might be able to do with one at this row one. Right, so I don't want all of the fields as an example. I only want the attribute as an example. I want to build a new column to get this date to be 2018-01 without the quotes and the equal sign. So instead of just clicking on column from example, if I right click on that column, I want to be my example, I can click on add column from example. And now you can see that attribute is the only one that's checked off. So again, if you do want to go through the columns from example, you can do that and then just uncheck the ones you don't want to be included. Or you can just have the AI engine work through which one you want to. Right? Sorry, so let's go ahead and name this. Let's go ahead and name this date. And within the field, you can just go ahead and start typing. So once you've got a field selected, right, it'll show you what field you got selected. And just go ahead and type in what you want. So we want this date to show 2018-01. So I don't want to click this because I don't want it to show me the quotes, right? I, that's what I'm trying to remove. So I want to go ahead and just push Enter. And you can see, once I've done that, what it, what the Microsoft Engine is trying to do here, what its AI is trying to do here is recognize what I'm trying to do based off the example that we've selected. So based off the attribute field that we've selected as an example, 
it's tried to recognize that I'm trying to take the text between these delimiters in the attribute field. So I'm trying to take the text between the text comma or yeah, the quote and the quote. So I'm trying to take the text between the quote at the first part and the quote at the second part. So a quote, quote, quote for a quote of the quote and again, quote of the quote. So I'm trying to take the text in between those two quotes which that is correct. That is what I'm trying to do. So if you scroll through here, you can look at just a random value down here, right? So this is 20, 2306. And over here, you can see that attribute field is still 202306. So that is exactly what I'm trying to pull out from that value. And I didn't need to know that formula at all. I didn't know that formula in M code. I just typed it, typed it in from an example, and it gave me the M code from its AI, right? So perfect. That's exactly what I need. I can go ahead and push OK. That gave me a great little workaround, right? And actually, let's go back one step. So again, you can see that M code that I typed in that it generated for me by using that just add from add column from example. So again, just quick and easy way that you can use Power BI's query, Power Query Editor to get you what you need. And so once we've got that field in that format, we can go ahead and change its format so we can change its type to a date type. And now you can see that it switched it to a date type and there are no errors. So now we can now report based on a date for our values. But we can see that our values are still all crazy, right? We've still got asterisks, blanks, zeros, right? We still need to fix that part. So let's go through some of those steps that we can use to fix those values. So next what we can do is let's go ahead and first just filter out our blanks. So if there's a blank value, a null value, anything like that, there was not a goal set for that date. Right? And actually, before we do that, let's go ahead and first sort this by. No, we don't need to do that. We can keep it like this. So, yeah, so let's, let's focus on the value here. So, on the value, so we can see actually before I even sort it, so on that source file, if we do go back to our source file real quick, we can see that it is sorted. So, our columns do go from B all the way over to 2030 in chronological order, right? So, it's going month by month from B to all the way to the end. Right, so when we pivot it, it's still going to keep that same chronological order because it's not going to unpivot in any dis in any type of way. It's going to unpivot it in the same way the columns were originally displayed. Right, it's just going to take those columns, just move them down essentially. Um, so so those dates are going to go chronologically now within our fields, and we can use that to our advantage because we know that those targets have an asterisk if there's a value that's same the previous month. Right, so we can use that pre-date sorting to our advantage so that we can use some other techniques within Power Query to get us the values we need. So, right, so focusing on the values again, um, so let's clear out those blanks, so just remove empty. So if you click on that little drop down, again, quick, simple transform button, we can just go ahead and remove empty. Empties aren't going to have a goal. And same thing with zeros. So if you click on again the filter drop down, let's go ahead and unclick on zeros. Awesome. So on the right, now you can see that we have filtered out those rows. So we filtered out the nulls, and we filtered out the zeros, and we filtered out the blanks. All right, so we filtered out those three values from our values field, and now what we need to do is just get this asterisk to go away. So what we can do here is we can, if we try to, so there's a little nifty technique here that we can do to essentially drop this value, since again, that asterisk means that it's the same value from the previous month, and it's chronological order, we can just grab, we can just have this value fill down to the next value, because again, that next value is going to be a new value, and the next asterisk will be the same value for that previous month, up until again, the new value. So we can use a technique with fill. So if we use fill, and we fill down, what we can do is we can fill this value down through the asterisks. However, what we need to do first is you can see if we try that step now, there's nothing to fill, right? These, there, we just filtered out all the blanks, so there's nothing to fill down. So that fill step doesn't do anything. So if we remove that, let's first start with trying to get that to work. So we're almost there. We just need to figure out how to get this asterisk to be fillable by its previous value. And the way that the fill transform works within Power BI is it will fill up or down based on blank values. So if we just replace in this field, we replace the asterisk with a null value, we can go ahead and fill down on the nulls. 
So let's go ahead and right click that field again. And let's go to where is replace. Let's go to, oh, we don't need to right click actually. Let's go to transform. Keep that field selected though. And let's go ahead and push replace values. Value defined. We are looking for asterisks and replace with null. And so there you go. So now you can see that we've replaced all of those asterisk values with a null. And so if we again right click on that value field, and now we can fill and fill down. And there you go. Now we can see that we have filled down on those asterisks up to its max date, which will stop at again a new date change or a new value change. So now the last step is just to make this value instead of a variable, instead of a text string, we can make it a whole number. Well, let's make it a decimal number. And there you go. So now we've got it as a dollar value. We've got those targets dated by an individual. And then the last step to keep this table clean, we can go ahead and right click on that original attribute value and just remove that attribute value, right? So now, we, now we've got our reportable date table. So we've got our, our data table. We've got a reportable table with an ID that we can relate in our model. We have a value with that target that we can date stamp with our date table there or with our date value against that target. And so we've, we've adjusted that really messy, really ugly original source file into that file that can now be used for Power BI to start reporting on and getting those insights and start comparing some values. All right, so we're not going to use this file. We're going to go ahead and delete this file from the model. This was just as a sample of what some best practices and some of those examples of Power Query Editor can do to help clean those files. A um, whole bunch more that Power BI can do within this editor. This was just a very quick, brief rundown of it. Again, there's really no file that is too messy for Power BI to clean. It can do it. Um, so all right, so now we are good with um, some best practices on Power Query Editor. We will go ahead and keep moving forward with how to uh, bring in the next file and get that next file all ready to go. Now that we know some of the basics and have walked through a good example of how to transform some very messy data, let's go ahead and just continue with grabbing our example files here. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and again go to a new source text and CSV and let's go ahead and grab the next files we're going to work on is the recruitment activity, placement commission, and revenue files. So these are going to be known as our fact tables um, and I'll go into kind of what I mean by fact tables in just a minute but we're going to grab our fact tables next. Let's grab our revenue. Okay on the preview let's go again new source text Let's grab placement, let's grab recruitment activity. And okay, and text CSV and placement commission as the last one. And okay. So, all right, so now that we've got our three fact tables in here, let's go ahead and make sure that these look all good before we move on um, to grabbing all of the rest of our lookup tables. So once we confirm these fact tables are all good, we'll go ahead and grab the rest of those lookup tables, and then we'll go through how to organize them, what exactly I mean by a fact and a lookup table, um, and how we can make sure they're organized within Power Query. Um, so that if we keep growing the model, it doesn't get disorganized or anything. But okay, so once we've got our tables in here. So we've again, these are our fact tables. Let's go ahead and make sure they've got everything we need to make sure they can match up to a placement table um, in that data modeling and relationship side. We'll need our fact tables to relate to a lookup table so that we can report on those fact tables, right? So on our revenue table, we should expect a placement ID, a date for when that date for when that revenue came in, and then the amount of when that of what the revenue was. Great, that looks all good. So this table so far, so good, that looks good. Let's go over to our placement commission table. So within our placement commission table, thinking about how um, a recruitment firm kind of operates and goes about the recruitment process, a placement can be split across a bunch of different employees. Different employees can contribute to that placement in different ways, right? So there could be some client role played or a candidate role played or a vacancy job order role played, right? So there are different roles that can be played that can 
contribute to some sort of placement commission on that placement that's made. Um, right, so then within this placement commission table, what this is telling us is for this placement ID, um, that placement ID was a part of this vacancy ID, they, it was for this candidate, and this is the employee that should receive this split for their contribution on that placement based on this role. Right, so we've got a couple of different ways that this data is being split out um, for us to relate to the employee table. Right, so we've got a placement ID and an employee ID that we can relate to our placement table and to our employee lookup table that's going to get us a value for that placement fee that was made for each employee, right? So we can start seeing how teams are performing. Are some managers overperforming others? Is there some lower level employee that's being very efficient? Can we start analyzing what they're doing and start doing that and extrapolating on that to the other teams? And do we need to implement that into L&D, right? So that's where you can kind of start getting into um, all the analysis and start extrapolating when we get into that data on these fact tables. Um, but so what we need to kind of do between this revenue and commission table is since since each placement has revenue that gets tied to it at a certain time frame, we need to still make sure that those revenue values are being tied to the appropriate individual based on those placements commission splits. Right, but these are our individual fact tables. We don't want to relate fact tables to each other. We want to save that relationship for our lookup tables going to our fact tables. Right, so what we want to do is we want to try to break out this revenue table so that we can have an employee ID based on their uh, specific split amount. Right, we want to make sure that each split amount or each revenue value that is coming in can be associated to the correct employee by the placement. And the way that we can do that is by merging on our revenue table the employee IDs from our commission split. So essentially, if, if, if you've ever been familiar with SQL, what we can do is we can do a left join on our revenue table by our placement ID onto our commission split table so that every matching placement ID on our revenue table will bring in the five commission split employee IDs for that placement. So here, I'll, I'll walk you through the example here. So let's go ahead and just use this placement ID as an example here. So let me go ahead and just filter this down real quick to show us an example. And let's just choose a date to keep it easier. OK. So if we've got this one line item, Let's go ahead and again just move this placement on commission. OK, so for this placement, on the placement commission table, this placement has five different employees that should be receiving a specific split percentage of the revenue when it comes in. Right, So each employee is entitled to a certain percentage of the revenue at the date that it comes in. But currently, on our revenue table, we don't have those split values. We just have a placement ID, right? So we can't relate it to a certain team. We don't know what employee is getting that revenue value. We just know that the full 100% came in at this amount. So what we can do is, again, we can do that merge on our revenue table to our placement commission table to get those IDs of those employees to then link it to our employee table. So what we can do is we can do that left that left join. So we're going to do a left outer join. What the, it, that's just how it's called in Power BI. It might be called different things in different places. Uh, but again, the, these are all the options that you have for those join types. A whole bunch of join types that can just, again, solve any of those situations that you need to get the data you need onto the tables that you need it on. So what we're going to do is this is our first table. So this revenue is our left side table. So we're going to take all from the first table, so all from the left, and then we're going to take the matching rows from the second by our placement ID. So we're going to take this placement ID, we're going to match it to our second table, and then every row that matches from our second table, we're going to put onto our first. So this single row on our revenue table will now become five rows when we press OK here. So again, so we're matching on our placement IDs 
between our two tables so that we can get the proper ID onto our revenue table so that we can provide the amounts for each employee that come in at the date that they come in. So let's go ahead and push OK here. And so when I push OK after the merge, you can see that I still only have the single table in my revenue. So I, uh, something's up, right? We don't have those five rows yet for all of our employees. And that's just because we haven't expanded that merge yet. So we only have, we, we still only merged over on the applied steps. We still only merged the queries, right? We haven't yet expanded them. So I usually uncheck this use original as prefix. And then what we want is we want the employee ID. So if we click on this little arrow, these double arrows, this is going to be the expand. So we're going to expand the table and we want to expand it by including the employee ID. And we also want to include the split percentage so that we can calculate their values. And there you go. Now you can see that we've got their five employee IDs that are originally listed here. So these five employee IDs that we're matching based on this placement ID are now shown on our revenue table. So that revenue amount that we are making for this placement at this date can now be allocated to the correct employee ID by their split. So we can now do this calculation split times total amount to then get that employee's amount that they made at that time frame. Right? And so let's go ahead and remove these filters and then we can see the full table kind of explode out a bit. And so now each placement will now have those split percentage values with those employees that are responsible to receive or entitled to receive that revenue. Right, so, so now we've got both of our fact tables can be related to the placement as well as the employee to get us the proper reporting to the specific employee or to the specific client based on the placement and the vacancy. All of that can now be done because we have those values, that split percentage based on the employee, based on the date for our commissions. Right, so, so those two tables are now good. We can now call those two tables good in terms of data. Now, before we move on to that last fact table, let's again just make sure that all of those IDs and all of those columns look all good to us, and then we can move on to that next field. So that ID column can stay good. Let's go ahead and just make these consistent. We've got placement ID. We've got date. Let's go date recognized or date the revenue is recognized. Rec. There we go. We've got total revenue amount. Let's make that up. Oh, let's keep it the same. Let's go employee ID and let's go split percentage. So this can go to a percentage. We can change employee ID is good. Revenue amount can go to a dollar value. And those other fields are good. OK, revenue table is looking good. So we renamed. We've changed the types to the types that we need. We are good on the revenue table. Let's go over to the placement commission table. So on this table, let's go through that same little exercise. Let's just rename placement. D, vacancy ID. A whole bunch of IDs on here. And again, just going through that tedious work, just have to do it once and then it is all set forever. So you do want to make sure that you do go through this tedious work on the front end so that, again, all of it is organized and it's easy to work with once you start writing your DAX calculations and stuff. All right, so we've renamed it. Let's go ahead and make sure these formats are good. Those look good to go. All right, and let's go over to that last fact table, our recruitment activity. Again, what we've got on here from the recruitment world, employees will make um, activities on job orders for candidates, right? So an employee um, or, or a recruiter will submit 
candidates to specific vacancies or job orders, and those vacancy or those uh, activities will end up either leading to a placement or not, right? So it will start with a placement being submitted to a job, and then that can a, a candidate being submitted to a job, that candidate might then have the opportunity to submit their CV, and then after their CV has been submitted or their resume has been submitted, they can then move on to a first round interview, second round, third round, then an offer might be extended, and then the candidate can accept or reject that offer. Accepting the offer leads to a placement, rejecting the offer leads to of course, no placement, right? So that's the activity that kind of takes place. And then this fact table can just kind of lead us to give us some valuable insights into productivity or pipeline efficiency or who's performing better with some metrics or something like that, right? So that's the goal of this recruitment activity table. Let's go ahead and get this table ready to go. Let's do our standard renaming. All right, and I think all of those values are all set to go. Yes, they are, wonderful. Alrighty, so now we've got our fact tables all set to go. Let's go ahead and, oh, what did I do here? What did I change? because we changed the column ID on our merged query. So again, the way that these uh, queries work is they go top to bottom. So this placement commission query has gone top to bottom to run its query. So this placement commission query, I have renamed that field that we merged onto. So within this merge step, this placement ID field no longer exists on placement commission because this query has ran through all of its applied steps and placement commission or placement ID, placement underscore ID is now placement space commission. So we have to go back to this table and let's click on our merge query and just reselect the renamed column, right? And then everything else will repopulate. That should. Placement ID to placement ID. Let's go, oh, right. So again, same issues. We renamed our other columns. So we can go ahead and click the cog wheel again, just in that step to let's pop out our employee ID and let's get our split percentage. And let's do our roll. Add a new one in there. Okay. Right, and then we don't need these renamed since we already did that renaming on the base. Let's go ahead and just rename these again. Perfect. It's all right. So there we go. So now we've got our fact tables ready to go. We've confirmed all of them are all set. And so again, going through that process that we just went through, very standard, right? Once you kind of start working through it, and that's kind of why we need to make sure that that foundation is all set and organized. Because once you start building on top of these things, if you need to change one thing, something else might break, right? So you need to make sure that everything is organized, everything is all set, and then you can start building on top of those things. Um, since everything is all set and nothing's going to change. All right, so let's go ahead and grab those other tables real quickly. Um, so let's just go ahead and grab all of these guys, and we don't need to do any work on these. These should be all good to go ahead and just push OK to. Go ahead and grab them all. And so in that next video, what we are going to do on the next one is we will just go through and talk about how we organize this data. So you've heard me mention lookup tables and fact tables. I'm going to go through kind of exactly what that kind of means very briefly. We'll get more into it with the data modeling um, and how we want to organize those different tables within our query um, with, with our queries on the left side panel in Power Query Editor. All right. So let's go ahead and grab this one. Employee. We've got client contact press OK, 
got a couple more here, I think. So you've got employee, you've got placement, and let's take a vacancy or job orders. All right. So all right. So now we've got all of our tables in here. Um, I will see you guys in the next one to talk about how to organize this. Now that we've got all of our tables in here for all of our data sources um, to create our model, what we want to do is start organizing this data. So you've heard me mention fact tables and lookup tables. The way, going back to how Power BI works with stuff and our data modeling, the way that we want to, again, start thinking about data is we have a lookup table and then fact tables. So our lookup tables are going to be those things like the placement. So what, what all contains on the placement, all of the placements information. And then the revenue is just going to contain the facts to that placement. So the date that the revenue is recognized, the date of the person that got the revenue, right? So it's just going to contain those facts of what happened. So from like a sales order perspective, we're going to have an order table and then a sales table, right? So we'll have the orders what orders were made, the order number, the details of that order, and then we'll have a, that's the lookup table, and then we'll have a fact table being the sales. So what that order contained, all of the products that were a part of the order, all of the dollars that made up that order's total, right? So all of those things are going to be on that sales fact table or on our placement commission or revenue fact tables. That's going to be the breakdown of all of the lookups of what happened to those lookup values on the facts, right? So that's that's how we want to start thinking about it. There's always going to be kind of that lookup fact table type relationship within Power BI between all of the tables, right? So let's go ahead and start working on how we can organize Power Query Editor to start seeing what that would look like, right? So let's go ahead. We know what these three tables are. We know that these three are going to be our fact tables. So if you go ahead and right click these tables, you can go ahead and right click them or first let's select all three of them the way you do that is control click or shift click between them once you've got them collected go ahead a uh, selected go ahead and right click and click on move to group go ahead and push new group let's name this fact tables so once we do that we can see that we've created a folder exactly what we wanted to do. So now we can start see that we're, we're organizing our items, right? So just like that, we've already created those nine queries into two folders. Nice and easy to look at. You can easily tell which are the fact tables, right? Great. That was what we wanted. But now we've still got these danglers out here, right? We've still got to move these tables into another group. So again, let's just go ahead, do the same thing. Click on those lookup tables and move them into a lookup tables group. I like to think of my stuff kind of top to bottom. Lookup tables go on the top, fact tables go on the bottom. So I'm just going to move that around. Lookup tables on top, fact tables on the bottom. Um, but great, you can see that we've already organized um, the Power Query window with just those quick folders, right? So it's just that easy. And there's no real limit to how many folders you can create, right? You can just keep creating new groups within these groups, move them in there. You can keep moving them in. Right, you can just you can just keep going with it, right? Um, so create create whatever kind of groups are helpful to you to make your uh, model as organized as you need it to be. Um, again, I definitely suggest there be no, there be more than nothing in terms of organization. Um, some type of folder structure, some type of way to organize this model in your um, or these tables within your Power Query Editor is very important, especially for when you start um, getting into some of the more in-depth stuff with a bunch of different queries and a bunch of different tables that you need to connect to. So again, just some more cleanup work. In order for your tables, when you're working with the data, to dis the way your tables display in Power BI is top to bottom in alphabetical order. Right, so I, I typically like to keep those, again, lookup tables starting with that same word so that my lookup tables will appear in the same kind of section within my Power BI data, and all of the fact tables will also appear in that same kind of section. Right, So it's just, again, much easier way to organize your data. Just I'll put lookup or fact for any of my tables so that when I'm looking through the data, I know what section to go to. Am I looking for a lookup table? Am I looking for a fact table? Just makes it a lot easier to navigate that that data structure. So let me just go through renaming all of these guys just so you kind of can see what it will look like at the end. And then once we go through this, we will get on to exactly more 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 in depth, not exactly, but we'll get more in depth into what that M code is up here into this little section. 
Um, we will talk about what M code is, what you need to know about it. Um, you definitely don't need to code, so no worries there, but it is definitely helpful to just kind of understand what makes up your queries. Definitely could have done this quicker, but that's okay. Thanks for hanging out. Okay. There we go. So now we've got our tables organized. We've got them all nice and neat. We've got them in the correct data. All of our tables have been ETL'd. We've got all of our applied steps that we need. Um, we are ready to go to get this in the model. So before we end up getting this loaded in, we need a couple more things. We need a date table, um, which we will go through in just a minute. And before we do that date table, like I said, we're gonna get into M code and then we're gonna do that date table and then we can load our data into the model and get into modeling. So. On to the um, what M code is, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Getting into some of the technical stuff with Power BI here for a minute. So getting into M code. M code is what uh, Power Query is built off of. So the code that does all of the Power Query um, background and all of the work behind the scenes is called M code. Um, so you don't need to know M code. All of it is generated for you automatically within Power Query, right? But that's that's this window bar up here. Whenever you're doing those steps, that's what's happening up here. M code is doing those steps for you that you're doing with your clicks it's generating that code for you automatically so you don't need to know m code however it's very good to just kind of understand what m code does so that you can either if you hit an error you can troubleshoot through it you can adjust a simple comma here or there or if you want start adjusting and coding in m code if you want to just do queries through m code right um, so it, it, it is helpful just to know and understand exactly what what M code is, where you can find it, and how you can adjust, and how you might be able to just read it from a starting level. So, what M code is, is again, it's that code that is going to build you all of these steps. So, each of these steps you can see up here is that code that is doing the step. So, it's that code that's following your automation during your refresh. It's going to give you each of your table's processes to follow to give you that output reportable data that you want. The way that you can look at each of these tables. M code within one big editor is on the advanced editor. So when you select a query or one of your tables, you can go to the advanced editor section. When you click on this, it's going to essentially just list all of those applied steps. So, right, so what this advanced query editor is, is it's just these applied steps just in the M code format that does the query generation. So this is the format that the code needs to be in for the query to generate properly. The way that it looks on the interface for Power BI Power Query is these applied steps. Right, so within here, the way that this works is again, it's just going top to bottom and then it's just naming what the step is. It's starting out with what it was done previously or what's currently being done. So this is the function. So it starts out with equals the function. It's saying it's calling the previous step and then it's doing its function. Right, so it's it's very basic in what M code is and how it how it can be written, um, but it, it's it gets pretty in depth if you need to start doing some custom things. Um, and again, when when you do do some of those columns from examples, you can look at how M code is written. Right, so M code does get written during the column from example section and you can also just write M code by going to a custom column right so within the custom column when you're adding a new column this add column formula is expecting an M code formula it's not expecting Excel formulas it's not expecting DAX it's expecting a new custom column in the M code format M code syntax um, so again it, it might not be helpful for you this might not be some somewhere for you to be if you want to enter in a custom column column and you're thinking it's again just like an Excel thing not Excel this is M code for that custom column you can definitely do it you can create custom columns again the columns from example does that and then you can see that syntax to try to be able to understand what exactly that code is generating more um, but again just making sure that you understand that that's M code, not, not anything else for the custom column here. So that's, that's pretty much all you need to know about M code. You can find it, you can find your queries M code on the home button in the advanced editor section. If you want to understand what exactly is happening there, you can look at it and interpret it. It's very basic syntax, um, just writing it 
you don't need to know how to write it learn a bit about it understand it so you can correct anything if you hit any errors in any of your queries down the road um, but that's M code don't need to know much more than that and we will see you on the next one talking about how to create your date table with some M code see you on the next one so let's talk about date tables in Power BI so like I said at the beginning when we were going through the file settings for turning off the auto date time, date time and date tables within Power BI is a pretty unique concept um, and we need to either create a date table or have one generated for us or use DAX to generate one for us. What I found the best to do is I use a coded date table um, based off of some M code that's been pre-written. I just copy and paste it into all of my models. What that M code does is it's a function that will take specific parameters. Um, you can enter in a specific fiscal year or a start to a fiscal year, start to a fiscal month um, or fiscal week, when your fiscal week starts, when it ends, week ending dates. So I, I use a date table that's generated from some custom parameters and then has um, a bunch of different dates fields pretty much any date field that you could ever need within your power bi report as opposed to just generating the automatic date table or just using something with dax right so i end up using this date table in all of my models it's very important to use the date table because then you can create all of your date relationships to all of your fact tables um, and even lookup tables um, if, if you've got date relationships to those that you need to do right but that date table is what you will be able to use to connect to all of your other tables to then filter off of one uniform date table that has all of the date fields you could ever need to connect all of those tables by a single date filter right so that's why the date table is so important and why generating one with kind of all of the fields you need is so valuable down the line when you start using models that might have different fiscal years for firms or you're at a week that starts on wednesday for some reason for some billing cycle you can do all of those changes within this date table code that we're going to go through so within the resources of the course we've got this date table code this is just a text file with all of the same M code. So again, that M code that we just looked at, it's just a function of M code. Um, so it gives you a function query as opposed to a table query that we can just copy and paste. So control A, control C, hop back over to Power Query, and we can just paste it into a query here. So let's go ahead and click on new source. Let's go to blank source. Once we've got the blank source created, let's go ahead to advanced editor again. In advanced editor, we can just delete delete all of this, so highlight that all and just paste the date table code into the query. Great. So once we've pasted the date table code, you can just go ahead and push OK. And once we've pushed OK, you can see that the date function, so this is the date query function, has now populated. So this is going to be able to be where we can set kind of those parameters that I was mentioning um, and set some of those customizations for our date table. So what these parameter values are gonna do for us is we can enter in that start and the end date and then specify what our fiscal year we wanna start on if we wanna give it a specific start month for our fiscal year. So the parameters that we wanna enter in for this data set are going to be January 1st, 2020, going out to December 31st, 2021. And let's say we want to have an example date table with the fiscal year starting on month number three. And if we wanted to include a holiday table, what we could do with this holiday value, what this means with the choose column, is we could choose a query within our queries that would have a date a date column and a holiday column. What that would do is it would, it would mark the holidays on that table as exclusions on that date. So that date that is tied to that holiday that we select would then exclude, once we invoke this date table creation, it would then exclude those holiday dates from some of the specific date table fields like is working day or is business day. The is business day would then be false based on the holiday date, right? So if it's a holiday date on that holiday table you link in based on that choose column, 
then it would then show false for business day, right? So those those are just things that just enhance that date table that we can use um, to make that analysis more powerful whenever we get to those DAX calculations, right? And then same kind of thing, whenever if you want to change the weekday start, you can also change that as well. And then down here, we'll just kind of give you some more examples onto exactly what, um, what the date table functions do and how you can use them to adjust them and stuff, right? So pretty nice and nif nifty to use within your date table. Again, I use this on all of my M code functions um, or on all of my models. Um, I use this date table. It's all encompassing. I use it for everything. So once you've got your start and end dates, you can go ahead and push invoke. And so once we push invoke, we can see we went from a function query, so this is the function, into a now table query. So we've invoked the query. So let's go ahead and rename this date table function. So again, just making sure we stay organized. And our date table, I will always name that date table. Let's go ahead and move this to a new group. And this is going to be our date table. So great. So it, let's go ahead and open up this date table. On this date table, you can see kind of all of those fields that we've got, right? Let's let's look at these fields. So we've got all of these different fields now on this date table that we automatically generated, and we can customize how we want, right? So we've got that is holiday field that I was talking about. We've got some uh, is previous year, is previous fiscal year, is previous year to date, right? So we've got a bunch of different options that we can work with on this date column that we can just throw in onto a slicer on our page for our report, and just boom. Instead of having to calculate something with some custom DAX or something, we just use our date table field on our slicer. Should just throw it on there, and you're all done. All right, so once this is all set um, and you've got your date table invoked with the custom parameters that you want, you've got your lookup tables all organized, you've got your fact tables all ETL'd with all the proper applied steps in there, um, and all of your queries are organized and ready to go, you are ready to go ahead and push close and apply and load your data in and we can get moving on to data modeling. So once we are all set here, we can go ahead and push close and apply on the home tab push close and apply. What this is going to do again, it's going to apply all of those steps to our source data. So that source data we've chosen on all of these different queries, it's going to then apply all of those steps during the data load process and then give us those final files that we are looking at on this preview screen. All right, so let's go ahead and close and apply. Here it is building those connections, loading in the data, and voila, once it gives you the check marks, your data has successfully loaded in. And the next spot we will be on is going to be on the model view tab. So on the left side of Power BI desktop, if you want to go ahead and push the model view tab, it's that little tree looking icon thing, this is where we're going to start for our next section for the data modeling part of Power BI. And uh, we will get kicking from there. So I'll see you guys on the next one. Let's get into data modeling for Power BI. So the way that we're going to go about data modeling within the course is instead of just tackling this whole thing, right, instead of tackling all of our tables at once, we've got a lot of them here, right? It could be overwhelming at the start. So let's just go through kind of a very simple way to understand it, um, just using kind of that sales product and orders kind of thought process. So in, again, our world, recruiting world, um, this data set, let's think of it as our placement table and then our revenue and placement commissions, right? So we'll, those those are kind of going to be how we'll start um, our modeling and then just describe what's happening, how to build relationships, what type of relationships can be used between all of those different tables. And then when you get to the next sections with DAX and some report, um, visualization stuff, that's when we'll go back to the data modeling to start building on top of what we build now in this section to show kind of how important and building on top of your data model is to understand what your data model is doing so then you can visualize and create those DAX expressions that we're going to get into, right? So first in this section, we'll just start very basic. Um, we're just going to look at a placement table, describe what are all of these lookup table, fact table things mean that I've been talking about so much, um, and then we'll um, go into how to create all of those different relationships and what they all mean, right? <coughs> all right, so what a lookup table is. So the way that you want to kind of think about um, the modeling within Power BI is everything that you do within Power BI is based on either relationships or DAX or context, right? So the, 
all of the relationships and filters and visualizations that you can put on the page, they're all dependent on what type of relationships you set within your model, because those will give you the context to what is on the page. So a lookup table will contain all of those, like we said earlier, all of those sales or placements, that all of the things that a client, an employee, all of the things that have like descriptions to it, right? So things that are a unique value, so a, a person, right? So some, some type of table that has a unique value to it is gonna be a lookup table typically. That's how you can typically think of it. So a bunch of repeated categories um, for placements, right? So we'll have all of these different fields on our placement table, and then we can relate those fields to our fact tables. So that's that's the purpose of the lookup table, right? It, it essentially puts these fields that we have on our lookup table onto our fact tables. Because when we put it on the page within Power BI, when we create those relationships, our lookup table will be our reference to our fact table. So it'll be what essentially joins all of our fact table data to one placement ID. And so when we put a placement ID on there that's related to all of our fact tables, we can bring all of the other fact tables data related to that same one placement ID. Right, so that's kind of what a lookup table's goal is. So, so we, we have a category value or a unique value on a table that we can relate to multiple fact tables to then build data analyses around those fact tables with the data on them. Right, so not sure if that's too clear right now. Um, so let's go through some examples of what exactly that means and how we can build some of these things within Power BI. So the way that we do the modeling is with, um, which is drag and drops, right? So it's very simple the way the Power BI allows you to do data modeling. And so in the next section, we will go through how to do the data modeling and what each of the different types of relationships mean um, when you're building out your model and how we wanna think about those relationships when we're building them. Getting into how to build your model now. So now that we kind of understand what the lookup tables and fact tables are and how they kind of relate to each other, now let's go through how we actually build those relationships and get our data talking to each other. <clears throat> and how, how do we want to manage that? Because again, management's so important. We got a bunch of these tables, right? We don't want it to get out of control. Um, so let's first zoom out of it so we can see a bit more here. So again, so our lookup tables are gonna be the way that we wanna organize your this model page, the way you wanna organize your model view is the best way that I've come to think about it is kind of a top to bottom view. So essentially a little waterfall, right? Whatever is gonna be on the top is gonna to filter stuff underneath. So you can have three, four, five, six different layers of the waterfall and then whatever's underneath the layer above it, that top layer will filter what's underneath. Right, so that's, that's the best way that I've kind of grown to understand how Power BI modeling works. Top to bottom will filter, bottom to top will not filter. So your fact tables won't filter upwards to your lookup table. Right, and so let, let's go through what exactly that means. So on our placement table, we've got an ID. So again, that unique identifier on our placement table. This is gonna be a unique value across our placement table. We want to relate this to, let's go to our revenue table, to our revenue table. We don't want to relate it to the revenue table ID, we want it to relate it to the revenue table's placement ID, since this is the placement table's ID, right? So all you have to do again, just drag and drop. So from the lookup table, from your placement table, just drag and drop onto your fact table where it says placement ID. When you do that, you can see that a little arrow is created, a little line. This is the relationship. So within Power BI, these lines that, you, that you'll see on this model page, those are relationships. Let me open this up. When you click on the relationship in your properties pane on the right side of Power BI, um, you can see some little descriptions. So it's gonna essentially show you um, some descriptions of what the relationship is, right? So we've got a relationship that is active. So the relationship is active and it's a single one-way relationship. So we've got this arrow, again, think of the waterfall, we've got the arrow going down. Uh, let's do a better arrow, come on. Show me a better arrow, why can't you go straight? There we go. So you got the 
arrow going downwards, right? So again, waterfall. Placements will filter revenue, but the revenue table will not filter placements. So if I put on the page placement ID by, placement ID by revenue, I won't be able to filter anything if I made a measure on the placement table, right? It just won't filter that way, but it will filter the other way. Placements tables, placement table will filter revenue. Again, by that, you can see by that arrow. We can change that so they can go both ways. We'll go into some of those things down the line, uh, but you can change the relationship direction so you can't have things go two-way. Two-way relationships can be useful in, most, in some situations, but for most cases, just a single drag and drop will do it. And then one other thing you want to notice on the properties pane of the relationship is the cardinality. So the cardinality, again, is where that unique value from that lookup table comes into play. You can see where it's got a 1. Let's zoom in here a bit. Where we've got the 1, that's going to be that unique value going to that many side of the relationship. right? So we've got a 1 to many relationship going in a single direction from our lookup table down. And let's go ahead and do the same thing for our other IDs. So our placement commission table. We've also got the placement ID, recruitment activity, something else. Let's move you off to the side for now. So all right. Oh, no, I like that. There we go. Perfect. So all right. So now we can see that our placement table is now going to be linking our two fact tables together, essentially. Right? Let's collapse these tables. So we look at this model now, now we can see again that waterfall effect, right? So we've got our table on top that will filter our two tables beneath. So that's how we can start to kind of think of our model. We've, we've got the waterfall from top to bottom that will filter the fact tables. Lookup tables go on top, fact tables go underneath. And then let's go ahead and throw on one other relationship. Let's add in our date relationship to our fact table. So we also have our date table, right? The way that I'll organize this uh, page is I'll usually always put my date table up on the top, top, top left, right? So it can't be dragged up any further. So that way I know that that's the limit of the page, right? Because this page is pretty limited. It gets bigger as many, pa you can keep adding as many tables as you want. You can make it bigger, right? But you do want to still be able to understand your model as it grows. So you want to make sure you can organize it and keep it very succinct what you're looking at. So again, date table will always put in the top left corner. And then um, those fact tables and lookup tables, again, that waterfall effect. I'll make sure I collapse everything once I've got everything made, organize it nice and neatly, and then have that waterfall effect from top to bottom. So if I've got any other tables on top of our placement table, let's say our job orders, I'll again put that above, right? So I'll put that above my placement table and then link it to the placements, right? And so again, we just build up that waterfall effect, right? So going up higher, we just have a bit more levels. And again, you can see how it stays organized, even though we get more tables, right? I can still kind of see the flow of what tables would filter what. All right, so that's kind of how I would best recommend you build out the model, how those relationships work, um, and then how you can build them, right? So very easy. Let's go ahead and just make that date table relationship too real quick. So again, just drag and drop date onto the date for the fact table revenue. And there you go. You can see we've got that one to many relationship again. So, all right, now that we've set up those basic relationships, um, let's go ahead and move on to the next section of modeling. Now that we've got the basics down, let's go ahead and just add a little bit more complexity to the base model um, before we go ahead into kind of the next section. So let's go ahead and bring in that other fact table that we dragged out, so that recruitment activity table. So on this table, you can see that we don't have any placement IDs on the recruitment activity. And that's because, well, candidates and job orders and vacancies, they have recruitment activity and the placement is essentially the end point of that activity, right? So instead of having a placement ID, because not every recruitment activity will have that, we can't relate to that to know what candidate had each activity, right? We can only relate it to a candidate and a job order or a vacancy. So on a recruitment table, instead of linking to our placements, we can drag over some new tables and then we can work through how to organize those 
while our model starts getting a little bit more complex, right? So, all right, so let's go ahead and move our other tables over down just a bit since we're bringing on some more lookup tables here. All right. So we can keep our fact tables all the way down here at the bottom so this can stay kind of at the same level. We don't need to go underneath anything other than our fact tables, right? That's our last level of our waterfall. So everything we want, all of our tables on top up here to filter all of our fact tables, right? So that waterfall again. So we're just gonna keep that same kind of organization here when we're bringing in these three new tables. We've got that recruitment activity all the way at the bottom and then our lookup tables again up above. And then I've just put them up here because in the future we'll link them to the placement table. Not gonna do that right now, but just put them up here for future organizational purposes. So what we wanna link now are our IDs to our recruitment activity. So again, instead of that placement activity, we've got a vacancy activity on a recruitment activity table and a candidate activity ID, or a candidate ID, vacancy ID and candidate ID. So let's go ahead and start with our vacancy table. Go ahead and grab our ID from our vacancy table and drag and drop onto our recruitment activity. And same thing with candidate. Candidate ID, go into candidate ID of your recruitment activity table. It's great, so now we've got those on there. Uh, let's go ahead and we've got one more to do. We've got our date table on our activity. So let's go ahead and again, grab the date table from the top left, drag and drop the date onto date added. And there we go. So now you can see that our model is quickly building up, right? We can quickly see how this can get out of control if we don't follow kind of a, some sort of organization. So again, let's collapse these so we can organize these a bit neater. Let's go ahead and collapse you. Move you down a bit. All right, so now instead of that big clutter that we just had. Now we've got a more succinct looking model already, right? Just by organizing it in that quick little way. And so along with making this a little bit more complicated, let's go ahead and also talk about inactive versus active relationships, right? So just kind of that other layer. So we've got multiple lookup tables here connecting to fact tables, right? Let's now get into how we work with, let's say, multiple dates. So there are a lot of situations where your lookup tables or your fact tables might have multiple dates, but there might already be a date relationship that's preventing you from making an active date relationship to where you want to get a new date relationship on, right? So what we can do is we can, Power BI allows you to create inactive date relationships. So what you can do with that is let's go ahead and let's pop open our placement table as an example, and let's drag and drop our date over to the date added on the placement table. So when we do that, we can see that we get a dotted line. Right, so our line, instead of that solid line that we've seen before, now we got a dotted line. What the dotted line tells us is that the make active relationship is set to no. So this is what's called an inactive relationship in Power BI. What those do is whenever we're filtering by, let's say our date, Power BI is not actually using this inactive relationship. It just gives us the ability within our DAX measures to later call that relationship to make it active. So let's say we want to, for some reason, make our revenue all dated when we filter by the date, by the date added of the placement. We can do that by using a DAX measure to activate this date added on our placement table to give our other fact tables different context than they have natively, right? So that active date relationship on a revenue table, which is set to yes, right? Date to revenue date can be changed if we use a different use relationship within our DAX measures, right? So we'll get into how we can do that a lot more in depth going down the line when we get into DAX um, and visualizations. But just as an example, those inactive relationships can be very powerful in um, helping you create the model that you want to work with as opposed to building multiple different models that you need so that you can use the different date relationships that you think you need. You can just get it all into one model and then just work with the different relationships within your DAX measures 
if you know what your model is doing, right? So again, going back to how important it is that your model's organized, you've got to keep it organized so that you can know what the model's doing so that you can activate those relationships when and how you need to, right? Because now you can see our relationships are already getting really complicated. Let's go ahead and add a couple more date relationships just to show you how quickly it can just spiral out of control, right? So there's another date on our fact table for book date. And go ahead and add that one and there's another date for scheduled end and there's another date for start date right so there's there's a reason that we would want to report on all of these different dates within our placement right we might want to know how many placements are ending within a certain time frame then we would need to use the scheduled end date relationship we might want to know how many placements were booked during a certain time frame then we would use the book date right so there are a bunch of different reasons why we might want to need these other dates but they're inactive relationships. But now that we have them within the model, we can call them within DAX, right? So we just need to know that our dates are not actively filtering by this, but we have the opportunity if we need to, if there are any requests to get certain metrics or analysis on those type of data points around the dates, we can do that by just creating an index. And again, let's go ahead and just add a couple more. Date to vacancy date added, date to candidate date added. Oh, that was added by. That was added by too, sorry. Let's go date added. And date added. And let's collapse this again. So there you go. So now, very quickly, you can see how that model is getting very, very messy with all of those lines. So if we were just throwing all of those tables around and we didn't have any organization of how we were building out that model, we could quickly lose what's happening within that model. Right, but since we've got some sort of organization to it, we've got some sort of structure to what we're building out. Our lookup tables are on top, filtering top to bottom. Everything on top will filter everything underneath. Our date table is always over there, kind of out of the way. We know where all those lines are coming from. We, we can know and quickly understand what's happening within the model. And then it's easy to kind of train others once they get other new hires kind of on the Power BI model too, right? So very easy to kind of start scaling this up once you use that organization techniques to start getting it um, built up and more in depth with your modeling techniques. So, all right, now that we are all set with some of those complex modeling relationships, um, let's go ahead and get into some of the DAX calculations. So we'll start getting into some of the meat and bones of how to start writing calculations, what filter context means, um, what all of these relationships kind of do. Now that we've set them up, we can start looking at some of those numbers. And then we'll definitely be back into this modeling screen a bit later on so that we can continue to build out and make those DAX measures that we create a lot more powerful. See you guys in the next one. Getting started with DAX. So we have set the groundwork for our model. We have cleaned our data. Now we are ready to start touching our data, doing stuff to it, putting it on the page, seeing what it looks like. But to do that in Power BI, we have to understand how to use DAX. So what DAX is, is DAX is just the data analysis expressions language or engine, whatever you want to call it, that Power BI uses to run calculations. So again, let's relate it to kind of the Excel world. Relating it to Excel, it's very similar to Excel functions, right? So you've got sums, you've got averages, you've got counts, very similar similar to those Excel functions, but at the same time, the way that it calculates those things, totally different. Um, so that's kind of the, the way that DAX uses um, its expressions um, and the way that you want to start thinking about it is it's similar to Excel in the way that you can write expressions, but the way that they calculate and do their values are not the same at all. Um, so with DAX, why we want to use DAX and why, why DAX is so great within Power BI is because it really allows us to use those contexts behind the DAX engine. So instead of, again, going to that Excel example, instead of calculating a specific cell, it uses the concept of context to get us a value. And so we'll go through the concept of context in um, another video here in a second. Uh, but what the context does is it allows us to make all of those visuals that we put on the page, everything that we put on the page in Power BI is interactive. So when you click on one thing, everything else on the page will filter by that thing if you've got your model set up right. right? And so that's the power of that DAX context concept um, that really comes into play and why it's great with Power BI. Um, with its visualization capability. 
so kind of the the main concepts of of dax um like i've been saying we've got those calculations those are the measures right so we either create within dax you either create a measure or a calculated column calculated columns go on to go directly onto a new table right so you can create a calculated column with a dax expression the same way that you can create a think of it as just a calculation but they're called measures same as you can create a measure that does a calculation on a table but it's not actually a column on a table it's not a physical data value on any data source it's just a dax expression that can be put onto a data page and given context to get a value outside of those calculations and measures and calculated columns the way that dax engine runs is through iterators and aggregator functions so what aggregator functions do is they will just sum up columns right so think of that columns it's an aggregation calculation of a full column or table that is provided to that calculation value right so if there's a sum we're giving an entire column and it's going to aggregate that entire columns value in a sum based on the filter and context it's given right so that's an aggregator function and there are also iterator functions or what can be known as row context right so the way that iterator functions work is they calculate you can think of those best at a, a calculated column context right so if you're calculating a column you're taking an exact row on that column and taking two values or three values multiplied by each other by that same row right so we're on that same row value and we're taking an iteration so every row will go through and do the same calculation so again let's stick to that sum x right so we're or sum value in power bi an iterator function is notated by an x at the end of it so just like an aggregator we've got a sum value there's a sum x value so as opposed to summarizing a column that will specify what we will instead do is we will sum a table based on an expression. So, and again, we'll, we'll get into all of this as we do some examples here. I'm just going through some of these concepts. So the way that that iterator functions work is over our sales table or over our revenue table, we'll take a function to multiply the number of products by sales price to get a total sales value, as opposed to taking a sum of our total sales value column, right? So those are those are the difference between the two kind of uh, main iterator and aggregator concepts between Power BI, um, and we'll we'll get into how how we can use those in just a bit. Um, and then before we get into writing Power BI, and again how to organize it, of course, one of the best resources that I typically use is Dax Got Guide. Um, they've got all of the functions on here, um, great resource to kind of look through, um, search through functions that you might need, find out exactly what a function might do, what does a function need or contain, right? So very, very good resource um, that I typically use, dax.guide, um, especially when you're getting started, very helpful. Um, but all right, so now that we know kind of what DAX is and the groundworks behind DAX, let's get into it. Let's start putting stuff on the page, getting stuff organized, and uh, let's start writing some DAX expressions. To start out with our first DAX calculations, let's first do a calculated column. Those tend to be kind of the simplest to understand because you're still working with that table data view um, and you're working with kind of a, a cell looking type of context, right? So let's go ahead and on the left side, click on the data view tab. <coughs> And let's go out to our placement commission table. So on our placement commission table, you can see that we don't know what the fee value for is on the placement, right? So we have the placement number, um, but let's say we wanted to take just the sum of that placement value calculation for each employee. We're not able to do that because we don't have that placement fee value on this, uh, on this table, right? However, it is on the placement table, right? So the placement table fee is does exist but it's on the lookup table right so let's go ahead and create a calculated column with dax to get us the fee value for that placement id and so i'll go through a couple of ways that we can do this um, we'll end up doing the simplest way and then we'll go through another uh, measure to then do some of those calculations um, on this table so 
first what we're going to do is on the table so let's click on the fact table commission fact table placement commission table and we are going to we're not going to do a new measure but up at the top we're going to do a new column and so you've heard me say it many times context within power bi so what we're working with the way context works is there are three main context uh, concepts within Power BI, right? What we're working with on this one, I'll explain the other two later, are is row context. So what we're going to be working with in our DAX calculation is row context. So every value within our DAX calculation is calculated by the row that it is on, right? So you can think of it very similarly to Excel in this sense when we're thinking about calculated columns, right? So let's name this total fee value and what we want to do here is we want to grab a value from a different table and put it on to this table so we can do that a couple of ways one way that we can do that is using a function in Power BI called lookup value and what this will do is it will find us a value based on another value, right? So if we want to find the placement fee based on the lookup table's placement ID and this table's placement ID, that's what we would specify within that function, right? And there's another measure for related, which is a way to get a, you can get the one side of a many relationship on a related function. So since this table is the many side of a one to many relationship, we can use related to pull a one sided value from the one sided table, right? So I'll go through both of those here um, and talk about kind of what DAX is doing and what we're calculating and how we're using row context um, and a bit more of what row context means once we've got a value here. But let's get into writing the DAX calculation. So when we when we push our new column value, we're going to start typing into the formula bar. So up here is our DAX formula bar. What we are going to type in is, let's type in any letter, right? When you just type in a letter, very similar to Excel, again, you'll get that pop-up value of the options that start with that, right? So type in any letter and you'll get all of those functions that Power BI offers you uh, by default to calculate something. So if we go ahead and type up lookup value, if you click on the arrow over here, you can read more on the function. So lookup value is going to retrieve a value from a table. So let's go ahead and use this function. Within DAX, again, for organization, I am very strict about formatting measures, again, so that other people can look at the measures and know exactly what your function's doing, um, know exactly what your measure's trying to do. Very, very helpful when reading DAX to format your functions in a very specific way. Um, I'll get into exactly how we can do that later on, um, but again, just for that organization purposes, when you see me organize a DAX that way, that's the reason. So, all right, so lookup value. Within this lookup value, when you press tab, you'll see, again, very similar to Excel, the options for entering in this function's value, right? So this, these options are going to tell you what you need to enter in for this function to work. So the first argument within this function is a result column. The result column we want is the fee value from the placement table. So if we type in fee, it will give us the options with fee. That is the one we want. Let's go ahead and push comma. The next argument is going to be the search column. And so in, in this second argument, you can see that we're now limited to just the placement table as options. That's because in the first argument, we entered a placement table value, right? So we entered a placement table value. The function now only gives us the option to search that table for a value, right? And the value that we're searching for on this table is the placement ID. So let's go ahead and select the ID from the placement table and then push comma again. And then that next argument is the search value. So we're searching the placement ID. So we're in the search column. We're searching the column, this placement ID column, for this value. So we're searching placement ID for placement ID on the commission table. All right. So again, to walk through kind of what it's doing, we're looking for the placement ID by each row Again, we're on row context since we're in a calculated column. So every row within this new column is going to calculate by each individual placement ID. 
So at every row that it's looking at that this calculated commonly entered for, it's going to check each placement ID at its row level against the placement ID in the placement table and then give us the placement fee. So let's go ahead and push enter onto this and see it work. And there you go. Let's sort these here. So now you can see the placement fee is the same for all of those placement values, right? So we've got that same placement value across all of our placements so that we know that it is that's the correct fee value. It's the same placement across across the board for each placement. So let's go ahead and just look it up just to confirm. So placement 1002 should have a fee value of 10,051. Let's go over to our placement table. Search our ID 1002 should have a fee value of 10,051. And there you go, 10,051. Sorry, so we validated that that is the correct measure that we used on our total fee value calculation. So again, so now we can get into kind of what that main thought process is behind that context of row context within DAX, right? So one of the main contexts, key, val key uh, points of context um, are row context. Row context, again, is calculated at each of these cell values on this table. So again, going at each row, we're looking at that placement ID, and then this value is being calculated based on this placement ID on the exact row. So every row is based on its specifics row. Right, so that's row context. Very important, very important initial concept to understand. Row context within Power BI. So, all right, so now that we've got one lookup value option, let's go ahead with do, and do another. Right, so, so I mentioned that there are two options. So within DAX, there are always going to be a bunch of different options to solve probably the same type of situation. One is probably going to be a lot simpler and more basic than the other. That's typically the solution that you want to go with. It's just going to be a lot cleaner, make the model nicer to work with as you keep building up. So instead, let's go ahead with the related value, right? So the related value, again, like we said, it allows you to return a related value from another table. So what that means essentially is again, that many to one sided relationship. So whenever you wanna use related, the only way that you'll be able to call a value is if it's on the one side of a one to many relationship. So when I type in a value here, the only options that we get, or when I type enter, so, or when I type um, tab after I select the related function, the only option I get is that one-sided value table, right? So that placement table, that's the only table this commission table is related to in a many-to-one relationship. So that's the only thing I can select from. So very similar to the lookup value thing, but I only need to select one thing. I, knew, I only need to enter one argument because it's just related to the placement table, right? So it'll, it's a lot simpler. I can just select the fee. And then there's that same 10,051, right? So instead of having to do three arguments for an entire calculation, I could just use the same row context and use the related function to get the exact same value. So it's just a lot cleaner way to get the exact same value. Um, just a nice nifty trick, right? To know that there are a bunch of different functions out there that can land you at the same spot, but one might be simpler than the other. And then let's go ahead with one more function here. Let's go ahead and just multiply these two things by each other, right? Well, let's go with fee split value. So all we need to do for this is, again, since we're in row context with a calculated column, we can just multiply those two fields by each other since we're just at the, at the row context. Every value will take itself its fee percentage times its fee value to give us its percentage split. Right? And so there you go. So you can see that that's a quick and easy way to use that row context to get you those values that we need. Right, so that's the intro to your first foray into writing your first DAX expression and understanding row context. Before we move on to measures, want to go through the difference between kind of calculated columns versus measures, um, when we might want to use a calculated column versus when we might need to use a measure, um, and why measures might be just better to use in most cases versus the calculated column, and how it might be hard to move away from those calculated columns coming from that Excel background. So again, when, you, when you're coming from that Excel background or thinking about data in front, kind of that static Excel um, kind of context, you, 
typically you'll think that going to add a column is going to be the solution, but I will challenge you that that is not the right way to do it. Within Power BI, almost all the time you want to do your calculations within a measure. The main times you're going to want to do something as a calculated column is if you need to reference any type of categorical value and add that as a filter to your visualizations. So essentially, if, if you're doing anything with numbers or trying to calculate something, it's going to be best to do that in a measure, almost, almost across the board. Whereas if you need a value, like a category added to a table's x-axis for your bar chart, let's say, that would need to be an extra calculated column, right? So the, the way that visualizations work within Power BI is measures are values. They cannot be categories within a visual. So if you do need to put on, again, that category of something, let's say you need to filter by a role or something, right? That, that text value, that text string would need to be as a column on a table and not a measure. So that's kind of the biggest difference between the calculated columns and a measure. Measures, again, are always going to be dynamic. You always want to use a measure whenever you're calculating a value. Whenever you're putting a value on the page, you want to do that through a measure because it's going to use that context concept to calculate its values to show you the correct value that you're expecting, whereas using a calculated column to put something on the page might just be really slow for the model. It might not calculate correctly. It might not use the correct context because it's using a static calculated column in a row context. Um, again, so it can, it can just be challenging to work with a calculated column when you're using a value as opposed to just putting it into a measure. Um, so I do challenge you when you're starting out, calculated columns do seem like the best idea most of the time. But whenever it's a value, measures are typically going to be the way to go. And we'll get into how those measures work in just a second. And calculated columns are typically going to be best for categorical or category kind of grouping within, um, within visuals and putting stuff on the page. Right? All right, so let's get into how we create those measures now. Now that we've got row context down and we've got an understanding of how to type in DAX formulas and what DAX syntax kind of looks like within the formula bar, let's start writing some actual measures now. So let's go ahead and click on the report view page. So on the top left, it's going to be just that report view tab right next to the data view, the top one. And now we are brought to our blank data page. So let's go ahead and start creating those measures. So like we just worked with, we just worked with row context, right? With it, when we were creating a calculated measure on our table, each row has a certain way it's going to be calculated. However, the way DAX measures typically work is it's not typically only row context that's being used. What's normally being applied when measures are being calculated is query context and filter context. Those are being applied on top of the DAX measure to then give you a measure value that you're looking at on the page, right? So the way that query context should be understood is they're essentially the tables, columns, and headers of your table, right? So if you have a table with placement uh, placement numbers, right? That's your that's your column headers, and then you're going to have a value for each placement for the total sales value for that placement. That context, that query context is that header value, right? It's it's the date of, or it's the placement number. And then if you put, let's say the month on top of the placement, then you've added a new header query or a new header value to your table. So you've added new query context to the value that's being calculated. So you're changing the context based on the header or the columns that are on the table for your measure. And then filter context is slicer context. Well, query context is slicer context as well. But what filter context is, is it allows you to change the context of query context or add on top of query context within your measure. So within your measures, you're able to add filter context with filter statements and calculate functions and filters and all of that different stuff that we'll get into. And then query context is the base of how DAX will calculate the measures. So your query context is what's on the page. So you have a measure that's summing up a column on your placement revenue, right? So you have, you have a measure that's a simple sum of your placement revenue. Whatever else you put on the page with that measure is going to be that query context. Right, so whatever that value that you're seeing on that page for that measure, wherever that value is, based on the column headers that you have selected is your query context. 
and then if you build on top of that measure to then filter its value down further based on some start date or something like that being greater than or equal to something, you then are adding filter context on your DAX measure, right? So we'll get into what exactly that means and how we can look at it on the page in just a second. Um, but let's go ahead and create a measure. So we'll start with just the very basic measures. So again, just thinking of Excel formulas, very basic sums and counts to start out with, right? So let's go ahead and just do a sum of sales, sum of revenue. And let's go ahead and just sum up the amount column on our revenue table. So we go ahead and click on that new measure button, name a measure, sum of revenue, and then enter in that function, and then we're summing up a column, right? So we're just taking the sum of our revenue amount. And so whenever we type in that, or whenever we enter new measure, if you go ahead and look at where your new measure is created, it will be highlighted. So I haven't clicked on anything in my data pane, but in your data pane, that new measure will be highlighted. Go ahead and find out where it was placed, right? You can see that if you click on it, it was placed into a specific home table. We don't necessarily want those measures on our tables. Again, go into that organization point. It will quickly clutter up those tables and we won't be able to find maybe the columns that we want to filter by or the columns that we want to add our column context to or a query context to, right? Well, we need to organize these measures into a very easy way so that we can find them as well. Power BI gives you a way to do that too, of course, and let's go ahead and show you how to do that. So before we create another measure, let's go ahead and show you how to organize these. So back on the Home tab, if you go ahead and enter data, what will be brought up after you click that Enter Data button is just a blank table. So you're entering essentially just a blank table. So we're just creating a blank table, and I will typically do this about three or four times within all of my models and name them the same thing every time because I'm always going to organize them the same way. So that first one, Base Measures. So within that base measures group, when we open it up, we can see that we've just got column one in here, right? So there's nothing in this table. There's nothing here. It's just a blank table we just created. But let's go ahead and move the sum of revenue table fun or the sum of revenue measure that we just created into that home table. So if you click on your sum of revenue function or measure, find the home table section up in measure tools on the ribbon, find the home table section. Click on that drop down, and we want to move it into base measures. When we do that, now we can see that it's highlighted up in that base measures group. And so now, what we want to look at is look at to pay attention to this table icon, right? So we can see that there's a table icon currently next to this base measures group. Now that there's a column one within, now that there's a measure within this base measure table, let's go ahead and remove column one. So if you click on those three dots next to column one, click on delete from model. Now we can see that we created a measure group, right? So that group now went from a table icon to a measure icon. And so that's exactly what we want. So now we've got a measure group. So any of our base measures, so any of those functions where we're not filtering anything or calculating on top of anything, we're just creating a very basic measure. So a sum, an average, a count, sum x, right? Any of those very basic ones we can put into this base measure group. So now that we've got the base measure group created, let's go ahead and show you kind of what that query context looks like. So we've got a sum of revenue measure. Let's go ahead and just drag and drop. So the way that you put functions and measures and data onto the page in Power BI, you can either just click this little checkbox or you can just drag and drop. All right, so let's go ahead and drag and drop. And so when you drag and drop, it's just going to create a little visual. On the visualization pane, let's go ahead and push on table. So this is our visualization pane. We want that to be a table. So now that we've got it onto a table, we can see that this is currently our total sum of revenue. So with no filters applied to our data, our entire data set has a total revenue of 370 million. Right, so that's what that number is telling us. With no context, or with no filter context, with no query context, our total data set, unfiltered, has a total of this revenue value. Now if we go back to our model, we can see that that revenue table will be filtered by the date and by the placements. So if we include a placement ID, onto this table, here we are now adding that query context. So we've now added the query context. So we can see that grand total down here, right? So that total stays the same. 
370. That's down there, that total, where there is no placement context, query context for the measure to think about. But then when we have query context, we're adding that the placement values revenue needs to be specified, not just the total. Right? So we're adding the query context based on our model so that the placement ID is the context for our sum of revenue calculation. So our sum of revenue value is totally dependent now on our placement ID. And if we instead include a vacancy index, something that is not related to our revenue, we will see that we do not get a value that makes sense, right? Because we haven't created that context within our, within our data model for it to make sense. We have no relationship to our revenue table, right? So that's something that we'll get into later. Let's just keep placement for now. Where'd it go? Placement ID, there you are. Right, so now we can see again that, that, that they're broken out when we use the model to give us that context that we need. So that's where that model comes into play and why the model is so important to get that calculations and DAX measures working properly to function how we need to. So all right, so now that we've kind of seen how query context works with this basic function, let's go ahead and add on some filter context on the next function. So what we're going to do next is we're going to show you the last kind of concept to uh, the context filters, um, which is the filter context. So we've got the row context, we've got query context, and now next we're going to cover filter context. So the kind of the last pillar to how context should be thought of within Power BI. And then we are pretty much off the races on how to keep building and visualizing um, and building out our model, right? So in the next video, we will be covering filter context. See you guys in the next one. Let's get into filter context now. All right. So what filter context is, is it is just essentially adding on top of our query context. So right here, we've got our filter context being this placement ID, right, to provide us this revenue amount. And let's go ahead and actually do a split amount too. Let's go ahead to do uh, some of split value. Oops. sum of fee split value. So let's also add this one on here. Okay. So this is essentially doing the same thing that revenue one was, right? Just on a different table, right? One is doing the percent of the just fee and then one is doing the value of the revenue, right? So if these are contracts and they just keep coming in, right? These contractors might just keep being on assignment. So they're just still bringing dollars in, right? So just different kind of values there. But all right, so let's go through what that filter context is. So if we want to add filter context onto our current measure that just has query context, what we would need to do is essentially create some measures that build on top of our current measure and then just add on top or change the query context within the DAX formula itself. So let's go ahead and do uh, sum of placement, sum of split values made in December. So let's go ahead and what we're going to do here is we're going to use the calculate function. So within DAX, calculate is almost the, I mean, just the most widely used function across the board. You're going to use it all the time when you start getting in DAX um, and start getting into Power BI reporting. So what we're reporting. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the calculate function here. And this is going to evaluate an expression in a context modified by filters, right? So we're, we're using the context that we've got. So we're using this context. We're going to evaluate this measure in this context but then I'm going to modify that context by adding filters. So let's use calculate. Let's use that sum of split value expression. And then instead of just pressing enter, what we're going to do here is within that calculate function, you can see that there are arguments that allow for filtering, right? So we can add filter arguments within our uh, calculate expression. So what we're going to do is let's just use a sample for, since we said December, let's go ahead, use a date table for month of year, 
is equal to 12. And let's go ahead and put that on the table. Oh, I don't think this is connected to the date. Okay, perfect example, actually. Perfect. Glad we even went through this. Wonderful. Okay. And then let's go here to here. So you can see that what we just did actually doesn't make sense because we don't have any date relationship. You can see that these values are coming out to be the exact same. So clearly something within this filter statement didn't actually do anything for us, right? So this filter equaling, 10, equaling 12 doesn't actually do anything for us. And let's go figure out why. So if we go back to our date model, or if we go back to our data model, and we go to our placement commission tab or table, we can see that this table doesn't have any date relationship to it. So there's no date relationship that's happening within this calculation to take the sum of those splits, right? There's no, there's no date context. The only active date relationship that we have is to our revenue table. So let's do the same calculation, but on our revenue table. And actually, before we do that, let's go ahead and enter in another measure group. Let's call this one calculated measures. Let's go ahead and move this new calculation into that new group. Delete that other column to make it a measure group here. And great. Now we've got our second measure group. So this is the second group that I will always create. I'll always create a base measures. Calculated measures. We'll get to the third one shortly. So all right, so instead of calculating the sum of split values, let's calculate the sum of revenue. So sum of revenue made in December, sum of revenue. So essentially we're doing the same thing, we're just switching out the calculate, right? So we're gonna do the exact same thing, we're just gonna calculate a different expression. So instead of calculating the sum of the split value, we're gonna calculate the revenue this time. Oops. Come on, there we go. So now you can see what is happening a bit differently, right? So you can see that this is now giving us the revenue just for the month. So you can see that it's a lot different than the total value. So it's given us the revenue just that was made within that single month, right? So it's totally different now than this split of values that is not related to a date Whereas you can see that that filter context over on this one did give us a date, right? So again, that, that data model and understanding what our data model is doing totally opens the door to understanding what is happening on here, right? So this, this behavior is totally expected and totally normal, right? So this relationship between a date just doesn't have a date relationship. Let's continue to build on top of that, though, and let's provide it a date relationship, right? Since we've created those inactive relationships to our placement table in our data model with all of those dates, we can activate one of these dates on the placement table, which will then filter down to that placement commission table, right? So we can activate one of those dates to then calculate the placement commission values across a date for those split values, we just need to activate a date as opposed to using a default date since there is no date on that placement commission table. So let's go ahead and show us how to do that. So very simple. Again, we're just building on top of some of those other measures that we've already created. So let's go ahead with sum of split values. And let's name this one by start date. Let's go by start date. By start date. So let's go calculate. Sum of split value. And then in our filter statement, what we're going to do here is instead of actually using a what you would think of a normal filter, we're going to use a filter that will use a different relationship. So within this use relationship function, what this function allows us to do is it allows us to specify an existing relationship to be used in the valuation of a DAX expression. The relationship is defined by naming as arguments the two columns that serve as endpoints. So what we're doing is we're taking that date table as one endpoint, so our date table date in column one, Column one and column two are interchangeable. You don't need the one or many side on both sides. It can be either or. And then the other side is going to be our start date from the placement table. And then now, 
if we want to specify we are in December, we can take, going back to that December value for sum of splits, let's take the sum of split values by start date for December. So now we can see that this value is going to be completely changed and is going to now have date context by that placement start date. Right, so you can now see that those values have drastically shifted and have now shown by the placement start date as opposed um, to having no date relationship. Right, so that's, that's where that filter context really comes into play with adding on top of the query context. So the query context is your base level of filtering within Power BI for DAX. Right? Your query context is going to get you to this value, like this base measures value, right? It's going to get you the sum of a column, an average of a column. It's going to get you the context for whatever you have on the page, whatever you're filtering for. And then the filter context is going to really give you the power to start analyzing what that query context is showing you. Adding that filter context is where you can start moving things around within the data, moving them up to compare growth rates, moving them back, comparing to totals so that you can get percentages and growths and percentage of growths and target percent to values. It, it starts to get super in-depth, right? So you can start doing anything when you start understanding how the query context and filter context works with each other, and then looping in some of that row context as well to keep building on top of it. Sorry, right. so now that we've gone super in-depth over context, let's um, kind of step back just a little bit and review um, a bit of the differences between iterating functions within the DAX engine and aggregating functions within the DAX engine. So far, we've only worked with aggregating functions. We're going to step back again, just step back a bit, um, go back to some of the basics and go through some of the iterating functions and what the difference is and when you might want to use some iterators versus some aggregator functions. All right, see you on the next one. Let's get into the difference between the iterators and the aggregators in the DAX, uh, in the DAX engine and what, what the difference is, how to call them both, and uh, how, how they function differently. So I don't know if you guys have noticed, but for any of those eagle-eyed viewers, you might have noticed that some of those placement IDs are giving um, funky little revenue values on this revenue table versus the commissions table, right? So what might be happening over there? Let's go find out and then work on the solution. So on our revenue table, Let's head over to our revenue table and let's just search for that placement that we were looking at, right? So this placement, we should expect to have a value of 19,000, 19, right? So let's go over to our placement table and let's search for that placement. And so on placement 1069, we can see that the fee is 19,000. So that is the expected fee. So that revenue looks a bit off. Something something could be going off there. What, what, what are we doing there that might be wrong? So right, so let's go over to that revenue table and see what we might be doing. So if we search for that placement, 1069. What was it again? Oh, wrong ID. 1069 placement ID. We can see that we do have that fee amount, um, but then we didn't split it out by its split yet, right? So we're, we're summing up the total amount as opposed to summing up the split fee amount, right? So let's go ahead, instead of creating the calculated column like we did on that commission table, let's go ahead and use this as an example for that iterator versus an aggregator function. So what we can do is we can use an iterator to essentially call that row level context that we use in that calculated column to use row level context within an iterating DAX function instead of an aggregator function to calculate this value within the query and filter context we provide it. Right, so I know those are a lot of a lot of crazy words that we're using in some, some new context words that we're throwing out there. So let's go through exactly what we mean here. So this value right here is currently just taking the sum of the revenue amount, right? That amount is not correct. We just confirmed that that amount is the total placement amount as opposed to the split percent amount for the revenue at the date. So it's not correct. What we need to do is we need to find a way to get the sum of the amount column times the split column. And the way that we can do that with Power BI is using an iterator function. So again, this right now, the sum, the sum function is an aggregator function. We're taking this value, this column, this field on this table, and we're summing up the full value. So we're aggregating the column. We're taking the column, putting it into a full sum. That's what that sum is doing. What we're going to do instead is we're going to use a sum x. The x is what Power BI uses to identify it as an iterator function. We're going to use a sum x 
of revenue calculation to get us the split calculation values just like the calculated column would do. So instead of using a sum, we will use a sum x. So again, this will return the sum of an expression evaluated for each row in a table, right? Okay, so when we enter in sum x and choose this as our function, we're going to get two arguments instead of just one single column argument like the aggregate sum function gives us, right? Within sum x, we need to give it a table and then an expression. So the table that we're giving it is that table to calculate line by line. So within the sum x table, right, it's, it tells us that it's iterating a table to make an expression every single line. What we're trying to do is we're trying to calculate amount times split value for every single line on the revenue table, right? So let's go ahead and choose the revenue table as our table, so fact table revenue. And then within our expression, we'll go ahead and type in amount since that's a, that's a field on the revenue table. And again, we're trying that expression we're trying to do is that amount times the split. And so once we do that, let's go ahead and drop this onto our table now. And now we can see that we've got that. Oh, let's give it some. There we go. Let's give it some. There we go. So now we can see that we've got that same value. So what we did is we took, let's go back to the table here. Let's go to revenue. So we took this 19.6, that full placement fee value for this placement. And within the measure, we have called this table and then the sum x function, the x specifying the iterator again, the iterator function is going line by line, so row by row, and calculating amount times split, amount time split. So when it gets to this placement ID, at this line, it's going amount time split. And then it's going to sum up the next amount time split. And then sum the next amount by split. And then when we have the placement query context, it's going to give us that total amount for the 100% split to give us that 19.6 value. right? So that's how we can get that calculated column. Again, instead trying to refer to, should we use a calculated column versus should we use that measure? That calculated column should be a measure. We don't need that as a calculated column. We can just do that in a measure with a sum x and an iterator function, right? So again, just knowing what Power BI can offer and how to use it totally changes the game on what you can and should be using to kind of create your stuff, right? So let's go ahead and delete this sum of revenue. That is not a correct function. Uh, let's go ahead and we can adjust this one to some x. So we've got a couple of working ones, and let's remove it. OK, wonderful. So now we can see that we've got our tables looking a bit better now, right? They're, the numbers are looking like we would expect them to. Wonderful. All right, so now that we've kind of worked through what the difference is between the aggregator and the iterator functions, we can move on to the next step of DAX calculation. So in the next video, I will see you on that one and we'll get into the next step. Before we keep going into more complex DAX, <coughs> DAX concepts, I wanted to make sure we cover um, one of the kind of best strategies that I've found with building DAX um, and building the reports up as you go along. So I don't know if you've noticed, but as we go along with these calculated measures, what we're doing is we're building on top of those base measures, right? So that that concept is very important. I'm not just doing that because it's simple, right? That's a very important concept within Power BI. As you start developing your measures and getting more and more DAX measures created, you want all of those measures kind of referring to all of the same base measures, right? You want the same base measures across all of your reports so that all of your values are the same. Everybody knows what everything's filtering. Nobody's doing anything funky, right? And then you can just build on top of those. So kind of kind of like what we've been doing, just that concept of building on top of those same measures and just keeping that going and just building them up is very important because you're able to just keep calling those same measures and keep that same previous calculation context unless you want to change it you can also still change it um, or add on to it and then just add new filters to it right so then you can just keep building on top of this if you wanted this to be year 12 and it was some specific client placed right you can then add on by building a new measure 
or you can add on a new measure by then moving it back and referring to the last year. What was last year's December val value compared to this year? Was there a growth over the past 12 months? Was there any decrease? What happened over the past year? year right so that's where you can start really building up and branching off those those measures to start getting you those valuable insights but it all starts with just that base again going back to that organization of your measures having that base filter or having that base measure folder allows you to just know that these are those base measures these are those simple measures that you're not touching it's just the simple raw data an average account a sum sum x very very base formulas that you build on top of to then provide you that analysis right so again it's it's just very very beneficial to get in that very organized mindset within power bi so that you're keeping everything succinct keeping everything neat so that when you keep building up you're not working with this model that's crazy you're not working with these measures that nobody can follow if somebody else joins the company and needs to figure out what's happening right everybody's able to start building on those same that same model, those same measures, quickly pick it up and provide that same value that you've been able to provide building the building the measures and tail reports you have, right? So it's very important, again, just branching out and building off of base measures to build those more complex measures with those calculate statements, with those use relationship statements, with other table statements that we'll get into, right? So just one of those main concepts I wanted to make sure that we cover before we get into anything too difficult or too advanced, just building up off of the base measures branching off of measures, however you want to call it. Um, very important concept to start getting used to. Use a base measure, calculate on top of that measure, use your measure and expressions within other measures to keep building on top. Now that we've covered most of the uh, major DAX concepts, let's go through that last kind of measure group um, that I'll always include. Um, what an example of one of the things that I'll throw in there real quick, how to calculate the and what kind of what this last kind of group means. So this last group that we do, um, or that I'll always do, is the time intelligence group. So let's go ahead and enter data again. Let's go ahead and enter in that time intelligence. Oops, let's go with measure, measures. Time intelligence measures. Make sure I can spell. Cool. All right, so what we want to put into time intelligence measures is what's going to go into here are going to be those like date referencing. So when if we're comparing something to last year, so like what we're going to start with as an example is we're going to start with comparing the revenue from current month to previous month. Um, so that's going to be what we're starting with um, and what that what we can then compare to, right? Because then we can go from current month to previous month to then compare growth rates from month to get gro monthly growth rates, to get daily growth rates, to compare one day in the month to the next day in the month, stuff like that, right? So that's kind of the point of the time intelligence functions. You'll definitely be using measures to compare various values to various dates. Um, so very, very useful, very standard uh, function group that we're going to be playing with. So in here, let's go ahead and actually, before we get a measure on there, let's go ahead and search for in our data pane, search for month and year. Let's go ahead and drag and drop that onto the page. And let's go ahead and also put on the sum of some X of revenue. So let's go ahead and put those two guys onto the page. And so once we do that, we can see that our month and year column is not totally sorted correctly, right? So we can see that it doesn't come sorted. Let's, so let's go through how we can sort that real quick. So before we get into sorting it, on our date table, what we first want to do before we sort is click on that date table, go to those three dots, and we want to mark the date table as a date table. So when you click on those three dots, you can have that mark as date table. Let's go ahead and click that. And on that next option, just go ahead and push on that date. So on that drop down, click on that date column. All right, wonderful. So now we've got our date table set as our date table. That just allows our time intelligence functions to calculate properly and know what date table is our date table. Next, what we need to do is then just sort that field. So on our date table, let's go over to our data view page and let's go down to that month and year column. Let's search for that column. And within this column, we need to sort this column by a specific field. So within this column, when you click on it, what you're going to want to go to then is the column tools field or columns tools ribbon. And then 
in that we're going to have this sort by column field. So when we click on the field, so if you click on any various field, that's going to be the field you're going to sort by, right? So make sure you have month and year selected. Click on that sort by. And then the way that we sort this table is by the month and year values. So go ahead and do month and year. And now when we hop back to our report view, we can see that we've got our dates in the perfect fashion that we want, right? We've got them in January, February, March, April, all in chronological order going back to the beginning of our data up until the end of our data, right? So that's exactly what we want. So quick and easy way to sort that, sort that data, okay? So now what we want to do is we want to essentially compare this month to last month, right? So, so we want to get this $50,000. Let's move, let's remove decimals here to make this cleaner. We want to essentially be moving these values up one month so that we can compare February context to the January value. So again, thinking in Power BI context, we want to make sure that we can get a value into its same context so that we can compare it against each other. So in order to compare February to January, we need the January value to be in February context, right? That's that's kind of what these time intelligence things do is we're able to move those values around to get the context to match the value that we're trying to compare to, right? So within this context, how do we get this value to show in this context? So what we can do is we can use a time intelligence function. So let's go ahead and do a sum x of revenue. Well, let's just go last month. Instead of sum x, let's just go sum of revenue since we're just on the sums now. So sum x of revenue last month, and then let's go ahead and we will use a calculate statement. So we will again use calculate and build on top of that sum x of revenue. And once in our filter statement, so once we calculate that expression, our sum x of revenue, what we're going to filter for is we're going to filter with a date add expression. So the date add expression, if you read what it does, it moves the given set of dates by a specified interval. So let's go ahead and use date add, and we are going to use the date table dates. So let's go ahead and select the date table date. The number of intervals, we will move back one month. Well, let's go ahead and close that out and then throw this onto, oh, let's delete this column one, and let's throw this onto our page. So what we have done is within this measure, we have moved this sum x. So again, let's just focus on February, right? So we've moved this value back one. So we're looking, we're, we're in February, we're going back one month, and then we're moving its value up, right? So, so the date add, we're adding the negative one value to this context. So we're taking last month's value and bring it up to this month. If we did plus one, we would look forward a month. So we would get the 200 or the 400, sorry, we would look forward a month as opposed to back a month, right? So if we're looking to get the last month values, we need to use a negative value so that we bring the last month value up one, right? So that, that's what that negative one is doing. So we're on our date table. Here's that date table, our month and years still from our date table, right? So everything is on a date table. We're taking that value, sum of revenue, from one month back and moving it into that context, right? So that's that's how that query context and how everything we've just previously learned kind of starts stacking up onto each other, right? So when we start getting into here, everything kind of starts piling into, oh, okay, that's, that's how all of this stuff starts interacting with each other. We've got the query context, we've got the filter context with the date add, we've got the measure building on top of each other with the revenue, we've got the iteration functions with the sum x, and then we're building on top of it with the last month sum x, and then we're date adding with the filter context, and then we're adding the month and year query context to get the value that we're looking for, right? So there's a whole bunch of different things that we're doing now with just this very basic calculation that we understand that what Power BI is happening, right? We, we can understand what's going on in the background to get these values onto our tables based on the values that we've selected.
Right, so now we're really starting to understand what's happening in Power BI, how we can create those measures, how we can use that query context and filter context to our advantage, and then what what functions we need to write. Right, kind of the the biggest hurdle and kind of learning curve is going to be knowing what functions are available and when to use what function. But definitely just keep practicing at it, and you'll you'll definitely get a feel for what to use and when to use it. Um, so all right, so now that we've kind of we've pretty much covered all of the groundwork. Right, that's that's pretty much all of the ground work that we can cover up until the report building and designing right so now we're pretty much to the point we know the groundwork we know how to write DAX now let's start thinking about how to design a report how to visualize this data what we need to do to create that DAX to make our measures and filters work with the model we've created to get those appealing visuals right so the next step before we get into report design the next step that we're going to do is we're going to start getting back into the modeling so now that we understand dax formulas and how the context works we're going to start getting back into the model to start building up our model using those different lookup tables so currently we've only had our placement table right that's the only time that's the only value that we can put onto here that's going to give us some actual value that will be correct right this is the only ID that we can include onto here that will give us some actual values because it's the only thing that's related in our model. So what we're going to do is now that we understand how these IDs and context relate to each other, we're going to go back into the model a bit and with these DAX measures, we're going to start walking through how to build up the model using all of those other different lookups that can still then reference these same values that we've now created with DAX, right? So let's just use the sum of revenue and uh, we will go through how to build the rest of the model out so that all of the other lookup tables are connected and the rest of the model is ready to go. And uh, once we're done with that, we can start designing the report out and showing you how to get the report stuff um, all designed out, right? So, all right, so on to the model next to build it out. See you guys in the next one. Okay, getting back into data modeling. <clears throat> so let's switch over to our data model tab. So on the left side, go to that model view. And let's go ahead and drag in a bunch of our other tables over here. So on the main model, so here we've got kind of the main model with all of those tables. If you go up to the right, all the way to the right, there are going to be those three new tables that we just created, right? So those table, those measure tables, they still count as a table technically, so they're still going to show up on our model view. So let's go ahead and essentially just kind of get these out of the way. So if we bring these over all the way, the way that I, again, the way that I handle all of these measure tables, same way with all of my models, I'll just bring them over all the way over to the left, right underneath the date table pretty much, um, just totally out of the way, right? I'll just stack, I'll just stack them up over here. Any, any of those measure groups that I keep creating, I'll just collapse them all and just throw them right over there, right? So they're just out of the way. And then, all right, so let's go ahead and bring the rest of the model into focus here. Zoom out just a bit and bring these guys over. All right, so what other tables do we have in the model that have not been connected to stuff? What else should we get connected up here? So again, let's go back to think about what kind of firm or company we're working with and what data we're, we're working with and playing with here. So we're at a recruiting firm. So we've got placement data and we know that our placements are tied to our revenue and our placement commissions. Right. And then we know that recruitment activity makes up placements, but they're related to vacancy and candidates. But then on our tables, we also have this new employee ID, right? We've also got this employee ID across of all of these different tables. So let's go ahead and grab that employee ID from our lookup table. Let's go have the ID from employee. Let's go ahead and drag and drop that onto each of those fact table IDs. And so after we do this, this is just adding that employee relationship onto each of our fact tables now. So if we hop back over to that data view, so let's remove this month and year, and let's go ahead and add employee context now. So now if we add employee context, we'll now be able to get a total sum based on each employee for the total revenue value. Whereas if we did not have this if we didn't have that employee to revenue relationship, we would get nothing, right? We would have no way of knowing what revenue value is tied to what individual. So when we have the context by individual name and revenue value, we just get the total because there's no actual context that we can have, that we can use because there's no relationship between the two. 
but then when we put that back on, it just, boom, voila, appears like magic, right? So now everything's matched up, it's all nice and neat, and now we've got that employee relationship onto our three fact tables. So it's just that easy, right? So that employee one, boom, out of the way. Doesn't need to be connected to anything else right now. Then let's look at our other table. So that employee one is kind of separate from the recruitment stuff, right? Doesn't really, in, not really involved in placements versus candidates and job orders and clients, right? Just kind of a separate thing that that's just the internal employees, right? So something that needs to be connected. So we got that one all solved for. So now what we want to do is now we can look back at the recruitment world. So we got, we've got those placements and vacancies. Within a vacancy or within a placement, placements are tied to a job order or a vacancy. So each vacancy will, or each placement will have a vacancy. A placement can't exist without a vacancy, right? So these two things are connected. And so even though the, these vacancies and all of these fact tables are also connected, I want to be able to make sure that if we filter up all the way to the client level, I want to be able to count the number of vacancies that go to the client, not just the number of placements made for that client, right? So we we want to know all the we want to know the different levels. So I want to know the number of placements that have been made on that vacancy that were for that specific client contact, right? I don't just want to know the dollars that were tied to that one placement or that one client contact, right? I want to know all of the model that, all of the model's data that it comes with. I want to make sure that I build it robustly so that all of the relationships that I use will be able to build and give me those numbers that anything could possibly happen, right? If you want any number, the model will be able to give it to you with the model setup that we have used. So again, it's just totally important on being able to understand how the data works with each other and knowing, knowing how to build those relationships with, with the data that you're working with. So looking at that vacancy table, let's grab that vacancy ID. And on our placement table, we've got a vacancy ID on our placement table. Perfect. So let's grab that vacancy ID and move it onto our vacancy ID of our placement table. Wonderful. So now we've got our vacancy now linked to our placement. So again, let's go ahead and show you guys how that now looks. Let's go ahead and remove employee name. Let's throw a vacancy ID on there. So now vacancy ID, again, you can see that it now splits out nice and neatly based on the vacancy ID as opposed to the name. And so on top of this, now let's do one additional thing. Let's go ahead and add placement ID as an additional query context onto this table. So now you can see within this table, we have one vacancy, this one vacancy, vacancy 148, that led to two placements that resulted in these dollar values, right? So again, those relationships that we're creating, we're starting to create that total relationship database that we want within Power BI, right? We're starting to really develop those relationships that Power BI excels at reporting on. And so again, let's just go ahead and delete this again, just to show you what it looks like here. So again, if you delete that vacancy to placement, these guys have no way to place each other, right? So this vacancy ID is now broken. This vacancy ID is just going to be 100 all the way across the board, right? You can still see that vacancy ID is just 100 because it doesn't know how to relate to the placements. It doesn't know what placement is related to vacancies because we don't have that relationship, right? So let's go ahead and just throw that back on. And let's do the same thing with the candidate. So on the candidate side, very similar to vacancies, we've got candidates that go to placements, right? So candidates don't go to a vacancy. They get submitted to a vacancy through the recruitment activity, and we've already got those two relationships on there, right? So those are already linked through that fact table that we already can tell what candidate is being submitted to what vacancy through the recruitment fact table. And so let's actually, before we do this, let's go and show you what that means. So let's go ahead and back over here. Let's do a, let's do the vacancy. I need to search. Let's go with vacancy ID and let's do a count of recruitment activity. And so if we drop this on to the table with vacancy ID, so we've got vacancy ID on here with recruitment activity. If we then drop on the candidate ID, let's drop in the name, we then drop in the candidate name, now we can see what candidate activity was made against the placement. Because then we can also drop in the 
status activity type for what happened. Right. So again, we're just building up that model for what's being related so we can see what's so we can see what's happening across each of the submissions and across each of our different tables. And then this is how we can start understanding what our model is doing. So when we get to start building out that model or start building out our report, we can easily know what's happening. So again, so now that we've got those vacancy candidate to recruitment activity relationships, if I throw on a measure with recruitment activity, so this recruitment activity measure is just a count of the rows on that recruitment activity table if I include this measure with that query context coming from the vacancy table and the candidate table as well as the recruitment activity table I'm able to see a value that we're expecting to see right so this individual Megan Lyons was submitted to this vacancy twice or had an offer extended offered to them two times right and then if we throw on the date we can then see the dates that they were offered, right? So again, we're just building out the relationships within that model so that we can deeper understand all of the data that's in it. And it's as easy as just drag and dropping, right? It's just as easy as creating those lines, but then you can see over on this page with all the lines, it's difficult to understand. You can get lost quickly if you don't understand what these lines are doing, right? So it's just, you gotta make sure you do it very succinctly, very, very, um, organized make sure that you build it up in a very succinct organized way so that you know exactly what you're building on and you don't get lost in your model because once you get lost in the model it's very hard to understand what's happening with your numbers why your numbers might be saying something whereas if the model is clean and neat and you can understand it you can easily call out errors very very quickly you know where they are because they're screaming at you Sorry. So let's get back to the model and finish building it out. So on that candidate table again, right? So we've got that candidate activity, but we don't have candidates related to revenue. So let's go back and remove all of this and go back to include revenue now. So on candidates, again, this is the candidate name here. So we do not have this related to revenue like we do with the vacancies. So let's go ahead and connect our candidate ID over to our placement table, just like we did our vacancies. So on candidate, grab that candidate table, candidate ID, drag and drop onto placement table, candidate ID. And just add in another arrow in there. Nice and easy. So all right, great. Now let's go back to the report page and we can see that each of those candidates now have their value associated to them by the correct revenue value. Right, so quick and easy drag and drop just like that. And so let's go through the last couple of tables here to get these guys related up. So all the way at the top, we've got those clients and client contacts. So again, let's just go through that concept of the waterfall again, right? So we've got up top, we've got those vacancies and those candidates. Those two tables are gonna filter our placement. So we've got this relationship and we've got this relationship, right? These two relationships filter our placement table. Our placement table then filters our two revenue tables, our placement commission and our placement revenue tables. Because our placement table filters these, that means that these two tables also filter these. So again, that waterfall going top to bottom, looking at these from the top, those top filter, the top lookup tables are gonna filter those ones underneath it, right? And so again, now that we're up all the way at the top, essentially what we're doing is just refiltering all of these other things by the things up top, right? So the vacancies are owned by a client contact. So a vacancy, we, a, let's say again, we're the recruitment firm, a client contact will come to us and offer, hey, we have this opening or opportunity at our company, at the client, are you able to take this vacancy and work it? You say yes or no. If you say yes, it becomes a vacancy within your system, right? And so that client contact was the one who gave you that vacancy opportunity. So the client contact is related to every vacancy. So that is the vacancy uh, relationship we can use and we can add on. So on the lookup client contact table, take that ID and drag and drop it onto the client contact field on the vacancy. And let's go ahead and close up that client contact. And we can close up vacancy as well. So, all right, so now again, you can see that we're going, we're just continuing that waterfall, right? So these client contacts, let's go back to that report page now. So these client contacts will now filter by dollars. So we will have the dollars by client contact and then we can also have the vacancy underneath the client contact, again, since they're related, 
So this one client contact has had a total of three vacancies that they have been submitted. And of those three vacancies, there have been these three dollar values tied to those vacancies. And then within those vacancies, these were the placements. And these were the candidates. Right. And so now we can see that all of our data is now started to be related to each other. Right. So we went from just having our placements being related to our dollars to now we have everything's related to everything. The only thing we're missing is if we throw in a client, it's going to break. Right. So the last thing that we're trying to fix here is well, what about our clients? If we can fix our client, then we have a full entire model that we're able to filter for all of our dollars across our entire database, no matter what type of filtering we're looking for. Right. The model will just filter its entire way through based off of the values we've got. So let's go ahead and just add in that last client relationship. So we're all the way at the top now. Right. So we're all the way up at client contact. Every client contact obviously has a client that they're tied to. So again, let's just tie up those two things so that look up client ID will go to the client contact client and there is that relationship one to many let's go ahead and minimize client contact and minimize lookup client and now if we go back to our report view we can see that there we go now we've got the client we've got the vacancy we've got the next one what we've got the sorry we've got the client we've got the contact we've got the vacancy we've got the ID we've got the candidate and we've got the dollars they brought in right so now we've built up the full model we are ready to start reporting on our model now and start building out some analysis into who are the good clients who are our top performing contacts who are the best vacancies workers who are the best employees that are bringing in the most efficient dollars based off the least activity that they're putting into but then delivering the most dollars right now we can start getting into analyzing the data We've set all the groundwork. We know what the model looks like. We're confident in how the model filters. Now we can build on our DAX measures that we've already started, build on top of those, get all of those complex filter queries going on top of our context, on top of our query context, and then we can really start showing some valuable insights with those measures on reports. Um, so that, that's that. So we are all done with the model. We are all done with the groundwork for DAX. So what we're going to be doing next is on the next section is we are really going to be getting into the guts of building out a report. So how do we go about building out the report? We've got the foundation set. We know what to do, how to build out the report. We know what our measures need to be or not what our measures need to be just yet, but we know what we want our report to look like based on the data that we have. How do we create those measures to get there? And then how do we visualize that report? Right, so that's what we're going to be doing next is we're going to be going through all of those steps. We're going to probably create two or three different pages, go through how to make it look great, best practices for report viewers, and uh, how to make it look pretty and nice with this model that we've created. And uh, we, we will go from there. So I'll see you guys in the next one. Now that we've got everything set within our model, we are ready to get into report design, how to start getting stuff on the page, what we want it to look like, and kind of best practices of how we can make the report viewer get the most out of what they're looking at, right? So for report design, it's very important as you go into designing reports, you want to make sure that you're designing your report for the viewer, right? You don't want to design the report for yourself. It can be fun to design your own report, so I definitely feel free to do that on your own personal time, right? But while, when you're designing at your job or professionally, you want to just make sure to keep in mind for who you're designing the report for, right? So if it's a sales audience, you're going to have to make it very visual and very easy to call out the high value items that they're going to be looking for. If it's a FP&A, financial planning and analysis team, you can go really in depth. You can throw some box plots on there, right? You can throw some more in depth things on there since they have a different an audience and skill set that can understand that data in that type of way versus a sales audience, right? So it's just very important when you start getting into developing these reports, make sure you're very conscious of who you're developing them for and developing the report for that audience. So as we go through, I'll kind of explain a bit more as to what I mean by that um, and some best practices and how you can make sure to do that. Um, but so before we start throwing stuff on the page, let's get into what those visualizations that Power BI offers. So what are all those default visualizations that we can work with um, and it, to give the audience that correct insights that they're looking for right so over here 
on the far right side is the visualization pane. So in the visualization pane, this is where all of your visuals that Power BI offers are going to be. Right? So within the visualization pane, if you just click on one of these items, it will just pop up onto the page. Right? So when it pops up onto the page, you then have your visualization options of what you can put into this visual. Right, so with this first visual, the stacked bar chart, we've got a y-axis, x-axis, a legend, small multiples, and tooltips, right? So let's just go through real quick what each of these things kind of mean with some of the things we've already gotten done, right? And so what we'll notice here as we build out too, we're going to be very basic with our DAX as we build this out, just to show you guys that you don't need any advanced super in-depth DAX knowledge or skills to be able to build a super insightful report. Of course, we'll have a course on getting really in-depth with DAX, how to do super in-depth DAX stuff. But for this course, we'll just keep it simple. Um, again, a very good best practice. Keep it simple as you design and as you build measures. Um, but for this, we'll just keep it very simple with our DAX so you guys can see the power of DAX and visualizations um, with how, how much power they can give you. So, all right, so with our visual selected, let's go ahead and just click on that plus button or click on that checkbox next to, a, um, next to one of your measures. So when we do that, we can see that the visual gets a value, right? And it goes into the x-axis. If we switch the visual, you can see that it just goes into the y-axis, right? So it depends on what visual for the value or for the field that you drop your values into, right? Different visual, different field name, so on and so forth. So for this bar chart, stack bar chart, it goes into the x-axis for your values. For a stack column chart, your values go into the y-axis. It's just all those small things you'll get very familiar with as you start building um, building on your own reports and getting used to Power BI. You'll, you'll start knowing where things go and where to start dropping some things. But so, all right, so with a value on this visual, let's go ahead and drop in client name. So now what we have is very quickly, with a simple measure, um, just one single measure, we can see our clients and their revenue, right, just by one one simple visual, we've got all of that data. And then if we want to keep going with it, let's throw in employment type into the legend. So now what we've got is we've got all of the dollars for each of the clients broken out by employment type, right? So on our vacancy table, we have a certain field on our vacancy table called employment type, and that's got all of these different values in it that are now broken out on our single visual. So again, we've only done one measure, right? We've only put one measure onto this visual and we can already see kind of where these heavy breakouts are, um, who, who these heavy contract dollars, contract perm dollars are coming from, right? Who, who are all these heavy hitters and do we need to expand that business with these guys? Why don't we have that business with these guys, right? If it's our business biggest contract with a bunch of other clients, let's start doing some of that business with some of these other clients. Right, so even just with a single measure and a single visual, you can already start getting into some of those insights, right? Once we get some values on there, again, just getting into kind of some more steps into what we can do with some of these very base visuals, um, we can add some data labels. So we can show with those values per each of those groups. And we can also show a total label if we want. And we can, of course, customize all of these items. Let's go ahead and display units. Let's go to thousands. So you can see now what happened. Let's go back. So on these values, so what we're applying here is the data labels, right? So we're editing our data labels on our visualization that we've selected right now. So right now you can see that it's got a display unit set to auto. So that display unit, what that is, is that it's the little M, right? So it's it's displaying a unit in millions just because that's it's set to auto, right? Our values are high enough for whatever engine is calculating this display to assume that we want to display units as millions. Let's say we don't want to do that. We want to display it as none. We don't want any rounding to be done. Now we can see that the values are just exactly as they are, right? And then same thing with those totals. Now we can see all of those values summed up. Ross Inc. has 394, right? So we can start to see again, which is this one visual. We're starting to get into just some settings. Now we can get really in depth with it. If you want to clean it up, you can change, you can even turn the data labels off, right? And just show the total. Saying just show the total value. All right, so that's just a very, very beginning intro into some visualizations. So that's what we can do. In the next video, I'm kind of going to briefly cover all of these other visuals, um, not as in-depth as this one, but just going to briefly go over them, what we can do, when you might be able to use them, um, and then we'll continue on from there.
All right. So let's just quickly go through all of these visuals, um, the default visuals on the visualization pane. We won't have um, all of the measures yet for all of these um, to work in some ways that we might want to, but I'll just go over um, some of the most high value or most used visuals um, that I've seen across my Power BI experience um, that you'll likely want to be using in, um, in your development. So this first one that we messed around with was the stacked bar chart, right? So you can see what it does. It just stacks up those values in the legend. If we go over to the stacked column chart, all that does is just flip the axes, right? So you could you saw that that x axis just got flipped to the y axis for the value, right? So that's all that's different. It just flips the axis so that you can show the value in a different in a different context in a different visual looking way. Um, so it's helpful, but it's still kind of the exact same thing, right? clustered bar chart. So what the clustered bar chart does is instead of just stacking our values, we can see that they have now just been split out into columns of their own, right? So instead of the columns being stacked within a single value and a total all the way at the end, each of our items in our legend are now split out into columns of their own. So if we kind of expand that a bit more. We can kind of see each of these things. If you hover over them, you can see they've got their own employment type um, with their own values to it, right? And then same kind of thing with that next visual with the clustered column chart. Again, same kind of concept with those first two. It just flip, flips the axes, same kind of concept. It's the exact same values, just on a different axis. 100% stacked bar chart um, goes up to 100%. So what this does is it just essentially gives you kind of a proportional value across all of your values. So it, it smooths out all of your values and just gives you kind of a distribution of what your placements are coming in as or what your dollars are coming in as, right? So across the board, again, we're looking like most of these guys are big chunks of orange, but then some down here are kind of heavier in the blues as well. So maybe there's higher percentage, but maybe not as high dollars since they're dropping down. So definitely some value in the 100% stack chart. Same thing here, just flips the axes between the two, bar to a column. Getting into the line chart. Go ahead and remove that. Um, so what the line chart does is very similar to kind of just these other ones, just a very basic visualization, just going to show kind of that just literally a line. So just a line visual for um, for some growth rates. You can do some areas underneath it. Um, so very basic visual just by a category, by another axis. You do have the ability to have multiple lines on here, so you can't have two axes if your values are completely different. Uh, let's throw in... Another value, so there you go, you can see that we've got count of activities being at 60 with the sum of revenues being at 200,000, right? So you can quickly throw on those multiple values. And then again, if we didn't have it, you could see it kind of messes it up, right? And then getting into the area chart, very similar to the line, you can just have that area underneath it. Um, and then over on the stacked area chart, Again, very, very similar kind of concept, um, just shows the um, summary of the values with the line chart as well. Um, so you can kind of quickly see just the area of the summaries or of the revenue and then just your counts if you want to see or some other value if you want to throw that on there. Uh, um, and the next one getting into the line and stacked column chart. So on this one, we have the ability to very similar to the line chart, um, have those two axes. Instead, this is now just using the bar chart visual where you can now have those multiple axes. So we've got our columns or our bars on a single axis and then our another value on the line. So these ones are typically really good for some month and year kind of values and then some growth rates. Um, so you can do some monthly growth rates, trend some things out over time. Um, these are definitely a very big used one that I see all the time. Um, line and clustered column chart. Let's throw the employment type back in here. So here you can see very, very similar again to these other ones right above it. It just allows you to give you that second line um, for the, or the second axis for the line value. Going from the stacked over to the clustered. Ribbon chart, I've never used the ribbon chart. I've seen some visuals um, use it. It, it. I'm sure it can look pretty in some circumstances in some ways. I've just never really found value in it um, across my experience, but I'm, I'm sure it does have some good value in it. Um, just haven't used it too much, so good luck trying it if you do use it. 
Um, waterfall chart, again, I haven't used it too much, but it's more of a financial visual um, for kind of the financials side of things. I haven't used it too, too much because um, mostly the finance teams kind of like to keep in their own system. So again, if you find value in it and you know how to use it, great. Um, I, don't, I don't use it too much, so I'm not gonna cover it here. Funnel, um, this can be great for some literal funnel activity. Um, right, so whenever you want to get some, where are you here? There we go. So whenever you want to kind of show some progress or activity funnel type stuff, so whenever there's a high value in the activity, when a client comes in, right? So a client starts coming in, you have a bunch of clients come in, and then you have less people talk to each client. You can kind of show those funnel metrics. Um, you can keep dropping different values on here if you want to just instead of had a category. Um, so you can either have a category to break all of your values out individually, or you can just kind of throw on different values on here to also just kind of get you a big custom funnel yourself, right? So you can either split it out with some of your model. Um, based on your model, you can split it out, or you can go with um, throwing in values and having the category kind of be determined by the values. Very helpful one. Scatter plot, scatter chart. Super useful, um, again, thinking of the audience you're l working with. Scatter plots are very good for kind of the people that know data. Um, for people who might not be as familiar with it, scatter plots can kind of sometimes be overwhelming because <coughs> it's more of kind of a, a graph visual, right, as opposed to kind of like a pretty color kind of visual. Um, so just make sure, again, you're, you're using the scatter, scatter plots for the right audience. They do have great value. They can do a lot of things with the scatter plots, though, so definitely use it and get into it. Um, but again, just consider your audience whenever you're using it. You've got the pie charts and the donut charts. Very basic, very standard visuals. Tree map, very similar to the pie and the donut. Again, kind of based on your design, um, your report design, kind of company culture, and however people like to see or visualize data, you can kind of pick from these three. Um, very, very kind of similar visualization kind of styles. Uh, we've got some map. Um, the maps can be turned off and on for your org tenant. Um, let's go over to this one. All of them off. Okay, all of them are off. Um, so the maps can be very helpful, but again, they can be pretty restrictive on how to use them. For most of the maps, you need lat and long, um, and it's just it's very beneficial to have lat and longitude too as you plot the maps. Um, very very needed for some of these Power BI maps. We'll go through these sometimes later um, when I I'll, I'll fix this for next video. Uh, but very very helpful. You just need the lat and long values to get them to display. Gauge, gauges can be very helpful for like progress to goal stuff or some calculating something out of 100%, like how close you're getting to 100%, goals at 95, we want max to be 100, and teams at 87, right? So you can kind of track some progress to goal stuff. Gauge can be very helpful. Cards, super helpful. Cards are one of the most used visuals. Multi-card, again, also very, very helpful. Um, we got some KPI values. This is kind of a way to in a card visual, show some growth rates if people are moving kind of up and down in some growth rate over time. Slicers, just a exactly what it is. This is going to be slicing your data. So if you throw in a oh, throw in an activity type and let's go count of activities, then you can kind of see that we will slice the data. So that is what a slicer is, right? It's slicing our data. And the table, so a table, just exactly what it is, just the table. <clears throat> and your slicer, again, can interact with that table and all of your other visuals. So your, your slicers interact with everything, right? And so everything will filter everything else on your visuals um, by the slicers, right? So very, very nifty for slicers. Um, we've got the matrix. So matrix and tables are very, very good. So right, you, you should you should try to have when you're designing a report, you should try to have at least kind of most of your report be visual and have your value be provided in those visuals. But you also need some data, right? People love to export data, so you it's very beneficial to have some type of table or some type of matrix across any of your report pages so that people can get really get into the data if they want to, so that they can slice and dice it or move it around kind of how they need if they feel like they need to, right? So tables, very helpful. Matrices, very helpful within Power BI visuals. Uh, let's show kind of what we can do here with this guy. 
So with the matrix, what it will do is you will have these little plus and minus buttons, right? And then depending on how your model is set up, if you push that plus button, either everything will explode based on the measure you have and your model will need to be adjusted because you haven't done that right, or you'll have a model that whatever measure you've put on context does make sense and the DAX calculations work with your model and the context is able to calculate an accurate value for the context that's provided, right? So like the context here for this seven is CV submit activity type for Adams LLC company name, right? So the model is able to recognize that there are seven values for that specific context within the time frame we've selected because of our model setup, right? So this is kind of how all of the model can come into play when we start using those matrices. We can really start to see where those models kind of hierarchy and relationships come into play. And then if we move it to a table, instead of having those plus buttons so that everything's kind of summarized at that top level, and then we can dig into it, it's just all output on the single table, right? You've just got all the visuals, all the data, every line by line is shown. Right? And then with the matrix, you're just able to visualize it with the plus buttons. You can expand everything. Right? So the matrix, in my mind, I think is a lot more beneficial. You can make it a lot more condensed and a lot more user friendly. I use it a lot more than I use tables, literally just for that option to summarize the data. Going on, we've got some R visuals and Python. So what these do is these allow you to create custom R scripts or Python scripts and call them against your model um, to do some custom Python or R script visualization. Um, you can definitely use these things. They can be kind of restrictive though, especially kind of with Power BI's interactivity. When you do use an R or Python visual, it is not interactive, right? It's just gonna be some static kind of data when the script loaded. It doesn't interact with the other data on your report page. So it's, they're not great, but they can be used. We got key influencers. This can be a great tool. It's kind of built off of a AI engine within uh, Microsoft. You do have to have a great model. Everything has to be kind of structured and named in a way that an AI can read and kind of help generate some analysis on. Um, let's see if it can go ahead and do that. So let's go and say analyze. Let's analyze sum of revenue by client, right? So you can you can put a lot of stuff in here. If you start putting a lot of stuff in the explain by and the expand by, you, you can start getting it to work. Um, but it, it, it can be pretty helpful. It can be pretty cool to kind of give you some ideas, too, on what to analyze or dig deeper into your data, too. It can, when it starts spitting out some suggestions, it can say key influencer for your dollars for clients are more vacancies come in or something like that. And then you can start digging into if that might actually be true. That could be a good analysis page, things like that, right? Decomposition tree is another wonderful one. What the decomposition tree does is you are able to start with the value. So you start with your analyzed value. Let's say, let's go back to the sum. So let's say you start with the uh, sum of revenue. And then let's throw a bunch of things in here. One second, let's throw vacancy. type let's go client name let's go candidate name and let's go placement ID so with a couple of fields in this composition tree, what you're able to do on this composition tree is the report user is actually able to select what's going to come next, right? So kind of very similar to a matrix where it like group stuff up at the top level and then it will expand out. The only difference is that the user is able to distinguish what comes next, right? So let, let's change these names up here and make sure we're clear. Candidate name. So, so, right, so instead of you determining as a report developer the structure of what's going to be summarized, what, what the report viewer is able to do is they're able to determine it with the composition tree. The biggest downside with the composition tree is it takes up a lot of space and it's kind of hard to navigate. Um, so that's kind of the biggest downside with the composition tree, but again, very, very powerful. Uh, Q&A, 
this is something that can also be set up. Um, it is kind of, it can be helpful, but it's, it's a big setup, so we're not gonna cover it here. Um, same with smart narrative, don't need to go into there. Uh, metrics card, this is something to do with the Power BI service. You can set up metrics and tracking um, within the Power BI service. You can set up goals and stuff like that and kind of include those in your reports. We won't go over that here, but it is an option. The next one is paginated reports. Paginated reports are um, another option within Power BI. It allows you to kind of kind of think of um, um, an invoice, right? It allows you to build essentially like one type of page that you can recycle a bunch of different data through. Um, we'll cover paginated reports in a different course, but it's a total course on its own. New card visual. This is just a brand new card visual that's been released as of August 2023. Um, so it's, it, we'll go over this one in detail. These are kind of better than the card and the multi-card. So the card new is kind of the new visual that I've been using for all of my card values. Um, here's another map visual. Again, just very helpful kind of map visual if you want to start using these. Very, very helpful. Um, and then we've got the remaining two default ones are Power Apps and Power Automate. Again, kind of similar to those R scripts with these two apps, app visuals allow you to do. Or they allow you to embed or call a Power App or a Power Automate script within a Power BI report. So if you want a user to, whenever they s submit something and change some metric or filter something within a Power BI report, they can click something and send a new row to a new value somewhere within some Power Automate script that will then update a Power App, right? So you can start connecting all of these different things together as you start building these things out. But again, for our purposes, definitely not needed for this course. Um, but those are all of the Power BI default visuals. Um, so the main ones we're going to focus on are just these top um, top two rows, the slicers, some tables, and the decomposition tree. Um, and we will start getting into these way more in depth in the next one. And we will go through best practices, getting all of the stuff on the page, and we will finally be designing out a report page. So all right, see you guys in the next one. All right, now that we know all of the visuals that we have the options to choose from, let's start going through how to get those visuals on the page. All right, so let's start back from fresh now, and let's go ahead and we are just going to start out with the sum of revenue, right? So let's just start analyzing our dollars. We, we, we know that we're going to want to analyze our dollars in some shape or form, right? So let's just start here. <clears throat> So we've got this visual. Let's start just throwing some stuff on the page, some of our categories from our other lookup tables to kind of see if what sticks, right? So do we want to show some client data? Do we want to show what do we want to show in this visual here? So first of all, let's flip this over to a column chart or to a uh, clustered bar chart. Um, actually, let's go to a stacked bar chart. And let's go by client, right? So I'm, I want to throw something on by client and show the dollars by client, right? That's a very typical way to see data. Who's who's performing the best? What are our top clients, right? So let's start with, let's start there. That's what I want to start with. So when I get the got on the page again, it's just very simple. Just drag and drop it on the page. Now we've got the first visual we want, but now that we know some of the options that we can do, this visual looks very basic, right? So, so we want to still pretty this visual up. Maybe we don't want the axes names because it's just taken up room on the visual. Maybe we don't want the title. So before we move on to the next visual or before we start throwing other things onto the page, let's make sure that we get this one thing nice and pretty and how we want it. So right, if we want to put a legend on there and we want to break things out into some categories, let's make sure we do that before we move on. Let's make sure we put on our total data and our detail labels, right? So let's start building this visual out how we like to see it um, so that we know as we start developing our other visuals, this is going to be a part of the report as we start building. What do we want to build on top of this? What else do we want to go with this to supplement it, to give it more value? value, how can we increase the visual, how can we increase the user's value in the report, right? All right, so let's throw on some data labels. Actually, before we do that, let's split out the data. So let's throw a legend on here, right? So we've got our client by dollars. Let's go under, we can do something on client contact. No, let's go with vacancy. So on the vacancy, on, 
let's go with vacancy type, contract perm, there we go, so there we go, so vacancy type, now we can just break it out by our two options, right, so there are two employment types on our vacancy table, there's either a contract vacancy or a perm vacancy, so if we just go ahead and drop in that category onto our visual, we can now see that we're getting that visual built up. So let's go back over to that visualization pane and format it. And let's throw on the totals. And let's go into the totals and turn off those display values. And let's turn on detail labels. Do we like detail labels? I think that that's cluttering it up a bit too much. Maybe if we use a bit more room, it might be a bit nice, but I think there are too many numbers on there, right? So again, thinking from a report viewer perspective, it might be helpful for me to see exactly what those values are, but from a report viewer, I think that that's too noisy and would drag too much attention away from the report. So let's not include those. Let's go ahead and remove our legend title. We don't need that. Those are pretty basic. We know what those are. Contractor perm, you don't need to keep that legend up there. So we can take that off and let's adjust the title as well. Let's go revenue by client. Let's put it in the middle. Wonderful. And let's change up our Y axis name, title to client name. And we don't even need the X. We don't need that. Let's turn you off. There we go. And values, let's also turn you off. Uh, let's go 2000s maybe. That looks better. So all right, so there we go. So with all of that work, right? So even even though it's kind of tedious formatting work, right? With changing all of that stuff up, we've, we've made this visual just kind of look a lot more appealing to just, the, just in this format, right? Very quickly, it kind of went from just, okay, here's a thing. I don't know what any of these values are. Now we've kind of got, we've got a breakout. We can quickly, quickly see that Ross is on top of 400K, right? Great, wonderful. Now that we've got our first visual on here, let's go ahead and start throwing on some slicers to start making sure all of our data is interacting with each other. All nice and neatly. So let's go ahead and choose the slicer visual. And let's go ahead and drop in a date. Let's just select a date here. So if we throw in a year from our date table, let's go to format. I don't usually like the between. Let's choose a drop down. This a bit smaller here. All right, now let's go ahead and select a date. So awesome. So we can see that all of our data is changing when we select a date, right? So we have got our model built. We've got our slicer working. Our model is working properly and our stuff is filtering. We are looking good to go. So now we've got this first visual down. Let's go ahead and start working on another visual. So on these other visuals, we are gonna start using um, some new measures. So before we get into those, we will go through how to create those measures and what measures we're gonna be using. And I'll see you guys in the next one to get some more visuals on the page. The next visual we are going to work on throwing on here is a visual with some type of time context, right? So how are our dollars coming in? At what date? Is there a specific trend? Maybe we've got some seasonality to our data. Um, a, t a time visual is almost needed on pretty much every type of report, right? At least date filtering. We've already got a date slicer up there, right? So dates and time visuals are very, very important for Power BI. So let's go ahead and dive into that for our next one. So with Power BI, or with uh, with time visuals, what we're going to want to use is either um, a column or a stacked or a clustered column chart, right? Because we're going to want to put a time series on our axes to display our values in kind of a trended way. So let's go ahead and throw in, let's just first choose a stacked column chart. And then on the x-axis, we can throw in our month and year. And for our value, let's throw in revenue. So, all right, so now that we've got the values on the page, we can see that this is what I mean by that trend, right? So we can see that our date values are trending by time, by a time value that you give it. So if you wanna give it just the date value you can do that as well and just kind of see how it how it trends daily, right? So you can still see those daily values. I just kind of prefer in more of a summarized value or in a summarized view. And then if you want to drill into it, you can drill into it if you want, right? So then you can put that down here. 
and then up here you have the ability on your visual if you put some values in your x-axis or y-axis for the other visual you can drill into the visual so on the visual if you click on these arrows right above it you can start to drill down into it right so if you click on these double arrows what this is going to do is it's going to make you go to the next level right so we're now on date right so the next level being here's our month and year level this is the level we're at right now month and year and then if we click on this double arrow we're going to go to the next level right so we're going to go to the date so we went from month and year and now we're at the next level the date level and then to get back up, you can drill up. And then this other one being expanding down, what that does is it keeps the same top context. So it'll, t it'll keep the month context and then just drill down on top of that with another value underneath the month for the actual day, right? So if you wanna drill down and see both of them, you can do that. Or the other one is click to drill down. So if you select this one, what you can then do is click on any of the things in the visual and then you'll drill down into that specific selected item, right? So, so a bunch of different options with the drill down. We'll go into those in a bit later. Um, but you, you do have the option to drill down into all of this stuff when you start building up these visuals. So now that we've got the time series on here, what we want to do is we want to, this visual is a bit basic, right? It's, it's great, but what does it tell us, right? We can throw on some values on there, but again, still, what, what is it totally telling us, right? What are we trying to get out out of this visual? And then if we still throw on some, let's throw on the vacancy division onto this one. Let's do the totals here and let's remove display. Let's keep it in the thousands maybe here. So, right, so, so great, we, we can see that we're going up, right? But what what does up mean? How how are we growing? Are we growing consistently? Are we having spice of growth, right? So, so we can see we're going upwards, right? So that's good, but let's get some growth value also on this visual, right? So if we want to also do some growth value, let's go ahead and add a new measure here. So what we're going to be doing is we are going to be comparing some of the measures we created previously, right? So we're going to be comparing our last month value to our current value. So we're going to go ahead and compare sum of revenue by sum of revenue last month and then get a growth rate, right? So when you compare those two values, you just get that growth rate and then you can visualize the growth rate to show how you're growing. So let's go with revenue, month over month growth rate, and let's use the divide function. And we will go with revenue this month minus revenue last month divided by, so that's our numerator. We're taking, we're gonna try to get a growth rate for our numerator and then divide by last month to get what we are comparing our growth to. And now, so we don't want to just throw this onto the visual because if we throw this onto the visual, it's not gonna give us anything too helpful, right? Uh, can we move it? Right, so it only accepts one argument even. So we can't even throw another value onto this visual. But what we can do is use a different visual. So just use that line line and stacked column chart this time and let's go ahead and move this up to the line and now we can see that we've got a month over month value for our trend right oh, let's go ahead and switch it to a percentage so up here in the measure tools when we've got it selected we can switch its format to a percentage now we can see that that axis switched and now when we hover over, we can see that in April, our revenue grew by 31%. So again, let's go ahead and turn on some of those detail labels. And that looks a bit too messy, so let's just keep those off, right? So detail labels for the bar chart or for the growth look too messy. So again, keeping the report viewer in mind, making sure that they've got a clean view. They don't need to see those. They just got that nice trend, right? So we didn't grow here. We've got some nice growth here, and then we're starting to hit some nice strides at the growth at the end of the year, right? So we can quickly show that um, growth value over time. And again, with that slicer up top, we can then see kind of where we started last year, where we're at this year. 
and then now getting into the real power of Power BI, what you can do is filter all of your visuals by each other, right? So if you select a visual or if you select a client from your other visual that we've already created, you can see the visual on the right is adjusting, right? So that's where the real power of Power BI starts getting into play, right? Is where everything starts filtering with everything and interacting with everything and your model starts doing great because all of those relationships are created so all of your values are right and you don't need to question it. You just know your data is correct because your model's right. It starts really, really getting into kind of where it starts to provide immense value when you start to get everything on the page and start interacting with the data in its kind of interact interactive way to get that super in-depth analysis. Um, but all right, so once we've got that um, time series visual kind of planned out here, let's just go ahead and put this onto the page. And so that is going to be our time series visual, right? So again, we've got that time series values going month over month. We can see that the division is there up in our um, up in our legend. We've got our values broken out. And then we've got that month over month growth, right? So a super, super nice, super clean looking uh, monthly trend value. And if we even want to, we can throw in the ability to drill down into the day of the week. So again, super, super valuable with that drilling. So that's our next visual. We will get into the next one. Next one, we're going to be doing another little time series one for cumulative values. And I will see you guys on the next one. So on this next visual, let's get into a bit of advanced DAX. So in this next one, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing a cumulative measure to get the cumulative value on this time series, right? So using the same kind of time series concept of building out month over month values, let's do the same kind of thing, but get a measure to do a cumulative value for those same time series um, kind of visuals, right? So let's go ahead and walk through how to do this. So let's go ahead and just do a little sample here. So we've got month and year value. All right. So let's go ahead and essentially what we're going to be doing is we're going to be creating a measure where the December 2021 value is going to be the total, right? So that final value is going to equal our total cumulative of everything else, right? So it's going to be the sum of all of everything previously up to its final total value. So what we're going to want to do is create a new time intelligence measure. Let's go ahead and create a new measure here. Let's name this cumulative revenue and we are going to be using that wonderful calculate measure so we're going to be using our calculate expression so let's go ahead and use calculate and within that expression is again just going to be that base revenue measure that we've been using so much still just building off of this one measure right so use that sum of revenue measure and then within our filter statement this is where we're going to get pretty advanced so in our filter statement we're going to use the filter function and then in the filter function, its first argument is asking for a table. So the table that we're going to give it is an all selected of our date table. So what this is doing is within this context of this value right here, this value shows our revenue being 3.8 for April. So in that evaluation context of this measure, April 21, it shows a value of 3.8 what we're doing with this all selected statement is we're removing that April context. So this now, this April context now goes away, right? So we're now looking at the total across all of these values. So if we go ahead and put this measure onto the table, what we will see is we will see just that same total value across the board, right? Because again, we've removed that evaluation context at each line item for the month and year because we're doing all selected on the date table. So our all selected is the full year, right? So it's getting us that total value, right? So so that's, that's what we're filtering with this filter statement. So once we do that, now what we want to do is we can then just take on a filter statement to go with making sure that our dollars, our revenue dollars date is less than or equal to the max of the current date context of the visual, right? So what we're doing here is we're saying that the date of our revenue, since that's our relationship with our calculation, the date relationship to our calculation right here is based on our revenue date is less than or equal to the max date on the visual. Right, so within our measure, we're taking the date of the revenue and we're taking it up until the max date on our context. Right, so when I switch this up, what we'll see 
is we will see that summation value, right? So we get that initial value, which is equal to its base value, right? So we get that cumulative is equal to its initial month. That makes total sense. Then once we go into that next month, let me just format this one second. Then once we go into that next month, what we're doing is we're adding those two months up, right? So we're adding January to February to get that cumulative value. So again, going back down to December 21, we can see that that value is our total value. So that we ended up doing what we were shooting for there, right? So again, just to, just a different way to visualize that same kind of growth metric and just visualize it differently within your data by using a different type of measure. So let's go ahead and visualize this now. If we use a area chart on this one, we can now see kind of how nice and pretty our visual looks there. Right, so with just changing up that measure, what we're able to do is just make our totally different visual now with that same base measure and just add an extra filter statement to it. Right, And then what we can do on top of this to make this even more powerful is let's compare this value, this cumulative growth rate, to last year's cumulative growth rate and then get a growth rate on that. Very similar to how we did on this other visual, but instead of monthly growth rate context, we can now show year over year growth context in that area type visual right so it's a, just a completely different way to kind of show that same data but again just get different insights right so let's go ahead and create that value so what we're gonna do is very similar to the sum of revenue last month let's just go ahead and create a sum of revenue last year so let's go ahead and just copy it make a new measure switch up the name and switch up its duration to year so all we did was just copied that sum of revenue last month pasted it, renamed it to a last year value, LY, and switched up its duration to negative one year. So let's go ahead and enter on here. And now what we want to do is same kind of thing, just copy that sum of, or that cumulative revenue one. This is going to be cumulative revenue last year. Let's go sum of revenue last year. Keep the rest of our filter statement the same because we're still doing the same exact thing just in that last year context. And then let's go ahead and format this guy. Zero. And let's draw P1. So there you go. So now we can see that we've got those cumulative values and we're comparing to each other, right? So now that last step, let's throw on a growth rate. So one more growth rate measure, and let's just again, just copy and paste our previous one. We don't need to type all of that divide stuff out again. Let's go revenue year over year growth rate. Sum of revenue last year, sum of revenue last year. Wonderful. And let's switch you to a percentage, and we don't need you showing any decimals. All right, great. So now what we struggle with here, though, on this visual is how do we get this to show properly, right? So if we just throw this revenue growth rate onto the visual, it kind of messes everything up, right? Because it's a percentage. So we can't kind of, if we throw it as a secondary still, right, it still kind of messes everything up. It kind of throws our whole visual out of whack. But what we can do is throw it on the tooltip. What we don't need it to do is we don't need that value to really visualize itself. We can see the difference in growth rate, right? We can see that this current value is much higher, right? Our people know how to read this graph, right? That difference is going to be our growth rate, right? Our current year is just higher than our previous year. We can see we've grown. So we don't necessarily need to visualize it because this visual is visualizing it. But we still want to show that growth rate and show its value. So you can just put it on the tooltip. So now that we've got it on the tooltip, when we hover over, let's pop it out real quick. When we hover over, we only see the two values. Let's put the tooltip back on. We now see that revenue year over year growth rate, right? So now at every month and year context, you'll still have that growth rate value, but it's not going to interfere with kind of how that visual is displaying in its visual way, right? So again, just a super powerful way to use those visuals just to know what tools you've got with Power BI to put the visual in the best kind of powerful, most value add way possible onto the page. So that, again, cumulative measure, super quick and easy, compare it to last year, great looking visual. So all right, that's that next visual. And and on the next one, we will get into a couple more visuals. We'll be doing some donuts and uh, pie charts and see you guys on the next one. 
for the next visuals, we are going to be using some new measures. Um, so let's go ahead and get those things set up. So before we can create these guys, let's go ahead and create one more inactive relationship in our model. Uh, so what we are going to be doing with this relationship is we are going to be doing a relationship to our vacancies by the employee, right? So right now we don't have a relationship to our vacancies. So we don't know what employee added the vacancies, right? But some employee added it, right? It's in it's in our data. So how did it get in the data? What employee added it? So on our employee data, if you grab the ID, we are going to relate it to the added by on the vacancy table. And so when we do that, we can see that we add an inactive relationship, right? So it's not an active relationship when we add it. That's because we already have an employee relationship down to our revenue table, right? So we can't add another relationship up above that one. That's totally fine. That's expected. We want it to be inactive. So once we've got that relationship created, let's go back to our report page. We're ready to use that inactive relationship now. So what we're going to do is we want to get the number of openings, right? So we want to see how many openings have been added um, within a specific year. And if we filter by an employee, we want to know how many openings were added by whatever employee we're filtering for. So what we want to do first is let's go ahead into our base measures and let's go ahead with the sum of openings. So all we're going to do is just literally take the sum of the openings column um, to get uh, to get the number of openings within a vacancy, right? So let's go with the sum function in our measure and just go num openings. All right, so if we put that on the page, do, 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 do. right, we can see that for context wise, right, we don't have it doesn't make much sense yet, right, because we don't have a date relationship to those openings, right? And that's fine because with the vacancy measure, what we're going to be doing is instead of having a date relationship within the process of recruitment, vacancies are either opened or closed, right? So we don't care when necessarily it was added. We just care how many vacancies are open or how many vacancies are closed, open and closed, specifying if it's being worked or not, right? So instead of the date relationship being important, that's not what it's important here. But what is it? What is important uh, might be who added the person, right? So if we go to the name, some of that. You can see again, still that name is broken, even though we just created that relationship, right? So we just created that name relationship. But when we throw the name onto context with the sum of openings, it doesn't work. And that's just because we have that inactive relationship, right? So going back to that, using that use relationship value to activate that relationship, that's what we just have to do for this one, right? So let's go ahead and build on top of this measure. And let's go ahead and make a sum of openings by employee. So sum of openings by employee. And again, we're going to use that calculate function. So let's go with calculate. Let's go with openings. And in our filter statement, we are just going to be using that use relationship function. So let's get the employee ID with the added by column on vacancy. Let's go ahead and close you out. And now if we throw you on there, now we can see we're starting to get that relationship, right? So now if we remove the sum of openings broken one, now we can see that there we go. Now we're starting to break out the employees how we want, right? So now we can see that we've activated that relationship how we want to. Now let's take that a step further and build on top of this measure again to get what we were talking about with the opening versus closed, right? So now that we've got our openings by employee and we can filter by individual, now let's filter by the open and open vacancies and how many openings are open still, right? So sum of openings and let's go vacancy open flag. Let's calculate sum of openings by employee, and then let's use one of the fields called the open closed flag. And this is a true false field, so true is open. Let's have that be equal to true. So again, within this measure, what we're doing here is we're building on top of those previous measures we built, 
and we're just adding an additional filter statement to it. Right? So we're building on top of those measures that we already have activated our relationship by our employee. And now on top of having that active relationship for the employee, we're now filtering those results down further to that vacancy open close flag is set to true. So now if we put this on the page, now we can see the number is a lot shorter, right? So all the other openings are going to be closed. So we can go ahead and remove this guy. So now we know that we've got our openings by people ready to go. Great, that is what we were looking for. Now, before we get this on the page, the next measure that we were wanting to go ahead and create is within the recruiting world, there's not just revenue, right? Before revenue comes in the door, so before somebody starts a placement or before a contract starts actually working on site, we assume we've made the placement, right? We're just getting ready for them to start. So we assume those dollars are going to be coming in the door, right? And so those are just called booking dollars. So those placements have been booked. We're ready to go. We're assuming those dollars are coming in the door, right? So let's go ahead and calculate our total booking dollars and then also get our approved booking dollars because placements can be terminated. They can be dropped out. So those booking dollars might not actually turn into revenue dollars. So let's go ahead and start working out what our dollars are that we expect to bring in and then we can kind of get that on the page to show what we did actually bring in. All right, so let's go ahead and create a new base measure here and we are going to be doing just a simple sum function on this one. Total booking dollars, let's go fee split, so it's the employee split value. So again, if you throw this onto the page, we can see each of the employees booking dollar value compared to their revenue value, right? So we can see that people are booking a lot more than they're bringing in because people are either not done working, they're actively working, they just booked them, so dollars haven't come in the door yet, many reasons, right? But so you can see that we've got a booking dollar and a revenue dollar. So let's go ahead and format our booking dollars. and put that to zero. Wonderful. So now that we've got our booking dollars, let's go ahead and again, we're building on top of this. So with our booking dollars, we also do not have a um, date to them. So if we have a date filter, right, we can see that our dates don't filter our booking dollars. And so if we go to our model, we can see that that's because in our placement commission table, the way we're, the column where we're summing up, so we're summing up on our placement commission table, this table does not have an active date relationship, right? Our active date relationship is on our revenue table. And this revenue table is not related to our placement commission table, right? So we don't have an active date relationship to our commission table. So what we can do though, because our placement table does have a bunch of date relationships, we can activate those placement relationships to give our commission table a date relationship. So let's go ahead and do that on top of our base measure. So again, on top of that base measure, what we are doing is just building on top of it to activate the relationship, right? So let's go booking dollars, let's go by book date. So let's calculate total booking dollars. And again, in that filter statement, we'll use that use relationship statement. And then what we're going to be using our relationship on is the date table. And then one of those date fields that we added on the placement, the one of those inactive date relationships that we added on the placement, the book date field being one of them. So now if we go ahead and drop that on, now we can see that we do have date relationship. All right, so if we move this back, we've now changed those values, right? So we do now have an active date relationship that we've added on to that base measure. Now let's take that again one step further, and then now let's take in our placement statuses, right? So let's only now show those approved statuses. So let's go to approved booking dollars, and let's not even, let's just have an approved booking dollars without the date, and let's have another approved booking dollars one, right? So let's use this approved booking dollars as a new base. So approved booking dollars, let's calculate total booking dollars and let's have the status of the placement be equal to the text of approved. And so I want it to equal approved or 
the double lines in Power BI in a filter statement indicates or. Double ampersand is an and, so if I wanted to say and within a single filter condition, we could do a double ampersand, but if you want to do an or statement, you can do a double line. Or the placement status is equal to completed, meaning the placement has already been done, or the placement has been terminated means that they worked, they were approved, but have since been fired. And let's throw that onto the page as well. And so now we can see this measure does not have date context, right? So we can see that it doesn't have date context, but it's not our total booking dollars, right? So it's it's not our total booking dollars because we've now filtered our total booking dollars down to those certain statuses that we've indicated, but it doesn't have the date relationship anymore because that's not the one we built our date relationship on, right? So then let's go ahead and switch up our date relationship to show on approved booking dollars. Now let's rename this one to so there you go now you can see that we've got the approved booking dollars by the date if we filter by our date now now we've got that approved booking dollars by book date filtering nice and neatly so now we've got that additional revenue value or dollar value that we can start reporting on now right so so now we've got the two dollar values those booking dollars and the revenue dollars um, and we can start reporting on those two so right so let's get those two new values that we just created so those uh, sum of openings and that total bookings onto the page so on here let's go with a donut chart for one of these guys so let's go with we don't need the name on there let's go with a donut chart and let's go with the vacancy source for this breakout so on the donut what this argument uh, with this the visuals that this are the arguments that this visual takes are a value and a legend so on the legend this is what will break out your values and on the detail label, let's say category, and let's do all, and let's not sum units, and let's format you. Wonderful. So now what we've got on this visual is we've got, let's format this just a bit. So we've got this visual showing a donut of all of the vacancies that are currently open. So these are the open vacancies and the source in which they came from, right? So the LinkedIn data source or the LinkedIn vacancy sources currently have 2100 open vacancies a part of them, right? So within this visual, you can again quickly filter through all of those different vacancy sources and see all of the other data of what is coming through. And then again, those you know what individual is doing it because again, we've created that active relationship between those individuals and employees now. And then so once we've got that vacancy count, let's also throw on those booking dollars and let's break this one out by the Let's break this one out by source as well. Huh? So let's throw source onto here. Let's throw Canada source onto here though. So we've got two different source values on our visuals here. Let's go ahead and shrink these down a bit. Just make some room here, getting a bit cramped, but that's okay. All right, now Let's remove some of these detail labels, getting a bit too crowded here. Let's go with value. We don't need category. Data label and percent. Let's go data label and percent. There we go. Perfect. All righty. And let's remove these legend titles. Boom, boom, boom. Getting in the way. There you go. So, all right. So now we've got two brand new measure values that we have quickly displayed and formatted and filter everything else, right? So now that we're starting to build up our measure repository, right? We've starting to, we're starting to throw on some measures and quickly be able to throw everything and filter everything else by what those values are, right? So now that we're starting to really build up the report, you can see that interactivity that's starting to come into play with how Power BI really starts to shine. Everything's filtering everything.
So for let's go ahead and fill up this last remaining white space. We'll talk about kind of what to put there in this next video. Um, and then we'll talk about some uh, final best practices of kind of how we landed up on where we landed with the report, looking how it did um, and how you guys can start to do that yourselves. And we'll go from there. So I was mentioning how almost all of the uh, reports should have some type of data table, right? Some type of table to show you the data in the detailed kind of row by row line item view. So this white space, let's go ahead and throw on that table for this view. So what is that data that we want those report viewers to see? So we've created that employee relationship and we don't have anything to do with employees yet. So let's go ahead and have the employees be our table source, right? So let's go ahead and put in a table with some employee name on there and let's go and throw on the total booking dollars by book date right let's see what the employees are bringing in on a daily basis or uh, on the filtered for date range basis right so let's go ahead and format this up a bit all right wonderful so now we've got some room to work with on this table let's go ahead and decide what else to throw on here right so let's go ahead we've got the activity count we've already got that on there let's throw that on Let's format that again. All right, and then so one of the um, one of the really powerful measures that I wanted to make sure we cover here is using average X over a time frame. So let's say that you wanted to get the number of average number of contacts that are added every day or the average number of some certain activity that happened within a week right what are the av what how do we get those averages over a certain time frame right so the way that we can do that is we can use average x and then our date table so let's go ahead and use average x and do monthly or weekly revenue let's go ahead and do monthly so let's go ahead average x of revenue And then within this measure, let's go ahead, average x is going to be the function. And the table, what we're going to do on our table is we're going to use the values function. So within the values function, what this does is this values function, let's go ahead and pop this out here. What this values function does is it will give a unique value of items in the column that is selected, right? So if we select values for month and year, we're only going to get a virtual table returned of each of those values for January, February, March, right? So each value will have a single value in the table. So what we can do now is let's go values, month and year. And then within the expression, we are just going to choose that base measure that we've already created. All right, so again, very simple, very standard stuff. Just the funky, the crazy powerness is happening right up here where we're, where we're establishing that virtual table where we're going to average across, right? So this average X, right? Remember that X, it's an iterating function. So we're iterating through all of the values on the month and year table. So every value is being iterated through, and then we're taking the sum of values at each of those months and averaging them across each other. Right, so let's go ahead and see what that looks like when we get it onto the page. <clears throat> and let's go zero. Okay, so now that we've got that onto the page, what we can see is we can see that instead of having the, oh, let's throw revenue on there too so we can compare that. Right, so here's their total revenue value, right? But each of these revenue values happen over a time frame, right? So then if you click on this, you can see that, let's go ahead and change this. Oh, that's fine, I'll get into that interaction later. So what, what you can see is just within this individual, on a month, they're making 19,000, right? So you can see if you filter by that average X of revenue over month, you can see who those top monthly performers are for your revenue for your employees, who are those people bringing in the most money, right? And then if you filter up and change that to client, let's remove the employee, right? Now we can see the client that's bringing in the most every month, right? So again, just that model that can carry you through all of this different stuff if you build that client or if you build that model right from the ground up, right? 
So it can totally change how you can make your reports look and change up how you can filter for stuff super quick and easily based on how your model works. Um, and just make sure that you can put on any of those values that you're working with across the board. All right, so let's go ahead and use this table. This looks great to me. We've got all of our employees. We can filter by each of their dollar values. They've got some activity that comes with it and then kind of that average um, that they're bringing in every month. So let's go ahead and just reorganize this a little bit and maybe let's do this. Let's put in candidate index as well. So let's make this a matrix. Let's throw in candidate name. Let's go employee name candidate name so under here now you can see we've got just that same kind of that matrix breakout that we were talking about right so this individual adam has submitted two uh, two recruitment activity activities for amy right and then andrew has received these dollar values in this selected time frame for Adam, right? So if you, we can just build out that table. And then if we, again, filter for those things, what we're filtering for is that specific individual across all of your visuals, right? So that's how that matrix is kind of working. So the last thing that I want to cover on the table and matrix visuals is the conditional formatting. So on conditional formatting for tables and other visual types as well, you are able to conditionally format certain fields. So on the value section of a field, if you click on the drop down arrow, so some X of revenue, let's go ahead and conditionally format this you've got a couple of options, right? So we can do a bunch of different options that we want to throw on here. Typically, I'll use data bars or background colors or icons. The other two are definitely usable as well and have great value too, though. Uh, so let's go ahead and use a data bar. So what we want to do here is for our sum of revenue, let's have the positive bar be a green we're not going to have any negatives, so we don't need to worry about the negatives. Minimum is fine to just be highest or to just be lowest. Highest is highest and bar direction left to right. Let's go ahead and see what that looks like. Right, so what we did there is we've put this little visual on top of the field on this table so that now with within each of these values, we can see who's kind of at the top end is somebody. So this 4000 is quickly all the way down at the bottom end of the spectrum, right? We know because their green bar has no fill this 326, though, they're somewhere near the top end because they're totally full. And then when you expand it, what it does is it does the same thing underneath in that second level right so if you go back down to the unexpanded section you can see that that's removed right it's it's now no longer formatted at that top level that's because it's expanded at the level underneath for the candidate name and it's now doing that formatting at the second level right so it, you just got to be aware whenever you're doing that stuff that you know how those things will interact so that there are no surprises to how that works, right? But so there is that table formatting, conditional formatting, a bunch of stuff you can do with the conditional formatting on there. Um, but all right, that is it for the table section. Uh, we are going to get into slicers, throwing on the last bit of slicers onto the report, um, and then we will get into the best practices after that. So see you guys in the next one. Okay, so for the last step here, what we are missing on this report are just our slicers. So on each of these values, we can see that we've got an employee name, and when we click on it, it'll filter everything else, right? Same thing with the um, candidate source, right? When you click on it, it'll filter everything else. But that's not the best way for report viewers to filter on things, because report viewers need to know that clicking on something will filter everything. What people do know is that these little boxes with the click down button will filter stuff. That's typically where people's brains go. Clicking on this will filter everything else. So what is best practice for report viewers is you always want to put your slicers on the page as well. So even if you've got these client values out here and these employee names out here and the report viewer can scroll through this table to go all the way down to find the K to click on that person that they need. It's best practice to just make sure that you put those values that they're going to be searching for within a slicer so you don't have to have the report viewer go through that frustration of finding who they're looking for. Right. So some of those main slicers that you might want to put on there is definitely a date slicer. <clears throat> so just a year might not be sufficient, right? You might need more than a year. Somebody might want months or weeks or just the exact specific day, right? So let's go ahead and change this one up here. Let's put the client name in here 
and in the client name slicer let's turn on that search bar right so within the client slicer visual if you've got it selected these three little dots click on that search bar and what you now see is you now have the ability to type something in right so you can now type in and it will search up what you're looking for and then you can click on that value right so instead of having to scroll through again the point of the slicer is so you can alleviate that frustration of scrolling through right they can just search for that value click on it and then it'll filter the rest of the report bada bing bada boom right so now that we've got the client name on there great let's go ahead and throw employee name on there as well and then we can get on the rest of the date slicers on our visual too so now that we've got the client name, let's go employee name. We can keep that search bar, wonderful, and in year. Let's go ahead with month and year, and let's go date. So now within this slicer, what you can see is we've got that hierarchy. So very similar to a matrix visual, you've got that hierarchy, but it's within a slicer node, right? And since all of our date things within our, all of our date fields within our date table are related, our hierarchy kind of breaks out no problem, right? So very similar to how the things work within the matrix structure, you can have those same kind of hierarchies within your slicers to filter down, right? So if you want to unfilter for 21 fully and filter for just February, you can do that as well, right? And then click on any of those different values, um, not continuous values, anything like that, right? So now we've got those slicers on there. Now that we've got our slicers on here, what is next, right? So the next step to kind of finalizing and designing a report is making sure things have one the proper interactions between each other so all of the things that you're clicking on are clicking on each other and two your fact that you're do you have the right color scheme and is everything displayed and organized in the right way for the report viewer to get that most value out of so in the next video we're going to be going through um, interactions between all of your visuals and that last one to tie up the section we're going to be covering the themes and how to change any of your colors and best design practices for some colors and choosing how to display that those visuals so getting into a pretty niche part of power bi but what a, a very important part the way that visuals interact with each other so when you select a visual up at the top ribbon you have a format button if you click on the format button on the far left is going to be the edit interactions if you click on this button what's going to happen is you, all of your visuals are going to give you a new little pop-up little box that you haven't seen before so on all of your visuals now you've got this little none and filter button and then if you filter another visual you'll have another one too you'll have filter highlight and none right so now with the edit interactions toggled on what this does is you can set the interactions between all of those visuals that we've been looking at right so when we're clicking on something and filtering all of the other data we can set what those interactions do right so we can set what this filtering does to each of these other visuals right now it's set to highlight right so when i filter pitman group on this visual it's set to highlight this visual if i set it to filter you can see how that totally changes the visual right so with within these interactions you can completely change how that report looks and feels with just changing how these interactions interact between each other right it's, it, they just change completely how they interact so if you click on that visual and then select filter instead of highlight you can change how they interact with each other so then let's go back to that other visual let's go back to the time series one and if we click on may we can again see that the revenue is still only highlighted right so it doesn't go both ways you have to adjust both of them if you want them to filter or you have to adjust both of their interactions if you want to change both sides of it. So if you want it to filter instead for May, you can again just click on that filter instead of highlight. So again, it just totally changes how the report looks and feels based on what is being filtered and interacted with. So same thing over here, right? So over here, we don't need to do anything with the date visual because again, this vacancy open has nothing to do with dates. This is just an open close flag. So it doesn't matter what date you select. So you don't need to change that interaction but up on the booking dollars it does matter because you can still see it's highlighted the highlighted donut doesn't tell us much right so we don't want it highlighted let's make it filtered 
right? So same, you, whenever you're building these reports, you just want to make sure that all of those interactions are set in the correct way that makes sense, again, for that report viewer that you're working with. So again, if you select a group, now, since we don't have date context, we do want the vacancy and openings to be filtered. So we do want to keep that filtered by our client. We do want the booking dollars to also be filtered. We don't want it to just be highlighted. We want it to filter. So, right? And so we've only just done two of these visuals, right? So we have to go through all of these visuals to make sure they're interacting in the proper way that we expect them to interact, right? So if we just want it, we're fine with this visual having our highlights. We can highlight this visual on the monthly basis. That makes total sense to us, right? So let's just keep that one how it is. Maybe we don't like how it interacts with the donuts up here, so we want to put that to filter and put this to this can stay again because there's no date context, right? And so where this gets very crazy and super finicky and niche with Power BI reporting is when you start getting into how your specific visuals interact with each other or don't interact with each other. So you can completely turn off the interaction as well. So if we just don't want this time series visual to be filtered by our date for whatever reason, there could be numerous reasons why you might want to do that. You can just you can keep the visual on the page, have everything else be filtered by that slicer, but just remove that interaction on that single visual. So then that visual for whatever use case you need it for can still be on that same page, but solve the issue that you need it to while everything else is give, doing what it needs to do. Right, so working with those interactions is super crucial, very tedious and hard to understand at the at the uh, front end. So so definitely try to be understanding of how this works with this inter interactions, because um, it's tough. It's hard to understand exactly what it's doing until you see what exactly is being done when you click on a button. Because it's weird to think just how easy it is that your entire data set changes on just that simple filter, right? But everything changes with the interactions between all of those reports. So, right, so again, if, if you click on a client name, but you don't want it to filter that revenue report, you can again just do all of those different things just by that edit interaction button. So now that we know how those edit interactions work, let's go ahead and talk about the report design and the report colors. So how you can select a theme, what themes might be best, and how you can finalize the design to make it look all ready and presentable for the end user. So I'll see you guys in the next one. Now that we've got everything on the page, we've got all of our stuff looking like we want it, all of our visuals, we have our visuals set, formatted how we want them to. Now what do, what do we need to do to finalize the report to get it to look like a finalized report? This kind of still looks like just stuff on a page, right? It's, it's kind of still a mess. So what do we do to tie it up to make it look official? How do we, how do we finalize it? So the best practices that I've come across on how do you kind of make that report look professional, beautiful, and finalized, what you need to do are a couple of things. So on all of your visuals, what you want to do is go to the Visualizations tab on the for, or Visualizations pane, select the visual, Visualizations pane, go to your Format, your visual, and then on the Effects, what you're want, uh, the Effects section, open that up, and then you're going to want to turn on the Visual Border for all of these. So go ahead and just turn on the Visual Border for all of your visuals. So everything you've got on the page, all of the visuals at least. You don't need to do it with the slicers. Make sure you don't go overboard, right? We don't want to, again, make it more cluttered. We're just trying to make sure that we are drawing the attention of the viewer to where they need it to be, right? So all right, so once we've got all of our stuff blocked off, let's go ahead and change our interactions up. Let's get that going away. So, all right, so now we've got all of that set. Again, just with that box, you can kind of see that everything looks kind of a little bit neater, right? You, everything, our eyes not all swamped. We can see what tables what. We know where stuff ends. It's kind of, it's just a lot more digestible just with those quick borders, right? And so after you get that set, what you can do is you can go to the View tab, and on the drop down, this is where you can select your theme. Right? So your theme is going to establish all of your colors, your fonts. You can set a custom theme. So if you set a theme and you like some of the fonts, you like some of the colors, but you want to change some things, you can select that theme and then customize it. Right? You can customize it further. Um, the customize options in this customized theme have gotten a lot more in depth recently. So you can you can really do a, a, a lot of customizations with this customized theme. So if you need to start designing like a professional feel and use your brand colors for your organization, you can really start doing that within this customized theme option. 
but again for most people um, a pre-selected theme will probably be fine um, or you can browse for um, themes in the theme gallery if you want to do any of that if you know any themes out there that you use consistently or something like that um, go for it right this theme button very easy to kind of create those different themes that you want you can even create custom json themes if you know how to kind of do any of that json custom theme formatting you can just create a theme file yourself whole lot of things you can do with that theme right go ahead and pick one you one that you like not not too big of a deal the theme the theme is totally up to kind of the report user or the report developer and kind of the organization if the organization has a standard use the organization standard if you're creating your standard go ahead and create the standard kind of however you see fit right so great so now that we've got our theme selected let's go ahead and move some of these slicers around change what we want these to be showing this is the client this is our employee and let's go slicer header for date selection all right now that we've got our borders around our visual we've got our slicers on the page let's go ahead and organize these just a bit i don't like how these look right let's put these kind of another great thing with power bi is kind of the formatting options you can see those red lines that are popping up right when you're dragging stuff around the formatting for power bi is pretty nice and clean right it'll it'll pop things in to place when it finds a center value when it finds an alignment. So it's pretty nice with kind of being able to just do some of that design stuff for you, which is very nice. Let's extend this out, put all you guys to even. Are you the same size? I think you might be a little shorter. And let's go ahead and instead of doing a border, so instead of doing the visual border, on each of these guys so this can just look messy right so let's show you what this would look like All right that can kind of look pretty messy right that that's not too clean we don't we don't want to do that that's not too helpful right so instead what we can do is you can throw in a shape that can act as your border so instead of actually putting a border on those visuals let's just put in a little shape that will act as our border right so let's go ahead and remove the fill we will keep the border and let's set it to black and there we go and so now if you if you do that though what happens is power bi has a layer structure so if you have if you've ever worked in a visual designer or anything like adobe or something like that where it's got like layers of images where you can move and stuff power bi is very similar with the way that it handles objects on the page so within power bi the way that you can handle those things is on the view tab go to the selection pane click that open under the show panes button click on selection and so now what we just added if you click on what you just added you can see that that shape is all the way at the top so again going from that visual design mindset the stuff at the top is what's clickable right so i can't click anything any of those slicers because they're underneath it right so like that shape is essentially blocking the selection of those slicers right so what we can do to kind of fix that up is let's go ahead and group all of these items so let's get our shape and our three slicers so this stuff gets very very in depth but for right now just to get you guys into that these are options I just want to show you the very basics to it right so let's go ahead and just group those four items up so our three slicers in here plus our shape that we just added to act as our border we just group them up right so now if we select this we can move them all as one right so I select client I haven't actually selected client right I'm still on the group I can move them all as an individual or all as a group of uh, group of items right so what we want to do with this is what what we've done is I've moved the shape to the bottom now right so the shape is on the bottom so now I can select if that shape is on top I can't select right I'm clicking but I can't select it because the shape is blocking it right so if you do do these design kind of tricks that selection pane is going to be very helpful for you to making sure that you can do what you're trying to do right because again you you got to make sure that you're selecting all of the right things and then on your report design and design or in end users they're able to then still select everything when you're trying to just 
build out the design to look pretty, right? So again, real quick ways of just making the report look nice and neat, right? Let's minimize stuff a bit more, make it look bigger. So there you go. So we've got our report kind of looking a lot better now. It's a lot nicer on the eyes. For one last little trick that we can do, we can do another little shape trick, but instead of just doing just for a single slicer, let's do it for the whole page. So now on the page, if we do a slice or if we do an entire if we do an entire visual as the background on the entire page we can change up the look and feel to it even more let's make this a different color too similar there we go anything else yeah that looks good so now that we've just added, an, again, just a simple shape on the background, but what we've done is just kind of given it a different feel, right? Now now the look and feel to it is just a bit more professional because we've got a design to it, we've got a feel to it, there's a look and structure to it, we've got our stuff organized, we have our slicers up here to filter our data, all of our data interacts with each other, right? So we've now started to really build up that report, that professional looking report for that end user. So now once we've got kind of the, all of our items set, we've got our report design blocked out, we've got our visuals set up, we're ready to kind of publish. So now that we've kind of walked through a setup of what a, a nice designed report can look like or an official published report can look like and how it can feel, in the next video I'm going to kind of go over what we did, right? What did we go through? How did we get to this point from having nothing designed? an hour or so ago, right? What did we do? How can you guys replicate this as you guys design and think about your own projects and your own development and designing out your own reports? So that'll be in the next one and I'll see you guys on then. So like I said, we kind of got here quick, right? We got from no report to now we have a full report designed and we're ready to publish, right? So what what's the goal as we go through that? What was the thought process to the design, to the layout? Why did we put things A, B, C, X, Y, Z locations, right? So to go through it, let's just start kind of with where we started, right? So the way that I kind of go about designing reports is the, the data that we have and depending on the ask or the request and the stakeholders that who are asking for it, right? It's all dependent on that. So again, going back to the report viewer, right? So if we're just building out something generic, right? I just want to show some value with a Power BI report. I want to cover all of my bases, right? So I want to show employee metrics since we have an employee table. I want to show client value, who those top clients are. I want to show trends over time to show if we're doing well currently, how we were compared to last year, if we're trending well, if we're trending not good, what those breakouts of some of those main different categories on some of our data might be. Do we have some category that's dominating within dollars or that's super more efficient compared to some other category? Right? When we start digging through this data, we can get to all of those different things, right? So as I design, that's kind of, that's how I focus about, that's how I think about it and kind of focus my report design is just who is it designed for and how can I get them the value that they need? So if we, if we're working on something that is just for employees, it's some HR request, none of these dollar values would even be relevant. Right? We wouldn't even have any of these dollar values on this report because they don't matter to that HR person who's requesting it. They just care when the employee started and their tenure and how many disciplinary actions they've had against them or something like that, right? None of those dollar values matter to, to that individual, so it becomes a totally different report. And the design and feel, again, become totally different because you just want to show them something basic. Okay, here are our accounts by disciplinary actions at by month. Here are the highest people of disciplinary actions on these manager teams, right? So it becomes kind of more of that who is asking for the report and what do I put on the page? What's in my toolbox to get them what they need? So as you as you develop, kind of the best thing that I practiced and that I did to get kind of where I was at was just use all of the different tools. Don't get stuck using one visual because that was what you got familiar with. Try the other visual. Try the visual right next to it the next time. Push the, if you've got one visual, just flip it to another one. See what it looks like. How does it look? Does that show value? I don't know. Maybe it might, right? 
all of those things within Power BI, the way that if you've got your model set up, you can just click it around and change it, and it might show value depending on how you're looking at it, right? Depending on who's looking at it. So it's just getting familiar with all of those different tools you have in the bucket, you have in your toolbox, and knowing how to apply them to who's asking for the report. And then for kind of design practice, what I typically will always do is throw a name or the filters, um, name or slicers in the top left or the top right, and then the data data table will be right next to it. So you kind of know exactly, okay, here are the people with what's filtered by. So it's kind of that's quick and easy to see. And then outside of that, I'll always have my time visual, almost always have a time visual and almost always have a table. The table less so than the time visual. Table might not always be needed, but I'll always have a time visual and then some type of category type of slicing and dicing to show something quickly, right? So you hop into a report and you can quickly see some colors are this and some colors are that in that time, right? So that's kind of how I'll go about designing. Slicers name, one section table right next to it. If we have a table, definitely some time series, something in there to show growth and trends, and then some category values um, and summarized values on the other white space to fill up the board. But that's, that's pretty much my design strategy. Um, hopefully you guys find that helpful and you guys can use that in your design practice. Um, and we will get into uh, the next one. See you guys in the next one. We are going to close off this section of report design with a cliffhanger. So Power BI has amazing capabilities that we've seen so far to build our report and design some visualizations to make it look pretty and get you your data. What most people, what I see most people just not talking about um, and that I find the most value out of anything that Power BI has to offer, to be honest, um, at least in the report design aspect, is bookmarks. So on the view tab, if you go to the pane, show panes option, you click on bookmarks. What bookmarks do is bookmarks save the state of a report whenever you push the save button. Right, so what that means is whenever you have a bookmark, you are able to change the data, the page, the display, and only do it for a certain number of visuals or all of your visuals. And any number of those things together, all of them and or. But that being said, bookmarks are very complicated and get very difficult to manage and build. So we're not going to cover them in this course. I just want to introduce them to you to make sure you guys know that they exist. Because again, they are incredibly powerful. They're not needed to get started. To build reports and insightful, powerful reports that can change the business, they are not needed. But when you're done with changing the business, when you've set those base reports and you want to really start blowing people out of the water, that's when you want to get into bookmarks. What bookmarks do is they are just a button that just can completely change how people navigate the report. So instead of throwing all of this data at them, you can just give them a single visual and then a button to say, click here to go to that next page. Or if you just need some other things on the page, so many things to do with bookmarks, right? So let me just go into a very quick example of exactly kind of what these things do and how the selection pane can be used to help it, right? So let's say for whatever reason, we want to hide some part of our visual. Right, so what we can do, if we have those things grouped in our selection pane, you can push that little hide button. Right, so if we hide those things and then push a bookmark, we can add that bookmark based on, again, the state of all of the stuff in the report, all of the stuff, everything, slicers, filters, context, all of the things. It will save it and then we can go back to it at a certain date. Again, based on all of those different things, we can specify if it's changing the data or not, if it's changing the display, the page, so only certain visuals. Again, it gets very in-depth, but immense power, right? So again, let's just go back to what we initially saved. We initially saved a bookmark where the eye is unseen, right? So this is now going to be bookmark one. We just added a bookmark where the slicer group was hidden. So if we go back to that bookmark, we can see that that is, again, hidden. We can go back to our bookmark one and then it again shows up, 
right? And so this is just, again, just the very beginning. You can have a group within a group within a group within a group and have 15 different visuals within all of those different groups and 10 different bookmarks to hide one of those visuals and then show the other 10 and then change a button to look like a certain way to know that you clicked on it. It gets crazy when you can start getting into it. But again, no need to know it but they exist. I just want you to know that they exist and they are very powerful for when you're ready to get to them. So then what you do next, you've got the bookmark set, you then add in a button. You then add in a button to call that action being that bookmark. And then now anytime somebody clicks that button, you then go to that bookmark. right? So I'm clicking the button for bookmark 2 and I'm going to that button and then you create another button to go back to bookmark one, right? And so it's, again, it just builds on top of it. Your bookmarks can completely change how people navigate the report so that you dictate what people see, where they see it, how people navigate the report. So you're guiding them through the, the Power BI data story that you're telling, right? So just want to leave you on that cliffhanger. We're not going to get into bookmarks more in depth than this. In this course, there will be a full course on bookmarks. So expect that. Go to that course if you're looking forward to bookmarks. That will be there out, out there for you guys. Um, just know that they exist. Know that they're very powerful. If you ever get stuck on something or you think the bookmarks might be the answer, go check out that video. Bookmarks are incredible, very powerful things within Power BI. So all right, so the next part, what we're getting into next is we are publishing to the service. So we've got a report all done up. We're going to go into Power BI service, what Power BI online is, talk about licensing, workspaces, applications, Power BI apps, permissions, all that stuff. Um, so that is in the next ones. That is going to be the next section. This covers up the report design and visualization part of the course. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll see you guys in the next one. So now that we're done with our report, we are all ready to publish. How do we publish it? How do we get it distributed? What do we do now? <coughs> what do we do now is we will be publishing it to the Power BI service. The Power BI service is where we distribute reports and where end users will access the reports. You don't ever want to share a Power BI file or email a file. Don't distribute like that. Distribution of Power BI happens in the service, right? So let's go through how to do that. So once we're ready, we've got our report designed, we're ready to go, we've validated our data, we want to start getting it in front of people. So what we're going to do is on the home ribbon, push publish. When you push publish, you'll get a save button. Go ahead and push save. And when you are publishing, what you're wanna, gonna, gonna wanna do next is after your, that save button, what comes up next is the workspace selection. So we'll go through workspaces in just a minute, but for our purposes, we will just go ahead and select the workspaces we've created for this example. So go ahead and publish to either your personal workspace or we will go through how to create one in just a second. So then once it's published, so let's say you published it to your personal workspace, you'll get this message, right? So then you can open it in powerbi.com. Let's go ahead and click on that button. And great, so once we do that, we can see we are right there. We are, this is the report that we just created and we can click on it and interact with it up in the service, right? So we just published our report, it's, it's that easy. Once you click open in Power BI, you can just go right out to that report and there's your report, right? But we already know what the report looks like, right? So we don't care about what it looks like. Let's go ahead in the far left corner. We can just exit out of the report, right? We don't care about that. What we do care about is learning what the service looks like. So over here on our left side, what we've got listed are the options of the service, right? So we can go home, create, browse, all those different options. What we're going to focus on is the workspaces and um, the reports in the workspace section. So in the workspaces, if you click on workspaces, you can see a little option to either create a new workspace, go to your personal workspace, admin if you're an admin, or the workspaces you're, that you're a member of. Let's go ahead and just click on that new workspace button and go through what the options are. So in the name, you'll need to give it a name, just give it any name, and then the description, give it any description. Users will be able to see the description, so just be aware of that. Um, and then within the advanced settings, this is where you'll set the workspace settings of what type of workspace it is based on the licensing that you have available. So a pro license will allow you to create a pro licensed workspace, which does have limitations. 
right? So it just has less resources that are allocated to it during a refresh. Data sets can only be refreshed every so often with scheduled refreshes. I think it's three times a day or something like that, maybe six. Um, so there are limits to a pro. The pro license comes at $10 per user a month. The next option above that is premium per user. So you can create a premium per user workspace and those licenses come at $20 per user a month. What premium per user workspaces do is they allow you to, um, they, they honestly give you a lot of freedom for 20, 20 a month. Um, the 20 a month is definitely worth it in my mind if you can convince your organization to do it but it is per user and any workspace or any data set or report that is built in a premium per user workspace users require a premium per user workspace license as well so that's the only downside is it does definitely have a scaling cost when you start getting into a lot of people using it but it is definitely worth it in my mind um, what this allows you to do is this allows you to refresh whole lot more times every day your data sets you can refresh i think it's unlimited i don't remember you can refresh a lot um, you can do some monitoring you just have a bunch more capabilities and resources allocated to your data model when they refresh you have a lot more size available for your model sizes if they start getting really big within the service um, you can have the option of doing a small data set format or a large data set format um, they just kind of again help the resources so again just the different costs and different pricing structures between um, the different licenses within a workspace so again the pro all users accessing or viewing reports will also need a pro license premium per user 20 bucks a month also viewers will need premium per user um, and that's pretty pretty much the basics to the workspaces right that's how you create a workspace what is in the workspace so we just published our data set right so we just published our data set and we can see that the type is data set we can see it right here so right and then within the data set or within the workspace we can also see the reports right so we've got the report and then we've got the data set so if we go hop into the report again we can see that this is exactly what we just created right so now that we've gone through kind of what the workspace are how to create them and what the different types of licensing are let's go through how the, what are the options of getting this report out to people how should we do that what's best practice how do we get people a link is that link going to change what's the best practice for distributing your reports so let's go through that next and see you guys in the next one so let's get into distributing a report <clears throat> so distribution can go through a few different ways they all mostly revolve around accessing through a link right so you can either send individuals a link share a link with them directly to the report so if you click on the report you can share the report right if you go to that share button you can copy the link and share it within your organization or if you have it turned if you have the option turned on you can also get a link published to the web it is just an admin setting that you need to turn on right so you are able to share to the web and share in a public setting it's just based on how your management and admin permissions to be able to do that right so the typical way i see people sharing or is, is just through a share link right that's fine you can do that that's an option what you need to do in order to do that is give users access to the workspace of where that report lives so again it's just something to manage if a bunch of people start coming into a bunch of different workspaces it's a bunch of different things to manage between different workspaces and report access it can become a lot right so it can quickly snowball another way to manage some reports is you can embed in you can embed reports directly onto sharepoint so if you guys have like a company website where people always log in and punch in every day at a sharepoint website and they click on a couple of different links and your management wants to put some daily metrics up there for how people did the previous day or something you can do all of that thing about all of that stuff right you can embed the report directly into sharepoint um, you can embed it into a website if it's not just a sharepoint site or you can do it publicly if people don't have to log in and you want everybody to see it or you're trying to do something for clients and you don't want them to have to pay for uh, Power BI licensing, right? You can you can embed or share the report a bunch of different ways um, directly through the report link. However, what I would say is the best way to do it is through apps. So 
within an app, let's go ahead and create an app real quick and we can show you what, what exactly that means. So let's go ahead and create the app for the workspace that we just published our report to. All right, so let's go ahead and create an app. You can name it whatever you want. Let's just go with test. Again, people, whoever wants to, or whoever will be accessing the app will be able to see the description of the app. Contact information is fine. Expand that, install the app automatically. Um, so what this little setting does is instead of people having to go to through a couple of steps to click on the app and then go to access it, installing it automatically is just they can just click on the link and then no, they don't need to do anything, right? So I usually have that whenever I create an app. Let's go ahead and add our content. On the next page of the app, we are going to add our content. So on that, click Add Content button. Let's go ahead and select the report that we want to do. Um, and then you can also just add links, right? So if you do just want to like add, if, if this app is starting to get bigger and bigger use and you want to add websites and some other external links that people can access on some dashboard page, right? You can just create and add some link that can go out there, right? So you can start adding a bunch of different things to this app not just Power BI reports, but it is just links in Power BI reports, but it's still a, another thing, right? Another option for your app. So go ahead and select that report. Go ahead and push add. And so you can see it popped in right there, right? So if you click on it again, you can see that it'll pop up. That's just page one, there's page two, right? So you can see, you can see that the reports, we've added the report to the app, right? So now on page three, what we're doing here is we are customizing our audience. So what we're doing with our audience is instead of like a, like we were just talking about of having to manage different workspace access and different people's access to different reports for different workspaces, it can become a lot, right? So instead of having to do all of that, all you have to worry about is just create the correct audience and give all of the people who need that audience, all of them in permission to that audience, right? So let's go ahead and just name this test one, this go to test two. And then let's say test two, can't see it. So, all right, so here we go. So with test one, what we have with test one, we have the audience that is able to see the report, right? So if we publish this report and we share it out, let's say that we added somebody to the edit audience and we saved it, right? We That individual would be able to come, we'd be able to share the report link and they'd be able to come to the app and they'd see what they have access to. If we then shared that link with the same individuals in the test two audience, they would see nothing, right? They would be able to access the link because we've given them access to the app, but they don't have access to it. And since all items are hidden, we wouldn't be able to publish it anyway, but just as a testing purpose, right? They wouldn't see anything, but we've given them access so they'd be able to get into the app, but they would just see a blank navigation pane. But then this group, again, the people that we send the link to here, they would be able to access it because we've given them direct access to this audience. They don't need access to the workspace. They just need access to the app, right? And so let's go ahead and delete this audience. And, oh, we still can't publish. Let's go ahead and let's just delete that. There we go. Um, they're not hidden. There you go. Perfect. So now we've got our group and now we can now set the app. We can now publish it and whoever has access to the app, this link will again take them to that audience where they have access to and they will only see the reports that they have access to. So let's go to the app and you can just see what it looks like, right? So it's very similar to the report page, but it, instead of having some of the options like you do with um, sharing it publicly and some of those things, you, your options are a bit more limited than having a direct access to the workspace, right? You can still subscribe to the report. You can still share the report and send links and stuff like that. You can still do all of that. There's just a bit limitations on, um, uh, on some of those file things, right? You can't download the report right from here and some of those things. But like I was saying, this is where you would manage the access. So then now if we go back to the workspace, what I was saying before about people not needing access in all of the workspace management, what you can do now is you can just have access provided to just the data set and then the apps, the app access will cover the rest of it, right? So ideally you can just publish right to the app, create a new report, add it to an app, and people already have access to the audience. So you don't need to go and add anybody new to the audience. You just need to give view access to that new report, right? And so you can just hop right into the app, show everybody the new report, who should be seeing it, click the little eyeball, and 
the report's now viewable to all of your audiences that should be seeing it, right? So the app report distribution is definitely the best way, most ideal way. And then in the next video, we'll talk about kind of that ideal workspace setup um, in order to do that. Um, and then we'll, we'll go from there. See you guys in the next one. So before we get into the ideal setup for report distribution, let's first go into dashboards versus reports. So within this service, what you're able to do is you're able to create a dashboard. So what a dashboard is, is it is essentially a combination of anything else within the workspace that has been pinned. So what that means is, on any reports, so let's say we had multiple reports published to this workspace, we can pin the visual. And what this is going to do, if we push that pin visual button, is it's going to pin to dashboard, and it's going to give you an option to pin it to an existing dashboard or create a new dashboard. So let's go ahead and create a new dashboard, just name it test one. Let's go ahead and push pin. And let's go to the dashboard. Right, so now what we can see has happened in our workspace, we now have a dashboard, right? So we have a report, we have a data set, those two things already existed, but then we just created a new dashboard. And that dashboard is just a pinned item from a report. And so if we had multiple reports within this workspace, we could then pin all of these different things from those different reports and put it onto a single dashboard, right? So you could have multiple different reports being pinned to a single dashboard in the workspace, right? So the kind of the benefit of a dashboard is to be able to put uh, dispersed reports together that maybe different teams are viewing and put it into like a, a summarized view as opposed to having to create that summarized view within a new report within a new report development stack you can just kind of pin it put that dashboard into your app and there there you go now give that a dashboard uh, dashboard view permission to the audience and then there you go now everybody can see the summarized view of what you've got on your dashboard as opposed to each dispersed view the downsides of dashboards are you can't filter on the dashboard Right, there are no slicers on here that you can filter by, right? But what you can do is if you click on the thing that is pinned, it takes you to that report, right? So if you click on the actual item on the dashboard, then you'll go to the report and then you can do all of your filtering from there, right? So the downsides to the dashboards are they're not really interactive. You can't interact and change what's being showed or displayed but what they do give you is just that initial snapshot view of a high level thing that gets people talking right oh where's that number coming from let's go dig into that why is that person there when i thought they just did that and they should be up there right it just gets you to have your report viewers remember that those reports are out there go click on those numbers to see what's happening right so dashboards are just another good way of getting kind of your stuff out there and again if we go back to our app Let's go ahead and add our dashboard to the app. Again, just go into update the app, go to the content, add that new content, and go to update. And let's go to the app. And let's refresh. Oh, I didn't view it. Sorry. Let's make sure we can see it. Update app, audience. Let's unhide it. Let's move it up. Now let's publish it. Where's it going? There it is. Just took a minute to refresh. So, all right, so now that we've got it in there, now we can, again, we can just click on that first dashboard. So we've made it that first landing page for that initial audience group. And there you go, right? You can just kind of click on and go directly into that report from the dashboard. So, all right, so now that we've got the dashboards out of the way, let's move on to the next topic. See you guys in the next one. Let's hop into subscriptions, how to set up a subscription, what the subscriptions do, and uh, how, how they can provide some value here. So on the app that we've created, since we're going to be distributing through the app, you don't have to do this through the app. You can set these up directly in the workspace accesses as well. Um, but since we're distributing through the app and that's best practice, let's go through it through here. So on the app, on the report that you want to subscribe, so what a subscription to a report is in Power BI is it is sending an email of, I talked about the bookmarks briefly, the saved or current bookmark state of the report at a specified date and time. 
So essentially what, what that means is if you save a report to have some specific group of individuals filtered on the report, you push the subscribe to report button and you can have exactly what you filtered for be included in your changes in your daily email, right? So you can have all of those things kind of set up so that whatever is filtered for exactly on the page will be emailed to the individuals that you want to email to, right? So let's say every day you want some daily count of some activity emailed to some leadership team. You can kind of set that, set that permission up. So let's go to test one. So what these options here do is, so put the subscription name, send it to the recipients. What will be happening here is attach the full report. So what you have the option to do is within the email that is sent to the users that are specified as recipients, you can attach the report as either a PDF or a PowerPoint. I don't find much value in this. However, that being said, these might have higher value with kind of like paginated reports and some, some subscriptions like that. So e emailing a PDF, a daily PDF paginated report totally makes sense. However, emailing the Power BI PowerPoint for that paginated report probably doesn't make much sense, right? So that attach full report option totally dependent on kind of what the subscription and what the email is being set up for. Start and end date, when do you want it to start, when do you want the emails to start sending, and when do you want them to stop sending. Keep end date blank and they'll just keep sending. Um, and the cadence, so you can set it to refresh every day, so every day when it's, re when it's refreshed, you can send the email out, you can send it out hourly, um, so you can send it out once an hour, or you can send it out Right, once an hour at the scheduled time on each of the days. You can send it out daily, um, so every day at a specific date or at a specific time. You can send it out once a week, so on what day of the week. You can send it out multiple times of the day of the week, um, and you can specify all of those different settings. So let's go ahead and just set one up for Friday, let's say at 10 a.m., Let's go ahead with an email subject of test one. This is a test. And so here on the report page, this is where you will set what is being emailed in the subscription, right? So what is actually being delivered in the subscribed email? Um, so we are going to set it to page two because that is our report page, right? We've got our report page set to page two. And then permissions to view Power Report and Power BI. What this is doing is typically everybody on the subscription should have access to the report anyway. So you don't really need to do that anyway. It should be off because if you're emailing it to somebody, they should have access anyway. Um, the link to the report in Power BI. So this is just going to include in the email a link directly to the report. So I'll typically always have that on. And then the report page preview. What this is going to do is this is just going to include a little PNG of the save state of the report at the time the subscription is sent, right? So every Friday at 10 a.m., the state of the report, a picture of that will be included on a little screenshot of it, like of exactly what you're seeing right here will be included on the email. And that save changes button, click that if you want to keep all those changes. So if you filter for something and you want to keep that exact filter state set on your email every time that it's emailed out, <clears throat> keep that checked off. Otherwise, you can uncheck that. And then once you're all set, you can go ahead and push save. And then once that is ready, you can go ahead and send it out, test it off, or however you want. But that is how you set a subscription report. So what that will do is that will send out that email at that cadence every day, week, or hour. Um, and you can have those reports up to date in your inbox, having people ready to check on it, ready to go. Hopefully that helps get you uh, get you up to speed on how to set up a subscription to a report. Um, same exact setup within uh, the workspace setup of the subscription, no different than the app setup, um, same exact setting. So hopefully that helps, and I'll see you guys in the next one. So let's get into the best practice for those workspaces now. So the way that workspaces and reporting distribution should ideally be handled 
Um, so from a best practice, if you're setting up a full ecosystem for your organization, the way that you're going to want to stay organized and keep everything managed is definitely through apps. You definitely want to manage access and workspace usage through the apps. And then your workspace setup, what you're going to want to do is have three workspaces. You'll have a data set workspace. So what we just published, this would be your data set, right? So you'll have a data set workspace where you publish all of your um, or you publish your data set to. You have one data set for your entire organization, right? You'll publish that single data set to this workspace. This workspace will be set up with a Power BI gateway to manage all of your refreshes and will refresh every hour, every 10 minutes, however you can set that up. And then all of your reports that you develop will be developed on this single model so that all of those reports will have that exact same data, same refresh time, can use the exact same base measures. So that's the ideal start. One model published in a single workspace. Right, No reports are published to that workspace though. That workspace is just the data set model workspace. Then you have two other workspaces, <clears throat> one being a development workspace. So you have a learn Power BI development workspace. That workspace has an app and has your reports that are being developed on again, that base data set workspace model. Right. So all of those workspaces are all of those reports will be published to not the data set workspace, but they'll be published to the development workspace. There's not going to be a model that exists in that workspace. There's just going to be reports in that workspace and all of those reports will be viewed by an app. So the access, the only access that you need to manage for that app is you just need to add users to the data set workspace. They don't need access to the report workspace. They just need access, view only access to the data set workspace. Once they have data set access, view only, then their app access to the audience that they have permission to, that's how they'll view their report. Again, they don't need workspace access. They don't need all of these different links to all of these different reports in the single or multiple different workspaces, right? Just give them that single workspace app link and then all of their reports that they have access to will live on that single link. And then that next workspace, that third and final workspace that you're going to have is your finalized in or published workspace, right? So your actual workspace where end users are accessing your live validated confirmed approved reports, right? So that last workspace, again, same kind of setup as the development workspace, no data sets are going to be published there. Nobody's going to have access to it other than Power BI developers, but then the report viewers, every report in there will be published to that app, right? So all of those app access and app users will still have access to all of those reports published in there. But again, you still only need to manage access of the data set through that original data set workspace. So you'll have those three workspaces, one for the data set and only the data set where you manage access to the data set. And then the two reporting workspaces where you have reports managed and, managed and access through apps. And all of that access cleans up so many issues I've seen with how people and organizations use Power BI across the board. They just make it so, so messy and really difficult to work with, especially from the foundation. That foundation is so important because as you start building up and start getting more and more reports, and if you need to develop multiple models, it just starts becoming unmanageable, right? And then you have just this crazy, crazy mess of different numbers and different data sources and different models and everything. Everybody's questioning the data and everybody's questioning the system and the software. Whereas in reality, it was just the foundation was just never set properly. That model was never created. That was all encompassing for all of the reports that you can develop down the line, right? So it's, it's all about setting that foundation and creating the correct infrastructure and ecosystem to getting those reports and data created and pumped out in that way that's accurate, that everybody can trust in. And then people will always start coming to you. Oh, okay, go get me that report. You just did that super good one that 
they only took a week to do since you already had all the data for them. Can you now get me all of this? Right. And so that stuff starts really building up once you start proving that that model works, proving that that distribution method works. People aren't frustrated because they're not going to multiple links every day to access their same report that they access every day. Right. So things start really smoothing out when you start getting that foundation set and then you can really scale it up with a new developer that comes on board. They can hop into the model and know exactly what you're doing. <clears throat> Because you have a very organized way of building everything out, right? And so that's that's how you can really build that starting groundwork to how you can create an entire Power BI ecosystem within an organization. Is it's very important to start out with that foundation. Make sure you, make sure you set up that model right. Get that workspace set up right. Make sure people are okay with how to access those reports. Make sure that people know that that link is never going to change so there shouldn't be any frustration with never having a link or anything like that. The data is always going to be live because your gateway is reset or is set up to refresh at the, the right times when people need it to. Right. So all of those base level things are very important to get kicked off right so that when you start getting reports in front of people people don't question it and just beat down the report they trust the report they trust the number the developers are good with what they're doing they know what they're doing and they're able to give us the reports in a detailed and very valuable way right so all right i'll see you guys in the next one hopefully that kind of helps you understand how to get those uh reports or the workspaces set up properly um and i'll see you guys in the next one to talk about, talk about the next topic and that is going to be the end of this course. Thank you guys for tuning in, and I appreciate you watching all the way through if you made it back here. Um, definitely appreciate it. Throw a sub, throw a like. Definitely helps out. Um, thank you guys for watching along. Hopefully it helps. And uh, please let me know if you have any questions, have any specific scenarios you want future videos on, um, or need any help with, let me know in the comments. And I will see you guys on the next ones.